Testing one, two, testing. Audio test, test one, two, three. We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Good morning, Carol. Good morning, Councillor. How are you? Good, thank you. Good. Looking forward to this meeting. Yes. Is that your younger brother's picture, Councillor DeRue? He probably have his picture on and he went to nap. Bonjour, Carole. Est-ce que tu m'entends? 
t'entends très bien, Michel. Merci. Merci, Carole. Bonne journée. Bonne journée. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. On va commencer la réunion dans une minute. We'll start the meeting. We will start a meeting in about one minute.
Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the meeting of the Finance and Economic Development Committee. Uh, before we proceed, I'll do a quick roll call of members. Councillor Cloutier. Councillor Cloutier. Here's on, Mr. Mayor. Councillor DeRuz. Councillor DeRuz. Councillor El Shantiri. Councillor Gower. Here. Councillor Hubley. Here. Councillor Luloff. Present. Councillor Moffat. Councillor Suds. Here. Councillor Tierney. Present. Council Vice Chair Dudas. Present. So we'll go through the consent agenda for those people joining us. This is uh, items that uh, have no delegations or presentations. Uh, declaration of interest, declaration de conflit d'intérêt. Confirmation of minutes, 25, special meeting of May 8th, 2021. Confidential meetings, May 25th, 2021. Special meeting of May 18th, 2021. And minutes, 26, June 1st, 2021. Carried? Carried. All right. Uh, response to inquiries, uh, OCC 2105 Urban Transit Area, Councillor Hubley, you have uh, a motion. It's uh, been uh, supported by staff. I think we can just uh, suspend the rules on this. Suspend it, carried. Councillor Hubley? Carried. Councillor Hubley, do you want to uh, introduce yeah. the motion? I don't have the motion, uh, Mr. Mayor, if they could put it up there. Uh, it's up now. Okay. You want just to therefore be a result? Yeah, I think it's self-explanatory. Okay, staff to uh, be directed to bring a, an information report to Finance and Economic Development Committee to explain the process for considering relocation of the bus facility, taking into consideration the housing and recreational facilities may be more appropriate use of the land after stage two is in operation. Mm -hmm. Staff, Staff be further uh, directed in the same report to explain the process for uh, developing a new plan for the adaptive reuse of the site and how the local community can be engaged in a planning process. Thank right. you, Mr. Mayor. And staff are supportive of this, Councillor? Yes, that's my understanding. Okay, uh, Councillor Leeper, is it a long question? Should we come back? No, I just want to make sure there is a... Um, uh, a specific reference made to building a new recreational facility at this location. I just want to make sure that the motion isn't going to prioritize the building of a, of a recreation facility in this location as opposed to uh, any number of other candidate sites. Mr. Mayor, perhaps I can respond. Uh, staff in uh, planning and transportation services work to assist the ward councillor and chair uh, Hubley from Trans uh, Transit to prepare this motion. It refers to a community planning exercise that doesn't prioritize any particular land use. It does list potential land uses, but there's no priority given until there's a community planning exercise. And a recreation facilities master plan. That That's would right. It would have to be tied to it. In. it would have to be tied to the, the, the master plan that RCFS is preparing. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mayor. On the motion, carried, adopt a, see. Uh, right. Item one, a proposed 2022 budget directions. We have a presentation, we'll come back to that. Uh, next, Ottawa Community Housing Corporation and Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation co-investment loan guarantee program. Uh, we do have um, a number of people who are here in favor. Natalie Favell, Ottawa Community Housing, Greg Finnamore, Ottawa Community Housing, and Cliff Udale, Ottawa Community Housing, all, as I understand, in support and um, of the staff recommendations. Does anyone have any questions on the staff recommendations? This is a, a program uh, coordinated through FCM, which is good news for our city. Okay, so on uh, item number two, Carrie, I'd update. Carrie. 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 Thank you to our uh, delegates uh, for being here just in case we had questions. Uh, item uh, next item is innovative client services department uh, independent reports on uh, stage two LRT so we'll come back to that we have a presentation item next item is office of the city clerk bureau to graffier municipal status update fedco inquiries and motions received received uh, planning infrastructure and economic development service de planification de l'infrastructure et de développement économique Lansdowne Park uh, Partnership. We have uh, speakers and motions on that. Back to that. Uh, next is the Integrated Orleans Community Improvement Plan. We have a speaker on that, so we'll come back to that. Next is item seven. 
Oh, is it? Oops, sorry, we have, uh, I'm sorry, we have correspondence. So back to the Integrated Orleans Community Improvement Plan. Um, it, it's correspondence, not a delegation. So we can deal with it now if there's any, uh, or, or if there are no concerns. Chair, I do have a question. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, too many monitors. Um, I wonder if we want to come back and, and feel free to say we can. The um, the Orlean SIP is, uh, I see in today's circumstances that it is something that we would require. And it's near and dear to my heart. I grew up uh, right around St. Joseph Boulevard. I understand well how, uh, how much work it needs. I guess the question that I have is with the LRT coming, it seems natural that there would be significant development um, activity and interest on St. Joseph Boulevard. Uh, a SIP implies the loss of potentially several million dollars worth of tax revenue. I know in Hintonburg for a long time we were trying to incentivize development um, through the waiver of development charges and there came a point where we finally said the development interest is is so strong uh, in, in the west end of Ottawa that we don't need to do that anymore. We don't need to incent development and I, I'm I'm just wondering if I can hear from um, uh, perhaps Mr. Willis, do we need a SIP to incent development of the right kind on St. Joseph Boulevard? It's something I want to think about before I vote at council. Okay, we're going we're to come back to this. Okay. Uh, this is a longer discussion. Thank you. Uh, declaration of surplus, uh, 316 Donald Monroe Drive and um, Block 58 Plan uh, 4M-948. Uh, we have uh, one speaker, no need to speak if approved. So on this uh, declaration of surplus land, Karen. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Brush or uh, Ms. G. Ha for uh, coming. Uh, next is land lease 1770 Hetherington Road, Boys and Girls Club of Ottawa. Carried. Next, Carried. number nine, Hickory Street Remediation. We have um, uh, two people who would like uh, who are in support of the um, the proposal. Would speak uh, only if there's uh, opposition to it. So on the uh, item as presented by staff on here, Chris. Okay. Okay. Thank you to uh, Mr. Kramer and Mr. Heber. Heber. Uh, next uh, launch of the Better Homes Loan Program support residential retrofits. We have. Um, Sharon, Sharon Coward, Executive Director of the Enviro Center, to in attendance if there are questions. And then Maria Johnson, Enviro Center, uh, in attendance to respond to questions. And uh, Angela Keller Herzog, Executive Director of Cafes. And Jason Bergarf, Executive Director of Greater Home Builders Association. My understanding is uh, all four of those individuals are in support of this program. Is that correct? Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Keller Herzog and Mr. Berg Berggraf. See if we can get them. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, yeah. I am in support of the motion. Yes, Mr. Okay. Mayor. Thank you. And Mr. Uh, Berghoff from the Home Builders Association. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Scoba is in support of the program. Okay, well, that's good news. Uh, and our two people from the Envaro Center, we thank you for being. So on uh, the report as presented. Carried. 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 Well, this is the one I meant to say that has a uh, tie-in with FCM. Uh, all right, next is uh, Brownfield Grant Application 263 Greensway Avenue. Carried. Carried. Uh, Recreation, Culture and Facility Services. OSU Fieldhouse, George Nelms Sports Park, 5650. Well, I'm in Fedco. You know that um, one of the motions this morning is to accept the uh, budget Chancellor corrections. Bean, you're, on, you're not on mute. Uh, so uh, we have um, a technical amendment by Councillor uh, DeRuz. Councillor DeRuz, do you wish to uh, move, uh, put this motion up on the screen and uh, move it? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, where is... Uh... The OSU Fieldhouse, George Nelms Sports Park, 5650 Mitch Owens Road, report ACS 2020 
RCF GEN 007 seeks approval of a memorandum of understanding with Ottawa South United Soccer Association OSU for a land lease to allow for the construction and operation of a field house at George Nound uh, Sports Park and where is the financial implication are outlined in the report and whereas the Recreation, Culture and Facility Service Department has identified that the current budget amount for George Nounds Fieldhouse Major Capital Project and the balance of the funds received from OSU outlined in the financial implications section are incorrect. Therefore, be it resolved that the Finance Economy Development Committee approve, number one, an amendment to the text of the financial implications section to remove the current budget of 475,000 for the George Naum Fieldhouse Major Capital Project will be returned to the RCFS Major Capital Partners Funding Program. The balance of funds 92,704 received from the OSU will be returned. Number two, the substitution in the financial implications section of the revised tax the current budget 396,350 for the George Nouns Fieldhouse Major Capital Project will be returned to RCFS Major Capital Partnership Funding Program to the balance funds 171,352 received from the OSU will be returned. Okay, so that's uh, that was uh, drafted, I believe, by staff. Uh, Yes, the, yes, Mr. Mayor, and this is basically, there is a history with this uh, site. Uh, the OSU, they are building a field house, they're renting, uh, as you see in the report, they're leasing the property from, this, uh, from the city, they're building it, they're paying tax on it, they're, they're fully paying for the expenses uh, of that facility, and they will, uh, they're also a benefit to the community, they're going to leave the bathrooms open, uh, for the people that they're using the cycles lane and pedestrian lane on Mitch Owens or someone coming to the field. And also on top of that, there will be an opportunity for communities, a community association to be able to use the facility working with the OSU executives if, if it needed. So this is a good benefit of the good partnership. They're paying for everything. We are going to get the taxes and a win-win situation for the community and for the OSU and for the city. Right. So we have uh, the, the delegates that wish to speak are in support of it. Bill Nicolopoulos, the president of OCU, and Stephen Campbell and or Jim Lyonis. So uh, unless there are any questions or concerns, I believe all three are prepared to uh, support this uh, recommendation as amended. So on Councillor DeRuz's amendment, Carrie, yeah, yeah. on the report as amended, Carrie. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thanks to uh, Ottawa South United Soccer and uh, their new field house. So we'll now go back to uh, our first item on the agenda that was held, a proposed 2022 budget directions timeline and consultation process. We have a presentation by uh, Wendy Stephenson and we have uh, 19 speakers. So um, we'll uh, ask Wendy to give her presentation and then we'll uh, uh, open it up to um, the delegations and then uh, councillors for questions. Uh, Mr. Mayor, just po point of um, uh, clarification. I have a motion. Did you want me to present that now or after the delegations, Mr. Mayor? Uh, well, if you want to present now, that's fine. Anyone else has a motion on the budget? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the motion was circulated and, and I will, uh, if you would indulge me, I will read it because I think that there's a lot of points in there that are important. Um, whereas as part of the 2018-2022 Council Governance Review uh, Report, a term of council budget process was approved, which included the requirement for the Chief Financial Officer to annually present the finance to FEDCO uh, a directions report prior to the development of the draft budget. And whereas the proposed 2022 budget directions, timelines and consultation process that we're dealing with today recommends council approve that the auto police service levy be increased by no more than 3% and that council requests that the auto police service board develop their draft budget based on this tax increase. Whereas further to the November 30th, 2020 direction by OPSB to strike a working group to determine how the 2022 Ottawa police budget could be reduced or frozen at 2021 levels. 
the board will be assessing with the support of external resources how the draft 2022 auto police service budget can be reduced or frozen at 2021 levels. Whereas the auto police service and the OPSB are engaged in the development of a community led mental health response strategy that is being co developed with mental health care and addiction professionals. Uh, community based organizations, academics and those with lived experience and will help to support a whole of community approach to responding to those in mental health crisis. Whereas on May 26, 2021, Council considered uh, Motion 54-3 regarding the establishment of a community mental health strategy, which was referred to the City Manager for review and to report back to Council in Q3 2021 with a recommended path forward to coordinate the City's future efforts with those being led by the OPSB. And whereas, while Council cannot presume the outcome of this work, nor presume the OPSB's recommendation, the Board may in fact table a 2022 budget with Council that comes in at less than 3% increase. And whereas, in accordance with the Police Services Act, while Council may establish the overall police budget that it considers necessary to fulfill its statutory obligations under Section 4 of the Act, Council does not have the authority to approve or disapprove of specific line items in the estimates submitted by the OPSB. Therefore, be it resolved that the budget directions be amended to provide that, should the auto police service table a budget with the board and council that provides for less than a 3% increase, that council be presented with recommended options to approve the allocation of the corresponding difference between the tabled police budget percentage increase and the 3% increase to community mental health support services. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I could speak further to it or I could I'll await your direction on how- uh, We go to public delegations now. Okay, thank you. Sorry, for Wendy's uh, presentation, I'm sorry, then public delegations. Okay, so uh, Ms. Stephenson, uh, you and your team have been working hard to get us to this point and the floor is yours, merci. Merci, Monsieur le Maire et le membre du committee. Je suis ici avec uh, Isabelle Jasmine. Pour faire Thank you so much. I'm here today to present you the proposed 2022 budget direction timelines and consultation process. On December 5, 2018, Council approved a term of Council budget process as part of the 2018 to 2022 Council governance review. And that report directed the Chief Financial Officer and Treasurer to bring forward a report that details the budget timeline and provides budget directions in advance of each yearly budget. In this presentation today, we're gonna to highlight the key elements that went into the recommendations of the report. We're gonna provide an overview of the budget process between now and December, when the budget will be approved by council. And before I get, begin the formal presentation, I'd like to acknowledge the significant efforts of the finance team for their tremendous work on budget 2022 today. You can move to the next slide, Carol. Thank you. Councils played a leading role in the city's approach to fiscal prudence and financial sustainability. Strong financial management is a priority for the city, our council, and our residents. It's really the foundation to our success. And throughout the years, we've adopted strong financial policies and plans that have led to our financial sustainability. And these include things like our long range financial plans. We've invested in developing a fiscal framework that sets out our high level roadmap to sustainable city finances. And council also endorsed a strategic asset management plan and state of the assets report to support our continued investment in infrastructure. In 2018, we adopted our reserve management policy to ensure that our cash and investments remain at healthy levels while investing in our future. And most recently, we've adopted the long range financial plan for housing services, which was a first for the city. And throughout this time, we've conducted many reviews of our operations, ensuring that administrative staff is as lean as possible so that our growth investments are directed to frontline services. In addition to formal pro programs and in order to achieve our annual draft budgets that adhere to council directions, the senior leadership team engages in a very rigorous challenge function, employing numerous mechanisms to identify, strengthen and achieve efficiency improvements prior to the draft budgets being tabled with council. 
prochaine diapo, s'il vous plaît, Carol. As a result of Council's actions, the city entered 2020, and I'm going to go back a little bit today um, because it's, I think we've been down a journey over the last couple of years with respect to COVID. And, you know, when we started 2020, we were in a very sound financial position. We had a healthy balance of reserves, um, which really contributed to our overall financial health and really, I'm going to say, helped us gauge that path and road in terms of where we were going through COVID. Uh, we enjoy low debt levels compared to other municipalities in Ontario, and we continue to have a strong credit rating. Then COVID arrived in our country and our community, and it resulted in significant financial challenges uh, for all municipalities and also the city of Ottawa. And we know um, that these challenges will flow into future years as we slowly recover from the pandemic. The city has been proactive to implement financial mitigations in 2020 and 2021 to help close that gap. And uh, we've also provided proactive measures that will help us deal with some of the pressures that we see in 2022. Next slide, please. 2022 will be a challenging year uh, and it presents a continuing financial challenge as we move on from 2021. The city's benefited from the provincial and federal safe restart agreement funds in both of those years, 2020 and 2021, it helped us balance our budgets. In drafting the budget directions for 22, staff have assumed that no funding is available from other levels of government. We've not heard of any commitments or announcements of any additional safe restart agreement funding uh, for municipalities. And we do anticipate that some of the post COVID pressures will flow into 2022. And those things include uh, some of the pressures from the lower than normal transit ridership. Um, we expect some pressures related to lower return of clients uh, to our recreation facilities and programs, as well as a uh, continued need for some safety equipment and uh, some increased staffing levels, and also some impacts on our revenues, such as parking fees and fines, as well as our airport pilts as our community returns to normal. The 2022 budget will be tabled with mitigation measures, ensuring that the budget is balanced. Next slide, please. The 2018 to 2022 term of council report sets the framework for the budget process and staff come back every year to set those budget directions in accordance with the council approved framework. Staff are required to table the budget directions annually in alignment with that council approved framework. As required by the 2018 to 2022 term of council governance review as approved by council, on November 28, 2018, the budget direction report recommends annual budget increases and that they be allocated to all local boards and commission and the Auditor General's office based on their individual prorated share of the revenues derived from the council directed tax target and any increase in tax revenues that result from growth in our assessment base. Council then requests boards and commissions to develop their draft budgets with this annual allocation. The Ottawa Police Services Board, the Ottawa Public Library Board, the Ottawa Public Health Board, the Committee of Adjustment and Crime Prevention Ottawa will prepare their own budgets for submission to their respective boards. These budgets will be tabled with Council at the same time as the various Standing Committee of Councils tables theirs. And today we've tabled our 2022 budget directions report with a series of recommendations that guide staff in the development and tabling of our 2022 budget. Of the overall 3% tax increase, 2% is required to cover the known pressures and the inflationary costs to provide services to our residents. 1% honors council's commitment to close the annual infrastructure gap. Furthermore, each department reviewed key operating and capital requirements to maintain services. They look for opportunities for operational efficiencies, as well as impact on growth for operations, any changes in regulations, and any operational or service changes. The 3% is the overall impact on the property tax. It includes an increase of no more than 2.6% to the citywide levy, 3% for police services, and a transit levy of 3%. Furthermore, in order to minimize the impact of the provincial government's decision to cancel the doubling of the gas tax, which happened a couple of years ago, we're continuing to increase that contribution to transit capital 
by $5 million in 2022. And that's in alignment with the recommendation and the overall multi-year plan that was previously approved by council. So this adds another 1.5% to the transit tax for a total of 4.5%, which is lower than last year's increase and maintains the overall property tax increase at 3%. So these allocations are based on the council approved framework. And it's important, I think, today to address the police 3% increase in the context of what the Ottawa Police Services Board has provided as direction to the service. During their 2021 budget deliberations, the Ottawa Police Services Board approved a motion to strike a working group to determine how the 2022 Ottawa Police budget could be reduced or frozen at 2021 levels. Further board direction was given in April that directed the service to present a report with three potential budget scenarios, including a tax increase of 0%, 1.5%, and 3%. And you'll see that the budget direct directions today recommends no more than 3%, which provides the OWA police services the flexibility required to do this work. Staff have placed these recommendations in front of you today that align with the budget development framework as approved by Council. I'm now going to hand it over to Isabel, who's going to walk through some of the further recommendations. Thank you, Wendy. Next slide. So this slide shows the overall property tax increase on an average single detached home and commercial property. The overall increase to an urban home and commercial property is 3%. And for a rural home, it is only 2.8% because the transit tax portion is lower in rural areas. Therefore, the overall dollar increase to the average urban home assessed at 415,000 is $119, 91 for a rural home, and 242 for an average commercial property assessed at 460,000. Par conséquent, l'augmentation globale en dollars pour une maison. So in general, the evaluation will be about $119 for an urban home, $91 for a rural home, and $242 for a commercial average. Next slide. The COVID-19 pandemic, COVID pandemic has affected our community, human needs and behaviors and the city's economic condition. More recently, attention has turned to the safe resumption of some services in modified ways to meet evolving restrictions on social gathering and physical distancing. COVID continues to impact the city financially. This, is, this will flow into 2022 and beyond. In a regular budget year, the city faces non-COVID pressures, including items such as the inflationary increases, this year, the construction price index has increased to 3.7% from 2.3% last year. This inflation estimate is used to determine the increase to the contribution to capital. This year, what we can see there's an inflationary increase to construction of 4.7% compared to 2.2% from last year. This is an estimation of the inflationary inflation the pressure that will be taken into account for this year. And increases to the years of maximum pensionable earnings will be phased in between 2019 to 2023. Changes to the Canada Labour Code that impacts the transit budget. Changes were made to the city's insurance contract, increasing the overall cost of insurance. And the long range financial plans, considerations for transit, tax, housing, and rate identified the funding requirements, reserve balances, and debt levels required to maintain assets in good repair over a 10 year period, and in the case of transit for 30 years. The city also has COVID related pressures, such as reduced transit revenues due to lower ridership, reduced recreation fees due to lower participation in programs, continued enhanced cleaning costs and PPE, and continued costs for staffing for provincially and public health mandated service delivery standards. Next slide. This slide summarizes an update on changes to provincial funded funding expected in 2020 and subsequently deferred to due to COVID. The public health impact is due to the fact that the cost sharing model has changed to a 70-30 split compared to previous 75-25 cost sharing arrangement. The ministry has confirmed mitigating, mitigation funding for 2021 and we are awaiting provincial direction for 2022. 
The impact shown here is the pressure expected should the migration funding end. The children's services impact of 2.6 million in 2022 is the result of a change to the cost sharing for administrative cost delivery to 50-50 and adjusting the threshold from 10 to 5%. This change was temporarily funded in 2021 and is not confirmed whether it will be deferred again in 2022. Next slide. So based on preliminary impact information, staff estimate that assessment growth will be approximately 1.4%. Although we have seen a surge in building permits in recent years, the impact of these on the tax assessment is spread over several years. Final tax roll and assessment data for the year will only be available at the end of December. Per the budget process approved by council, the services governed by a board or commission will be allocated their individual prorated share of the 1.4% assessment growth. Selon le processus budgétaire approuvé par le conseil. According to the process approved, the services will receive their share of the prorata of the 1.4%. Next slide. Oh, thank you. There is a recommendation that user fees increase in accordance with the directions outlined in the fiscal framework and the long range financial plans. It is also recommended that wherever possible fees include incremental post cost recovery for those services that continue to be impacted by COVID and require additional resources, materials and other costs to deliver those services safely to the public. Water, wastewater, and stormwater fees are based on 100% cost recovery, and the long-range financial plan for these services estimates that an overall increase in revenue of 4.86% is required for 2022. Solid waste fees increases are in line with the report presented to committee and council in April 2019 regarding the residential contract renewals, and there are additional pressures related to the increasing cost of capital investments required for solid waste services, particularly the cost of capping. A solid waste long range financial plan will be presented to committee and council in October, providing a funding strategy to address these additional pressures in the interim, with a final solid waste master plan to follow in 2022, which will detail capital, detail capital investment requirements for the next 10 years and financial funding strategies going forward. Transit fares are to increase by 2.5% per the transit long range financial plan. I will now hand it back to Wendy, thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Isabel. Um, so today you're receiving uh, the budget directions report and if approved it will set the envelope for the draft operating and capital budgets that will be tabled at a special meeting of Council on November the 3rd. Between now and November virtual public consultations will take place and on the next slide I'll provide you with a list of resources available to support this process. Once the draft budget is tabled in November, each committee advisory committee commission or board will hold meetings to consider the draft 2022 budget and receive public delegations. The final budget and any proposed changes arising from the committees will be considered and adopted as committee of the whole on December the 8th. Next slide, please. So the city is going to be using a variety of methods to engage with residents on the 2022 budget. And due to the continuation of COVID, we are recommending council led consultations be held virtually again this year. And we're going to work closely uh, with our partners in Ottawa Public Health to monitor any changes to that approach. We're going to leverage our interactive online engagement with and it will occur through Ottawa.ca and Engage Ottawa, as well as the city's various social media channels. Engage Ottawa provides a comprehensive online engagement platform that allows us to connect with residents in a very interactive manner. Information about consultation engagement opportunities are going to be promoted uh, by our partners in public information and media relations through the city's social media channels and traditional media products. And as always, if you have any questions with respect to the report or budget process, um, reach out to Isabel or myself. C'est la fin de notre présentation, Monsieur le maire. This is it for our presentation, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Great. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Wendy and uh, Isabel. Um, just one quick um, question to a uh, clarification for Mr. White uh, with respect. I know a number of people want to speak on the police budget, but uh, we're limited in terms of um, our ability at this point. Mr. White, can you just give us a, a quick briefing on the city's role under the Police Services Act? Uh, certainly, Mr. Mayor. I mean, I, I would suggest any any discussion of, of that needs to take place in context, and that's the context that's provided by the Police Services Act and the regulations. 
Every municipality is required to provide adequate and effective policing. Uh, and then the standards for that are, are as set out in the Police Services Act in Section 4. And those are the, the kind of core policing functions, as well as um, the additional policing roles that are set out in, in the regulation, which is the adequacy and effectiveness regulation. And so ultimately, it is the board's responsibility to establish a budget that will maintain the police force and provide for the operation of the board itself. Council's role is to set the timetable for the receipt of the board's estimates, its budget, and the format of those. Um, council is, has no ability to direct the police services board with respect to its budget. Um, at the end of the day, council can, can approve or not approve those estimates, it is not open for council to go line by line and approve specific items within the police budget. And of course, all of that is subject to kind of the oversight provided by the Ontario Civilian Police Commission um, and its power to, to, to review or investigate if the, the municipality and the board are not providing uh, policing to the standards required by uh, the Police Services Act and the regulations. So. That, that kind of sets the, the parameters of what council can do. Um, the budget directions are merely a, a framework within which the board can operate, but ultimately the board is responsible to establish its budget. And it's only once it, those estimates are presented that council has uh, a specific role in that regard, Mr. Mayor. Okay, so bottom line is uh, we're here to talk about the city budget process and we're not getting into the weeds or a line by line on any item dealing with police, uh, because that is not our role. Uh, the police board has to set its budget. Okay, our first speaker is Ray Escrit, Director Harmony House. Uh, you have five minutes, Mr. Escrit. Ms. Escrit, but thank you. Um, I am the Director of Harmony House, and we are Ottawa's only second stage domestic violence shelter. And I would strongly, um, oppose any raise to the police budget. I think it um, would be best if council um, maintained their position when they unanimously voted to support a budget freeze um, to 2021 levels. Uh, domestic violence and sexual attacks on women and children are often used as a reason to increase police budgets or support police action, but our view is that we can no longer be a shield for police funding. Um, people will often say things like, who will you call when a rapist is at your door? Well, the fact is we don't call the police. Only 5% of sexual assaults are ever reported to the police. Uh, the police are not the people that handle those kinds of things. And with the increased budget um, of, I think it was over $13 million, um, I could support 360 families at my shelter. Um, and the fact that 160 organizations are scrambling over just a measly $25 million to do all of the prevention and all of the healing work for a police force is fairly ridiculous and, and unrealistic, especially because in 2020, um, the Ottawa Public Police Service only deemed 32% of domestic violence reports actual and worthy of investigation. They only laid charges in 42% of those cases. So only 14% of domestic violence calls actually were investigated. And 53% of those uh, were closed for insufficient evidence. So only 7% were actually dealt with properly. And that's a dismissal rate of five times higher than other case dismissals. So domestic violence is not a reason to support an increase in the police budget. Um, that's basically what I came to say. Don't blame domestic violence for any police costs. Okay. Thank you. Just to clarify uh, that the city council did not vote to freeze the uh, police budget. We don't have that ability. I thought they did a uh, support vote to support the police, like the police board in freezing. They were going to support that work. Uh, no, there's no such motion. Oh, all okay. right. Thank well, you. thank you for the correction. Right. Uh, are there any hands? Okay, thank you. Laura Rose Seabach Shantz. Good morning, Miss uh, Seabach Shantz. You have uh, five Good minutes. Thank Four you. Um, just one quick uh, point of order as I get going here. Um, 
would be really helpful for me and for the other public delegations if we could have a public speakers list next time. I'm here at home doing childcare along with my presentation. And I've got my kids occupied right now, but for a lot of people that is an accessibility issue. It's also for people who are working. So my name is Laura Schantz. I'm here to speak about two elements of the proposed tax plan, namely to oppose the plan 3% increase to the auto police services budget for 2022. And to once again, raise my concerns about the plans for another 2.5% increase to transit fares. First on OPS, I would caution this committee that we are falling into a more is better mindset with respect to this proposal. The idea that somehow doing more of the same thing will lead to different results. This approach has long been tried with dismal results. We've seen it in all aspects of criminal justice policy, resulting in the punitive over-policing and over-incarceration of black and indigenous people at up to 10 times the rate of white people. Every year we put increasing millions into the police budget that could be better put to use and used in ways that actually would provide community safety and well-being, such as fundable new affording housing builds, housing subsidies, childcare spaces, reduced transit fares, subsidized bus passes, parks, recreational opportunities in our communities, harm reduction, and others. All of these possibilities have strong returns on investment, making our communities safer, more cohesive, and happier places to be. Instead, what we're offered is a colonial tool that will continue to criminalize Indigenous and Black people, especially boys and men, which will not address the problems we're seeing. We also need to look at the year-over-year -year cost burden. Over the past decade, many smaller Ontario communities and municipalities have had to think long and hard about how to afford police services, finding that they simply cannot afford the police. Other services and infrastructure are starved to make way for an ever-growing police budget. Ottawa is seeing similar police costs climbing year over year. While we are not yet in the serious situation that many smaller Eastern Ontario municipalities are facing, it will not take us long to find ourselves there. Moving on to discussions of transit. I support a higher use of the municipal property tax budget going toward transit fares. Increasing the share of transit funding from property taxes would increase equity and would enable our city to make transit more affordable at the fare box where riders, especially those who have few transportation options, will benefit the most. This is also the equitable choice from a climate change perspective as lower fares encourage ridership, while fire higher fares encourage alternate forms of transit, often single occupancy personal vehicles. My concern here is that the draft budget still relies on a further 2.5% increase in transit fares to fund transit operations in the city. This escalating cost will price many people out of transit at a moment in time when we need to be encouraging folks back to transit and attracting new riders. On a personal note, 2022 will be the year when my youngest child turns six. For me, this means that traveling on OC Transpo with my two kids will soon cost me more than $15 for a round trip. Everyone making the decision here gets a free bus pass. This isn't the case for the rest of us. And I can tell you that $15 is a lot of money for someone like me. It will mean fewer trips on transit. It'll mean I'm more likely to bike, walk, borrow a car, or just not go places with my kids. For a lot of folks who commute, it gets them again closer to just driving instead of taking the bus or train. It moves us further away from the equity and climate justice that we want and we need. So when you decide on what funding envelopes should look like today, you're choosing what city you want. Do you want a just and equitable city? Or do you want one where the well-off rule the day and the have-nots live with the consequences? These are the choices that you're making and I urge you to think carefully about them. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, a question from Councillor Menard. Thank you very much, Chair. Thanks for being here, uh, Mr. Chance. Nice to see you. Um, I guess I just wonder, there's been other jurisdictions in uh, Canada um, that have changed their transit policies for youth. Yes. And, uh, they recognize that um, youth under 18, as they uh, can ride transit more often, they become lifelong users and then, you know, purchase passes later on in life. Uh, we, we had a similar program implemented at U-Pass in Ottawa. Uh, which we had campaigned for at the city's uh, post-secondary institutions and now exist at, at most of them in Ottawa. I'm wondering what your, what your thoughts would be of uh, an under 18 pass or a um, you know, school age pass that is, that is free as Victoria has done. Um, and, and, you know, and, and one of the ways they've chosen to pay for that is by charging for parking on Sundays, as an example. Um, is that something that you think would be useful in our city to both uh, battle the climate crisis uh, that is here and also to encourage lifelong transit use? Uh, absolutely. Just one second. 
Max, Mama's on a meeting, okay? Can you wait just a second, please? Sorry, this is my child who's about to turn six who has something very urgent to tell me. I feel you. I have a black girl too. <laughs> I home a lot. <laughs> yeah. Often too. So. Um, but anyways, back to your question. Um, definitely, you know, getting young youth onto transit and getting them into the habit of taking transit, getting them into sustainable modes of transportation is absolutely the way forward. We're looking at a massive climate crisis. We're looking at temperatures hitting nearly 50 degrees Celsius in central British Columbia this past week. We need to be thinking about what we are doing and how we are making changes that will affect not just this generation, but generations to come. And by reducing costs for transit, we are enabling ex we are enabling future generations to become lifelong transit users. We are also enabling lower income families to have equitable access to all of the amenities that our city offers. You think about, I only have two children and I'm gonna be looking at $15 um, round trip bus fare for me and my two kids. What happens for a family of three or four? We have many newcomer families who fit that mold, who are working, who are not necessarily eligible for the Equipass, who make just above the thresholds, or who simply get bogged down in the paperwork. And they're having to say no to taking their children places. You know, They're not gonna be able to bus out to Petrie Island or down to Mooney's Bay to cool off on a hot day. They're not gonna be able to take their children you know, a lot of places around town that they would love to go otherwise. By reducing transit costs, especially for children and young adults, we would open up so many opportunities. We would enable employment among youth. We would enable uh, children to see more of the city that they are part of. We would enable all of these things and it would be a huge step forward in terms of equity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sam Hirsch is next. Can you folks hear me? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so I'll begin now. Uh, hello, uh, bonjour. Uh, je voulais premièrement reconnaître que je suis ici. I want to recognize that I'm here on the non-ceded territory of the Algonquin people and how important it is to decolonialize everything today, put money into reconciliation and not the police services of Ottawa. Uh, you know, there's a lot on it today, and I, I know that the next council meeting on, uh, I think, July 21st was added to get through this bulky agenda before the summer, but residents and councillors need more time to make decisions. Pushing all of this through so fast creates a toxic and undemocratic environment at City Hall and is yet another way to build distrust that is already quite high amongst residents and their political representatives, especially after the events of previous weeks. So please consider giving people more time to make decisions and have consultations. It's the right thing to do. And I know members of this committee today will say uh, you will have chances to speak to this later in the, in the year when the budget is released, but that is exactly the problem. Residents should be involved every step of the way, not just when the budget is already written, uh, when it is possible to change anything. This is why we are here today to make a statement that residents need to be included early on in the budgeting process, not just at the end. The city budget needs to be written with residents that live in the city and not just centralized in the mayor's office. As I said, I'm here today to speak out against the proposed parameters around this budget, in particular, the increased budget levy for the Ottawa Police Services. And I want to remind the city, uh, this, the city treasurer, the mayor, and members of this committee that the motion passed at the police uh, board called for a freeze or reduction, not an increase and not a reduction of the increase. A 1.5% increase is not a reduction. It's still an increase. And you all have the power and responsibility uh, to push for this. You know, it's, it's not right at the beginning of this meeting that Mayor Watson, you tried to shirk responsibility off this council by, by citing the Police Services Act. Yes, it's a bit limited, but you still have the power and influence over this budget. It feels as though this committee has had a severe case of collective amnesia. It seems as though this committee made up some of some of the top decision makers at City Council, including our mayor, have just simply forgotten the events that occurred over this past year and a half have forgotten the marathon long meeting the Auto Police Services Board had with over 100 delegates speaking out against last year's police budget increase, or the survey that police sent out that had over 7,000 responses, or have forgotten the protests that erupted across North America demanding leaders take action when it came to the police use of force, or have forgotten the multitude of scandals that have engulfed the Auto Police Services. But I know it's not a case of forgetfulness or innocent disregard, but rather a case of callous disregard for the residents of Ottawa by an out of touch, detached from reality, city council in particular, 
today, this Finance and Economic Development Committee. Mayor Watson, I remember last year in June, following the mayor of uh, the murder rather of George Floyd by police, you posted a black square on your social media profiles and you were cited calling the murder of Floyd disgusting and spoke out against racism. Yet you and others on this committee still continue to support and actively support the same system here in Canada that led to his death, an overly violent, militarized police force. It can't go both ways, members of this committee. You cannot oppose systemic racism without opposing the systems that hold it up. It's systemic for a reason. It's easy to condemn the murder of an unarmed black man when it happens hundreds of miles away, but we need you and the rest of this committee to stand up and actually do something that you all have the power to do more than any average resident. You actually have the distinct power to hinder the police violence that takes place and the fear that many people of color feel when they see a mass of police on their streets. This isn't about resources, it's not complicated. It's about priorities. If you approve these budgetary parameters today, you are going against the very decision made by all of you and the rest of city council to support the work of the police services board, which is now to either freeze or reduce the police services budget, not to reduce the increase to, the, uh, to reduce the budget, as I said. So I'm not even sure why this direction is even being tabled here today. It seems a bit inconsistent and quite frankly, undemocratic. Lastly, I understand that the Ottawa Police Association is strong and has a lot of influence on this committee and our city council. But residents are asking you to stand up to them. They do not have the best interests of the community or Ottawa residents at heart. Thank you. You are the ones that are supposed to do that. What they, are, what they care about is their own and fellow police officers. That is why people like OPA President Matt Scoff has spent significant resources defending these officers who have committed grave offenses against members of this community. Who do you represent, members of this uh, members of this committee, Ottawa residents or the or the interests of the Ottawa Police Association? So, if you actually claim to speak for the people you represent and, res and and respect the very promises that you all made to the community, as well as the institution of City Council, you will join us today and vote against this proposed increase, like was promised by the chair of the Police Services Board and essentially members of City Council. Thank you. Merci. Thank you. Uh, next, Robin Brown, Conscious Images. Uh, hey, everybody, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I'm actually with the uh, 613819 Black Hub. I co lead it. So um, I'm here on behalf of the Hub to ask you to vote against today's motion to increase the auto police services levy by 3%, which would be more than $13 million. We're asking you to do this because although we know it, you're committed to serving your constituents. We know you're equally committed to working with your colleagues to ensure that the policies you approve and enact are in the best interest of all Ottawa residents. This motion, however, isn't in the best interest of all Ottawa residents as it directly contradicts a commitment, and Sam just mentioned this, that three of your colleagues who sit on the Ottawa Police Services Board made to Ottawa residents last fall. On November 23rd, your colleagues, Ralston King, Caroline Meehan, and OPSB Chair Diane Deans heard from 93 delegates who asked them uh, and their board colleagues to freeze the Ottawa Police Services budget. Although they didn't, they said they were, they were determined to bring meaningful change to the Ottawa Police Service and, and ensure it reflects the community that it serves and committed to striking a working group to determine how, to, uh, how the 2022 OPS budget could be reduced or frozen, again, not just reducing the increase, at 2021 levels. Uh, they did strike the working group and have, and have been regularly reporting on its progress at each uh, board meeting. At the last meeting, several speakers raised the issue of today's motion saying that if approved, they would see those who voted for it as ignoring both the overwhelmingly public call to freeze the OPS budget and the process your colleagues put in place to examine that very possibility. Now, just to be clear, we understand that today's motion, if approved, doesn't technically prevent the board from freezing the budget and that it recommends an increase up to 3%, but we also recognize that its approval will make it politically much harder for the board not to approve the full 3%. So we got to ask, like Sam did, why this motion is being considered at all today? Why are you considering increasing the police budget when Ottawa residents, including some of your own constituents, are telling you they want a reduced role for police? They communicated this by their feedback that led to the Ottawa Carleton District School Board ending the school resource program two weeks ago and the OPS then canceling the program for all Ottawa schools. They communicated this by supporting our program, the health program, Compassion Not Cops, to create an alternative non-police mental health response system for Ottawa. Their, their call to get cops at a mental health response has been echoed by more than a dozen U.S. cities that are developing alternative co-response programs to minimize or eliminate the role of police uh, responding to 911, call, 911 calls involving mental health, homelessness, and substance abuse. 
So yeah, that's right. U.S. cities that are awash in Second Amendment guns are getting police out of mental health response and saving money in the process. And talking about money, the Hub is now running another campaign uh, called Our Fair Share. And it's based on the facts that show that giving the OPS more money doesn't keep Ottawa residents, including your constituents, any safer. We've begun reaching out to all Ottawa residents, including your constituents, to tell them the truth. That the Ottawa Police Service gets multi-million dollar increases every year, even though there's absolutely no evidence that all that money is helping them fulfill their main responsibility to reduce crime and keep us and our families safe. We're telling them that the OPS's own stats show that even when the OPS gets a multi-million dollar increase, crime often goes up. So that means that while the police keep getting more money, despite frequently not achieving their main goal, our property taxes keep going up and we're told there's not enough money for things we want. We see things that actually will keep us safe like traffic safety measures, addressing climate change and funding social services that address crime's root causes as underfunded. Approving today's motion would support that underfunding, especially since the motion only suggests increasing auto or public health budget by $985,000. Doing this would contribute to the negative impacts that disproportionately affect Ottawa's Black and Indigenous communities uh, and were exposed with horrific clarity during the COVID-19 pandemic, which is continuing. So to, to end, we want to be clear. We're not saying that those who vote for this motion are white supremacists or anti-Black, but what we are saying is that giving the police multi-million dollar increases each year supports systemic white supremacy and anti-Black racism at the city of Ottawa. And that's not the Ottawa we all want. So we ask you to follow Gandhi's advice and be the change you want to see and vote against this motion. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Menard has a question. Yes, thanks very much, Chair. Uh, thanks, Mr. Brown, for um, your uh, powerful delegation. And I also wanted to thank you for all the work that uh, you and 613-819 Black Hub have been doing. This work that you're doing really should be done by the city, uh, but you're doing it instead in, in, in lieu of that work uh, being done or taking a, a very, very long time to be done. Uh, you have funded $25,000 to uh, produce a strategy document around a mental health uh, response team in Ottawa and how that could work. And you have held forums and discussed with the community and been representative of those who are calling for change in the city. So thank you for all that you have done, uh, work that should be being done by, uh, by our own city staff. I'm wondering if you can go further into uh, the research that, that has been produced um, by the Black Hub and what, what it's showing, um, you know, looking at the models of, of cahoots and other cities. Can you educate uh, this committee and... Um, um, some of us today on, on what it says and how it could work and what kind of funding would need to take place here um, to get it up and, and running. Sure, and, and then uh, also uh, I, well, I already have shared with, <clears throat> with I mean, all city councilors, the report itself, so all the details are in there, but essentially um, you know, the big takeaway is that it, it, it um, the report lays out a system that is community driven and costs way less than what we have right now. Right. And, and, it, and it's um, uh, one that that has um, basically like teams of around one or two people responding to to mental health crisis. Right. But but essentially, again, it removes the police from the whole process, recognizes the the that the the, the absolute need for workers who are who are trained in, 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 in compassionate care and, and not having armed police officers showing up and it would save money. Right. So, but but all the on, again, literally like the, the, the report goes into a lot of detail, including the, the, the work down to salary levels for the employees and the whole bit. So it's all in there, and I've shared that. But that's the kind of the big the big takeaway for sure. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you for that, and thank you again for uh, for all uh, you have done. I note the cost would be much less than uh, than uh, the increase in in policing that we're uh, potentially going to see again in our city, and uh, that the results historically across the other cities that have already implemented this model have been uh, have been much better in terms of both outcomes and, and saving costs, as you say. So thank you for all you've done again. Councilor McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks, Robin, for your uh, delegation today. Uh, much appreciated. And the uh, and the strategy report, um, I have uh, read it thoroughly and uh, will be able to reference it uh, uh, for a long while going forward in terms of what we could do, um, you know, with, uh, with, with some additional funding into, into mental health 
uh, response. And, you know, when you're, um, you know, in any neighborhood in this city where we have, um, you know, a high risk population, um, people who are uh, greatly affected by the poison drug um, epidemic that we have, homeless emergency, um, you know, people living in overcrowded, uh, unsafe rooming houses, uh, the neighbors around um, all of that as well. And the, just the, the unrest in the city uh, is, uh, is, is more evident uh, today than, than it ever was. So it's, just, it's so obvious what we could do with you know, 13 million, 13.5 million dollars in terms of reducing uh, the, those crises. But I just want to hear from you because uh, you had mentioned that um, that you have spoken to people uh, across the city. And what did you hear? What what are residents looking for? Imagine it's different in in all of our uh, different communities. But what uh, what did you hear back from? community associations that you spoke to and residents that you spoke to. Um, if they're not asking for more police funding, what, what are they asking for? Oh well, yeah, so again, you know, the, the, as the report shows, right, the, 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 the consultants did extensive consultations and certainly the, the overwhelming message was the same one I, I mentioned in my delegation. The idea, just, just basically following the, the evidence and the truth, right, that it's actually, um, funding the, the, the social services that, that address the social determinants of, of crime that actually keep us safer. Like I said, they own, like, literally the OPS's own stats show, right, that there's no, there is zero relationship between throwing money at the police and, 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 and crime rates, right? So, so that's what, so yeah, people were, 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 were very insightful and very clear in saying, you know, shift that money towards things that actually re, uh, will help people and reduce crime. Right, so you know, housing, and mental mental health care, obviously a big one, right? Um, and actually, just to, just to give a, a personal, really personal example of this, right? I'm actually speaking to you from Toronto right now. I'm down here partly visiting my brother, who is um, two years older than me and is a paranoid schizophrenic. Okay, he he in his early life he had brought he got in, in trouble with the call, but he has them for years. And part of the reason for that is because. He has a place to live through Toronto Community Housing, and he's got uh, mental health support through the, through um, uh, the Canadian Association of Mental health, health. So it's like there's a clear example right there of what happens, right? Right? He hasn't had any interaction with the police, right? So you know, it, the the evidence is clear. Just just you know, do it. Yeah, we have we have some of the evidence here in this city too. We just need we just need more. We know, we know what it takes. So thank you very much. And thank you for uh, the report. I think that it's, uh, I hope that it's uh, a well-read report because it certainly is uh, deserving as such. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, next is Cassie Slack. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Awesome. Hi, uh, I'm Cassie. I'm an Ottawa resident in Centertown. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe people. I want to stress the importance of all reflecting on what this means, especially as we sit in a meeting discussing the development and use of land that does not and never has belonged to us as settlers. I'm here to ask that this committee change the proposed 3% tax levy for the Ottawa Police Service to 0%. I'm aware that this motion and this committee doesn't decide on whether the police will get a 3% increase, but rather allows the police board to ask for up to a 3% increase in their budget via this tax levy. I'm also aware that city council cannot go line by line and that we cannot talk about specific police budget items, but this committee does decide on this tax levy. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but this committee can decide on whether or not this 3% tax levy passes. Otherwise, I'm not sure what the point of this agenda item is or this committee for that matter. I'd also like to clarify that there was a motion passed at the Ottawa Police Services Board meeting with the intention to pursue a freeze or reduction in the budget. This was a motion moved by Vice Chair uh, Sandy Smallwood, seconded by a Chair Diane Deans, whereas the Ottawa Police Services Board heard from close to 100 delegates at their meeting of November 23rd, and whereas Many of those who participated spoke to a desire to see the Ottawa police budget either frozen or reduced. And whereas the police board is determined to bring meaningful change to the Ottawa police service and ensuring it reflects 
the community that it serves. Therefore, be it resolved that the board ask the Finance and Audit Committee to strike a working group to determine how the 2022 Ottawa Police budget could be reduced or frozen at 2021 levels. So that is something that they did. The City Council passed a motion stating that they would support the Ottawa Police Services Board in pursuing alternatives for mental health responses and in working with community stakeholders to do so. That being said, this community has been loud and clear over the past year. No more money for police. We need to divest from policing and instead invest in key supports that actually allow our communities to be safe, like public health and affordable housing. Council declared a housing emergency last year after all. This committee has an opportunity today to listen to the community and make sure that the police will not receive any more money, even through tax levies. Funding for the Ottawa Police Service accounts for around $358 million of the city's expenses, while 160-ish community agencies have to compete to receive $24 million. The police themselves often say that there aren't any community agencies able to provide 24-7, 365 service, but it's pretty clear why, when the police sit on more funds than any community agency could ever hope to receive. I'd like to remind this committee of the six priorities outlined in Ottawa's community safety and well-being plan. Number one, discrimination, marginalization, and racism. Number two, financial security and poverty reduction. Number three, gender-based violence and violence against women. Number four, housing. Number five, mental well-being. And number six, integrated and simpler systems. The police do not and cannot address any of these issues, and our funding decisions need to reflect that. So again, I will ask, please amend this motion to change the 3% tax levy to 0%. This is your opportunity to take real action, so please take it. That's all from me. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, next is uh, Ethan Sabaret. Hi, Mayor. Uh, hi, Council. It's great to speak to you all today. Uh, and I'll, I'll just be very brief. Um, as Cassie just explained, and as Robin's report shows, this committee has the power to hold the line uh, on the tax levy for police with a 0% increase this year. And we know that increasing the budget for police just will not lead to better outcomes for residents of the city. This is not an antagonistic attack on the police or on police officers or on people who are serving us in the city. Instead, it's a chance to uh, put our priorities, our funding uh, in the right place. Uh, the, the, the data is very clear that the ties between uh, criminal activity uh, and especially between more um, objective categories, things like, like harm that aren't necessarily, don't necessarily include charges for things like drugs, which we should decriminalize, and, and a lot of other areas that are included in crime, but not necessarily actually doing the harm that we should be trying to avoid, uh, that, that harm is not going to be reduced if we continue to invest in police. So let's take the chance this year to put our money where our mouth is and to invest in the kinds of housing, um, mental health services, uh, public transportation, the things that help us get around, uh, live safe and healthy lives. Uh, let's put the money there instead of into our criminal punishment system. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sabra. Uh, next is May Mason. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're on. I am a settler on this stolen, unceded Algonquin lands. And in light of settlers finally listening to Indigenous communities and opening our eyes to the violent legacy of residential schools, I have a responsibility, as does every single settler in this virtual room today, to disrupt the expansion of colonialism in present day Canadian life. It is the colonial police forces that stole children from the, for these violent institutions who continue to that practice through the foster care system. It is the colonial police forces who break Indigenous law on unceded pet Pachita territories, protecting loggers of old growth. And it is these violent police forces who raid homeless encampments in Toronto. And I would like to note that many indigenous peoples who are houseless are residential school survivors. It's these arrests and efforts of law enforcement that lead to the disproportionate incarceration of indigenous peoples. And therefore I speak to you today because my ancestors did not disrupt colonialism when they settled here. They benefited from it. 
And every single person at this virtual table, including myself, benefits from colonialism and its genocidal legacy today. So I'm here to disrupt that and hold myself and other settlers accountable for upholding these violences to our own benefit. Personal trauma of the community drives the defund movement. It is the shared experiences of impacted communities that push for equity and justice. We hear that you are listening, but then we must watch as you negotiate whether our pain is believable, relevant, or enough. This is violence. This is re-traumatizing, and this is systemic racism. These continued de delegations, reviews, reforms, and evidence gathering are all delaying the inevitable and harming people along the way. And the inevitable is the defunding of the police because it is proven that prevention and care are key. Peter slowly acknowledged this in a speech years ago and in multiple speeches. And he also stated that policing as it currently stands is like a woolly mammoth walking towards their own extinction because of these very reasons. So all the innovations that we see through smart cities, community hub policing, new mental health approaches that demand more and more money are all tools to maintain relevance. All these innovations are just trying to maintain relevance. If this is the very view of our own top police officer, why not just cut to reality? Reactive punitive policing measures show up after or during conflict, conflict com compound the harm with their own violence and disappear people from their families. Proactive care-centered practices like dignified housing, education, safe supply, equitable access to all forms of healthcare, food security, reliable free transit to name a few, actually address community harm at the roots and reduce crime. This is data-driven and it's an understanding of upstream crime prevention that has been acknowledged effective by Slowly himself. So then why keep cops at the table for creating proactive solutions? Well, it has been done. And every time I hear about the success of these police partnered programs like Vision Jasmine or Trust 15, they always speak to the community building that fills social gaps in their neighborhoods like relationship building and social needs funding, not the police efforts like surveillance, information sharing, patrol duties or arrests, although cops do still take credit. So then why not just fund and support these community efforts? that would be a direct act towards real change. We do not need to keep inflating our police budgets to see these outcomes. When we continue to funnel our social service priorities through police money, which is an oxymoron in and of itself, these initiatives like Vision Jasmine will see improvements in their, in their residents for white residents. While black and indigenous residents are sub subject to police brutality over surveillance and violence due to exposure to such an inherently racist institution. This leads to the death of Black and Indigenous residents like Anthony Oust on Jasmine Crescent. So yeah, maybe Vision mm -hmm. Jasmine did reduce crime, but as long as OPS exists in our streets, systemic police, systemic police violence will continue to terrorize Black and Indigenous people, and that is not the price that we should pay for reduced crime. Peter Slowly was right. The police are heading towards extinction, and why would we want to resist that? Do we want to envision a world without violence, without criminalization, where cops aren't needed? How can we ever begin to build that future if we keep repeating our past? So break the pattern, amend this motion to lower the tax levy for the police budget for 2022 at 0% and do whatever you can in your systemic and individual power to reallocate funds towards health, housing, childcare and other social services. Stop saying it's not in your power because as settlers, it is our responsibility. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. Our next uh, speaker is Bethany uh, Leonard. Hi there. Can you folks hear me? Yes, go ahead. Perfect. Hello. Uh, we just, Outdoor uh, educator living on the... Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I just froze for a minute. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. Hello, my name is Beth, and I'm an outdoor educator living on the unsurrendered and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. Part of my job as an outdoor educator is to always be noticing my surroundings, observing ecosystems, and encouraging the kids I work with to look close and get curious about the biodiversity existing throughout the city. As somewhat of a professional observer, I would like to share a firsthand picture of what the community ecosystem looks like when I leave my apartment in Centertown West. First of all, I see my community being criminalized at an increasing rate. Police visiting my street on a weekly basis, sirens blasting multiple times a day. I see individuals experiencing homelessness and mental health crisis being targeted by police 
during a homelessness emergency and pandemic. I see rent evictions while rent and housing costs skyrocket during a housing emergency. As I walk by the river, I see historically low water levels while also seeing city mandated destruction of green space to build high rises, parking lots and more all during a climate emergency. So all of these emergencies were declared by Ottawa City Council and I have yet to see the kind of urgency, action and creative problem solving emergencies are meant to elicit. What I see when I look around my community is an unbalanced ecosystem in need of healing, accessible community services, preventative care, harm reduction and other kinds of transformative action, not more policing and punitive measures. This brings me to my main points regarding the proposed 3% increase towards Ottawa Police Services for the 2022 budget. First of all, members of the Ottawa Police Services Board promised to freeze or reduce the budget in 2022. So by including this recommendation, you are in fact disregarding what the board promised. This sends the message that City Council isn't actually listening and learning and is instead choosing to act at will. This also sends the message that there has been little to no consideration for the feedback that has been shared by over 100 delegates at the OPSB meetings over the past year. Secondly, to quote the late Ruth Morris, a Canadian author and legal reformer from her book, Stories of Transformative Justice, the more layers any organization has, the more impersonal, uncaring, and in many ways inefficient it becomes. I had firsthand experience of this when I contacted Ottawa police last summer to report an instance of sexual harassment and indecent exposure when a man approached me while pleasuring himself. I was guilted for reporting the day after the incident, received no empathy or recommendations for support, and was denied a request for follow-up. My thoughts following the whole experience was, what was even the point in calling the police? To continue to provide the flexibility or parameters to increase the already $376 million budget for police, you are effectively investing in its inefficiency. And if you truly believe this hefty budget is a good investment of our tax dollars, tell us exactly how and what actually justifies a budget this large. I imagine it has a lot to do with the high cost of militarizing the police, which communicates that the city is readying to go to war with its own citizens. On the flip side, by only offering 55 million to the housing and homelessness emergencies and only 25 million spread across 160 plus community organizations, you are helping guarantee there are people in desperate situations to police. Your jobs are to figure out how to get resources and support to the citizens who are being most impacted by the many emergencies this city is experiencing. There are many people who are already doing the work for you of figuring out how this could work, such as the Ottawa Coalition for a People's Budget. To continue to divert funds through the police organization with the hopes that it will trickle down to serve and protect the community in a healthy and equitable way is careless and communicates as such to your constituency. To quote Ruth Morris once more. One minute. Thank you. To quote Ruth Morris once more, our current system of justice is punitive, focusing on two questions. Who did it and how can we punish them? In our obsession with these questions, we ignore both victims and offenders real needs and fail to ask the more important questions of who is hurting, how can we heal them? Bottom line, there is so much healing to be done and policing doesn't heal. To close, it's a great time to have a part in social transformation and this is all your invitation to participate in a world that is indeed changing. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Councillor Menard. Yes, thanks very, very much. Thank you uh, for your uh, delegation. Um, that was that was also very powerful. In fact, all the delegations have been powerful in what they're communicating and, and different voices. So thank you. Um, I, I, I guess I, my question is, is how do you convince people um, that say they just don't want to they don't want to slash the police budget? That's what they say. They say they that uh, you know people always ask for police, but then they turn around and and say that we want to uh, you know freeze the budget. How do you convince people like that um, that doing this is the right thing? What do you need to say to them, and what do you need to show them to show that there's a different path that many other cities across North America are taking now with positive results? What can you possibly to say to somebody like that? Yeah, well, so the fact of the matter is, is like. I look at a police officer, I see another human being as well. And I, and in many ways, I, when I see a police officer who, who, who say believes that they care about 
uh, you know, the citizens of our community, I think that there's an alternate pathway for them to be helping the community that is better than policing just based on the history of what the police force has actually come from, which we, which since several delegates have already outlined, it comes from a systemically racist system. So we are in a period of transformation. And so, and that this is when we need to be creatively thinking, which is something that I think that it feels like our city, city council or just even the laws, everything seems so set in stone, but no, it's all something that is was something that was created and therefore creative thought is required and creative problem solving is required for people to come together and not try and like butt heads with one another and, and uh, you know, disagree. It's about coming together to come to a, an a, agreement and understanding of where everyone is coming from. So it's not trying to take away jobs, it's trying to create new pathways for everyone, including the people who are currently on the police force. And also, I, I believe, you know, I even heard that there's a lot of domestic violence within the police force. Why is that? You know what I mean? And the fact of the matter is, is there's people who are doing the research and the information is there. And so the people who are, are uh, the folks who have a say, such as all of you, you need to be doing that research or opening your hearts and minds to understanding that this is something that people really care about. And we're watching our world crumble around us and it doesn't have to happen. And you all have a very key role at this point in history in making those choices to move things in a direction different from where they've been going. So thank you for your question. Thank you, very, very well said. Thank you very much. Uh, next is Angela Keller Herzog. Angela, are you Good morning. there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Um, I'm waiting for a PowerPoint presentation. Oh. There we are. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so my name is Angela Keller Herzog. I'm the executive director of CAFES, which is Community Associations for Environmental Sustainability. Um, so I'm here essentially to make the point that the 2022 budget directions fail to provide any budgetary directions on the climate issue. Um, so it's, it's rather a point of omission rather than commission that I'm here to make. Next slide, please. So I think that you are, most of you are familiar with uh, CAFES. Um, we've been around for just over 10 years and we're a network and forum of representatives of community and residents associations to meet, exchange and engage with the city of Ottawa on environmental issues. Next slide, please. Um, so I will quickly run through some of the considerations for municipal climate finance. Next slide, please. Um, I don't think that there's any question that climate is an issue that all levels of government need to engage with. And indeed, Ottawa has declared a climate emergency. Um, the connection to budget, however, hasn't yet been made. Indeed, the budget method of dealing with climate in Ottawa is really to keep it off the budget. Um, my suggestion, our suggestion is that this definitely needs to be modernized. And this would obviously be also in sync with other levels of government that are, um, especially the federal government prioritizing climate finance. Next slide, please. Um, so just to give you a sense of the scale a little bit, the, the city of Ottawa should be lauded actually and um, across municipalities in Canada, Ottawa's climate action plan, the energy evolution, um, is actually a, a leader in terms of giving estimates and costing some of the actions required, both at the corporate municipal level and at community level. Um, now, these numbers that we're looking at here, which are net present values, which takes it down because the numbers are discounted over time, um, does not preclude injection of other levels of government funding. Um, but you can see the numbers we're looking at are in the billions. Next slide, please. So essentially um, 
as Wendy told us at the beginning of this session, um, there's a lot of prudent and solid financial planning going on in the city of Ottawa, including various chapters of long range financial planning. However, again, I'd like to point out that there is no even plan for having a plan on municipal climate finance. Now, climate finance is complex. There are um, a num many different institutions involved. Um, there's all kinds of leveraging. Um, I would argue that many of the long-term capital investments required also benefit from bundling, from co-financing. So it's, it is a bit of a jungle out there, which is why I think that we need to build the expertise in the city of Ottawa, and, and we do need to have a plan. Um, the other point, which is kind of obvious, is that the sooner we invest, the better we will be off both financially in terms of energy costs saved, in terms of monies leveraged from other levels of government, and of course, in terms of the reduction in carbon emissions. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so there are operational budget implications. I would argue that the city of Ottawa has far fewer staff assigned to climate. Next slide, please. There are a lot of different questions that we can be asking about the capital budget. So again, I think we need a solid framework. Next slide, please. We need a carbon budget. Um, which to the best of my knowledge, the city of Ottawa does not have. And next slide, please. There are also some big issues around divestment and risk disclosure. Thank you very much. I think you're on mute chair, but I, I think- you're Okay. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Angela, for being here and um, your presentation. Um, of course, you're right. There are a number of things we can invest in now that will save us money over time, but also reduce our emissions. And I think the transition to electric buses is uh, one of the big pieces that we're going to see operational savings in with, of course, other levels of government uh, contributing towards that. And I was very happy to see that announcement in transition. The um, What you kind of touch on is our long range financial plan. And of course, climate is a horizontal issue. It touches on many things uh, right across our, our city. And so I guess, how would you change or do the long range financial plan um, differently uh, to achieve the objectives that you talked about uh, with us today? I, I think that that's, that's a good question and um, maybe I can answer it from, from two different perspectives. Um, I think it's clear that, that many, many different things are interacting and we can't just be dealing with things in, in a stovepipe fashion. We know that if we do that, we miss things. So just because there's interaction, for example, between um, the food that we consume and the agriculture that happens locally and between health, it doesn't mean that we don't have plans for all of these different sectors. Um, and if we start saying, well, this sector is too horizontal. We understand it's overwhelmingly important, but we're not going to make a plan for it. We're not going to budget for it. Um, that's um, that's really saying we're not going to deal with it because we know that if we if we measure something, then we manage something, and that above all is surely the case when it comes to financial management. Um, now, the the second reason why I think it is so important that that the work on a long range financial plan should begin is is because there there is really serious financial expertise required in terms of these long term financial streams. So that if if we, for example, start borrowing a certain amount of capital to invest towards energy retrofitting, energy savings. Um, like you can't just do that out of the blue in, in, in a one-off, um, but you need to, because it, it is so huge, really, the transition we need to make to a low carbon economy, um, it needs to be properly planned out. Um, and it doesn't make sense to just have these one-off pop-up projects. Because if you do that, I think that we as a city are going to lose out in terms of the larger opportunities and other cities that are more strategic, 
that have more staff on this that are leveraging more of their internal financial expertise and, and innovation capacity, they're going to be um, and crowding us out. Um, so I'd, I'd like Ottawa to be out there and doing the best that we can for, for our city. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Bailey Gauthier. Bailey Gauthier. Hello. Hello, Bailey. Can you guys hear me? Oh, hi. Hey, Hi. how's it going, guys? Uh, good, um, good. The floor is yours. Nice to see you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm just going to bear with me. I'm not great at public speaking. Um, I just thought this was really important, and uh, I'll try and be quick and uh, concise with the info. Um, anyway, I just wanted to um, come here. I'm against the um, proposed parameters for the increase of the uh, police budget. Um, I, there's a bunch of reasons, obviously, why, and a lot of delegates have said a lot of stuff, so you've heard all the stuff, and we all basically know the climate of the situation, um, but the things I wanted to point to was just to um, point, uh, just to support the fact that the police service board recently passed the motion committing to finding ways to freeze and decrease the budget, um, and I feel like if we increase the budget now, um, it will be in, it'll basically be undermining the work that was done by another board in the city. And it's just hard because it's like, that doesn't make sense in terms of a financial thing because that other board has spent money and time and all these things to do these and the motion was passed and it's a promise, you know? So it's like, um, it's just a little hard to see like how that would make sense financially. And it would be really nice to see the um, the, the financial boards support the other boards in terms of progressing and um the the point with the um the increase it's about 13 million and looking at the proposed 2021 budget that the police provided um that 13 million basically goes into their wages and not necessarily into the communities or towards anything that is guaranteed to make the, the situation of policing better um, so again, there's another like it just it feels like it doesn't make sense to increase the budget or approve a budget where we already don't have um, any guarantee that it will make things better, and especially when it goes against the uh, service board. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to uh, point out was um, in the draft. Uh, the PDF that the police provided for the um, draft operating capital budget, they uh, offered that one. And then there was also the detailed document for the budget. Um, but the thing that was kind of odd, because I looked through them and uh, there was a slide that they basically talked about uh, social detriments of health. And it's just a slide that they put to like, I guess that's how the police were saying like, well, we want more money for these things, um, but the slide itself doesn't really make sense. And the things that are going on in it, like I had to learn about this because I didn't understand what like SDOH was, like social detriments of health. So um, I actually spoke to someone, like a friend who's a grad student for that specific topic and they kind of gave me an explanation. And uh, basically those are things in a community you want to invest in uh, to make your community safe and healthy. and what was odd was just that the police provided this slide you can find it online too um where they just named categories and they left out a lot of categories that are um, so it's odd that like these things aren't look, being looked at more critically and especially when we know that the money is going into salaries rather than these things that they're kind of saying they need the money for but they don't actually influence um so it's just uh, it's just been a little confusing and like again i'm not like a great speaker and i don't understand a lot of things about these deep deeper things but it's like even as just an average person coming here it's like knowing how things are it's almost strange that there's no follow-up with that and there's no like critical thinking towards that when we know that these things are already studied and they are uh, integral to the prevention of crime and the prevention of things and to make people like safer. So it's like when the police are coming in to use this, when we know it's going to their wages, um, I feel like it would be in the best interest to support those things that are already studied and that the service board needs the support 
of this committee to can carry on in that direction. Um, anyway, uh, that's pretty much it in summary. Uh, please don't increase it. I would really uh, appreciate that. Uh, and I know the service board has, a, they're hiring a consultant. That hasn't happened yet. Uh, I feel it'd be really cool if that was able to go first before deciding to increase any budgets. <laughs> and um, yeah, so anyway, thank you. Sorry, it was a little yeah. awkward, but um, nope, that was about fine. it. <laughs> appreciate your input. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> uh, next is Jack Belmare. Belmare. Mr. Belmare with us. Hi there, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, members of FEDCO. Thank you very much for having me here before you today. <clears throat> I'm here to urge you to recommend that City Council not recommend an increase to the Ottawa Police Services levy, and that they recommend that the Ottawa Police Services Board draft a budget based on no budget increase. I have a couple specific points I will make, but I would first like to thank Robin Brown from the 613-819 Black Hub for his excellent delegation, which I fully support every word of. I'm not here to get into the weeds about line items, but to speak as to why I ask you to shut this down at the start and at every instance that you can. Um, as you know, in December 2020, the Ottawa Police Services Board voted to ask their Finance and Audit Committee to strike a working group to determine how the 2022 OPS budget could be reduced or frozen at 2021 levels. I attended that meeting as well as you know, many people here today, and that motion came after 96 near unanimous community delegations demanding yet more urgent action than what was voted on. I viewed the motion as a way to show listening without committing to a budget freeze at the time. Personally, personally, I think the time for action is passed, but I think the board's action was valid and makes a lot of sense. However, I am troubled that even when the police services board makes this compromise with the community, it is not being honored. City staff do not seem to have re received a report from the Finance and Audit Committee, and I would ask that if it was received, if I was incorrect, it be published online. City staff also do not address why they recommend a 3% increase. Nowhere in the proposed budget directions report, nor staff's presentation to us today, is a purpose or justification for the levy stated. The closest we get is on page 11 of the report, where it states that the police levy is a separate levy and is recommended to increase by 3% overall. It doesn't say why. But last December, Councillor King of the OPSB, he stated that his preference at that time would be to meet statutory employment obligations and collective agreement increases that we have no control over. And the city council did unanimously vote after two um, sorry, I have the phrasing of it right here, support the OPS and OPSB in, yeah, sorry. Uh, and this levy is not even in keeping with that. No math is publicly available on how this 3% increase relates to OPS's payroll or collective agreement increases or obligations that they don't have control over for 2022. Again, if I'm incorrect, I would greatly appreciate if this information were publicized. Uh, budget advocates might add that the Ottawa Police committed to spend $1.5 million on a community-led mental health plan. That was something that they also voted on the OPSB in December 2020. But of course, that was paid for in the 2021 budget. And of course, that adds up to only a sixth of the proposed increase. Other advocates may also note that the OPS had planned to hire new officers to confront violence against women with their last budget increase. And um, I'm sorry, I can't recall her name, but I know we did have one speaker today explicitly say, don't use domestic violence as a shield for OPS. And personally, it's a natural for me to think of a city's priorities in terms of where they spend their money. And I think of how the Ottawa police force pays alleged sexual assaulters who have been suspended for over two years, $130,000 per year, whereas Councillor King's anti-racism secretariat received only $100,000 in last year's budget. If FEDCO plans to increase that budget, I would greatly support that to uh, give the anti-racism secretary more money. But in terms of the vote today on line item 12A2, I urge you to please not recommend an increase to the OPS level. Thank you for your time. Great, thank you very much. Uh, next is Deidre Moore. more hello i'm trying to unmute oh, there we, we hear you go ahead um don't know if you can see me or not 
We can't see you, but we can certainly hear you. Oh, here we go. There we go. Um, oh, we can um, see you here. The floor is yours. Thank you. So um, much, much of what I wanted to say has already been very well articulated by those who spoke before me. So thank you for that. Um, I'm also in, in, in no way, shape or form supportive of any increase to the OPS budget. Um, they did just receive 13 million six months ago, I believe. And, um, and that they're now back looking for, or, or the fact that it's being considered another 13 million is a bit mind boggling. Uh, I'm going to try to come at this from a different perspective. I'm a chartered financial analyst and I've worked in many different treasury uh, departments, including the one at the city of Ottawa back in the nineties. Um, so I want to kind of approach this from a fiscal prudence and uh, responsible budgeting point of view. And so I'd like to just start by saying every business in Ottawa and most families have had to pivot significantly uh, over the past 18 months just to survive. Um, as we all know, we've lost many small businesses. Um, but what I see from OPS, they continue to, you know, demonstrably waste their resources, which su suggests to me there's no scarcity whatsoever. Um, my most recent example of this is a couple of weeks ago, I was coming back from a, a bike ride and um, this gentleman in one of those electronic wheelchairs was stuck on the road. His battery had drained and he had a flat tire. And um, so there was a thunderstorm coming and I thought, geez, this is not good. And so um, I tried, I, he was too heavy. I could push him a little bit of the way, but because of the flat tire and the fact that it was an electronic wheelchair, it was really hard to move him. So fortunately, a couple other cyclists came by who were much stronger than I, and uh, we were able to move him at least out of the road and under a balcony. So he'd be shielded from the, the storm that was headed our way. And so, you know, I asked him, well, what can we do? And um, we called the company that operates, that provides the wheelchair. He's on ODSP. And uh, they said, oh, you know, we can't send anyone today to help you. <laughs> and so I thought, that's, that's, that's the wrong answer. So, so I got on the phone. I said, you know, what do you mean? You, you can't send anyone to help you. It's your product. It's broken down. It, apparently it was just serviced the day before. So, you know, they said, oh, we'll send someone. So we wait, you know, 15 minutes, half an hour. An hour goes by. It's ridiculous. And so um, I called 911 and explained the situation. I said, I think, you know, can't paratranspo. I don't have any experience with paratranspo, but can they come and help, you know, at least get this guy home and then the company can service his chair, you know, tomorrow. Um, excuse me, there's some, our place is being renovated. There's someone at the door. Anyway, to make a long story long, <clears throat> about 15 minutes later, two, two OPS SUVs arrived and uh, we were interviewed and then eventually paratransport was called. And so that's just to me a clear example of how they didn't need to actually show up. They didn't need to be dark driving SUVs and they didn't need to be two of them. Um, I'm not sure I was, I was permitted to leave, uh, after being interviewed, et cetera. So, um, I'm not sure how it turned out. I'm, I'm imagining he got home. So that to me is a clear waste of resources. Um, so again, when I look at it from a budgeting point of view, um, it doesn't seem like to me an outsider, there's any form of self-control when it comes to spending. Um, uh, my suggestion would be a review of overtime expenditures, uh, dispatch protocols, and risk assessment practices by the Ottawa Police Review Board is likely long overdue. I have other personal examples, but I'll leave those aside for today. Um, where should our tax dollars be allocated as we continue to endure the fallout of COVID? Well, many, many, many One areas. Minute. Um, I sent an email to Carol Legault with a couple of articles in case nobody had a chance to read them. Uh, one is on affordable housing, the one where the councillors voted unanimously in support of declaring Ottawa in a state of housing emergency. Um, oh, yeah, I watched four OPS officers remove a homeless person who was quietly perched on the side of an LCBO a couple of days ago. Uh, that's just another example. Perhaps we could build a new shelter for him because our shelters are full. 
Another article was written about uh, teen suicide and youth mental health crisis. The pandemic has driven more young people to seek mental health services. And I've heard that Chio ran out of bed, so we had to start moving them to adult hospitals. And uh, another article I sent along from Huffington Post, domestic violence has doubled during the pandemic and has already been addressed. Wrap up, please, your, your time is up, you could wrap up. Uh, in closing, um, we also have a burn rate going on. We can't afford, a, we don't have money to pay for it. We're borrowing money for an increase. So they don't do, they're not doing a good job and they don't deserve a raise. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Irvin Waller. So uh, I'm Irvin Waller. I'm a professor emeritus at the University of Ottawa. I'm consulted internationally on uh, science and secrets of ending violent crime. And I want to focus on what is missing in this conversation. Uh, I believe somebody is going to show uh, slides. So um, I want to be sure that uh, this committee is aware that by investing smartly the 12 or 13 million that has been talked about a lot this morning in um, evidence-based strategies that you could achieve the following um, targets, a 50% reduction in homicide shootings and gender-based violence. And this would lead to 50% fewer police interactions with indigenous black and equity deserving communities. It would also over time lead to a 50% reduction in police and prison costs for reacting to violent crime. Next slide, please. Uh, although it was mentioned earlier, the, um, the, the Police Act now includes a community safety well-being uh, plan. And uh, that community safety and well-being plan uh, talks about uh, people, in addition to policing, influencing crime levels. It also talks about data and risk factors and measurable income, uh, outcomes, sorry. And it talks about the police service board implementing a business plan that aligns with that. Next slide, please. So this is a complicated slide, but basically you, what it says is that uh, there are four ways of dealing with crime. If we start in the middle at red, it's responding to emergencies, and that's where most police resources go today, and also ICU capacity and, and so on. We have in the Ottawa some risk intervention, basically diverting cases to uh, services instead of arresting. And then we have prevention, and I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. And then at the outside, we have social development, which many previous speakers have mentioned, so housing and reducing poverty and dealing with mental well-being. But the reality is that you could significantly reduce violence in this city, both gender and street violence, by focusing on the most effective and cost-effective way to reduce violence, which the Ontario government calls prevention. Next slide, please. So it, it, this is a, a budget, uh, a proposed budget that illustrates what violence prevention is about. It's about uh, using things that have been proven, like having street workers that outreach to the relatively small uh, group of young men and their families who were engaged in the majority of street violence. And this includes having street workers respond to uh, victims when they go to hospital emergency. And these reduce violence within a couple of years by about 50%. I want you to remember that 50% figure. The second one has to do with uh, changing attitudes. We have some SNAP programs in Ottawa, but we could be doing a lot more. And these are also proven to reduce violence by 50%. We need in relation to violence against women, um, in addition to the previous items to do things at schools and universities, these also reduce violence by 50%. And I could go on. Uh, the, I've, I've got their jobs and training. It's uh, not so well proven, but it's very important. But what the city is lacking and you need to put in place is managing to achieve measurable outcomes. We need to have data that measure outcomes so that you as city councillors can know whether it's working. We need to have epidemiology around those victims of violence who come to uh, doctors or who come to emergency rooms. 
And we need to engage in a lot of professional development and training so that the city is able to implement these things. Next slide, please. So that's why we're waiting for the slide. So why, why do I have so much confidence that these would work? Quite simply, One because minute. the science is very well known. There's a list there from the British College of Policing to the World Health Organization uh, that have shown what works. I also have confidence that changing our way of doing things within the city would work. And probably more important than any other is, is the example set by Glasgow and Scotland. So my last slide. So my last slide, next slide. So the bottom line is that if we took 13 million and invested it in those things that have been proven to work and changing the culture from reaction to prevention in the city, uh, we could reduce violence, street violence, that's homicides apparently going up, that's gender violence going up, particularly during uh, COVID by 50% or more. Mr. Waller. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Eglin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, appreciate that. And, and thank you, Professor Waller. Um, I know five minutes isn't a long time, so I, I wanted to give you an opportunity. Uh, the, the numbers that you provide are, are, are quite bold and, and, uh, and um, if achievable, uh, significant. Um, I, I'm just wondering if you could give us a bit more, you, like you say, it's been proven. I'm wondering if you can give us a bit more uh, background on, on uh, cities where, and if, if possible, even city in North America, where these sorts of programs have led to this sort of, of, of decrease. So we can, it can be more, your explanation can be more tangible, I guess, in, in terms of what you're trying to get across to us this morning. So be careful about cities in uh, North America. Um, basically the homicide rates in US cities are uh, five to 10 times those of cities in, in, in Canada. And we need to stop looking at US cities for what to do. However, we can look to US knowledge from the Center for Disease Control and other sources, uh, and we can use it here. So the, the knowledge basically shows that when you implement a street outreach worker program in uh, a high crime district of uh, Chicago, and you compare it with another high crime district in Chicago, you see a 50% reduction or 60% reduction. So these effective programs that I put in that budget uh, are, are all supported by either a random control study done in, uh, in, in the US or in England or in Australia, um, or by recommendations from national commissions like the Youth Violence Commission. When it comes to city success stories, people talk a lot about Oakland, but uh, Oakland has a homicide rate that uh, no, 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 no city in Canada can even imagine. And those cities in the US are heavily policed and highly incarcerated, in fact, hyper incarcerated. We need to start looking at cities similarly situated to us that actually have good, relatively good social policies, not perfect. And those cities are in Western Europe. And my favorite actually is the city of Glasgow that reduced um, homicides by 50% within three years by establishing a unit that this is the uh, management brains to make things happen. And they did things like uh, youth outreach and they did things in their emergency rooms and they did things about domestic violence. But the, the bottom line is they got a 50% uh, reduction within three years of when they started it. So I, I have no doubt, and, and, and by the way, I'm not the only one promoting this. So the Youth Violence Commission in the UK promoted it and who should adopt it, but the, the mayor of London, uh, the city of London in, in, in England. So we have a lot to, to learn. And what Glasgow did is basically what has been agreed by governments across the world over and over again at, in the context of WHO, or in the context of the UN Office on Drugs and Crime and, and Habitat. So for me, it was not surprising that Glasgow did it. And by the way, Glasgow had a guy a little bit, if it's possible, like Peter Slowly. 
that was not the invention of some um, sociologist. It was the inventor of the chief of detectives for Strathclyde, that's the uh, police for Glasgow. And he learned it from um, a public health meeting that I was actually at, uh, uh, where he said, well, we're gonna use these public health strategies. And that's what we, we need to do. And um, I'm, I'm watching what Toronto is doing. They've actually um, published a um, relatively concrete uh, community safety plan. They're looking for my comments and input on it. I, I want the city of Ottawa, we're rich enough to um, have homicide rates way below any other city east of us. And why am I saying east of us? Um, because um, Toronto, of course, has a much higher homicide rate than us, but Montreal doesn't. And Montreal has a lower homicide rate, even though it's a, 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 a urban core. And we're not an urban core. We, we have a lot of uh, areas where you're not going to see a lot of street gang uh, violence, but you are going to see lots of domestic violence. So, and Montreal did some of those things. They didn't do it as well as I want. Uh, we're now 2021, and we can learn from those. And it, this is not a huge cost item. The benefits to the city are huge. So I think we're at 10 homicides this year. This is outrageous. Um, if that trend continues, which it may, um, we are going to be uh, we're going to be moving towards a Toronto level. We should be going in the other direction. We have and other on, questions, uh, Dr. Sorry. Waller, for you. I, I have one very quick follow-up, Dr. Waller, if, if I may. Uh, the, the Glasgow comparison that you made, you presented a budget this morning on, on several of your slides. Is the money that you're proposing being spent in Ottawa comparable to the sort of money that was spent in Glasgow? Uh, Glasgow uh, used the current services quite a bit, but they had programs on youth outreach. Um, I am presenting a budget that is... Uh, more in line with all the things that we know make a difference. So, uh, and the city of London in England is looking at more, more than Glasgow did. And we should be looking at more than uh, Glasgow did. Glasgow shows that it's possible, but given the knowledge we have today that is readily available, it's not easy probably for you as a counselor to read, but I, I, I can refer you to things that are easier to read. Uh, we could achieve those. Now we would need to increase those amounts over the next two or three years. And it would prob probably take three to four years before we could actually see uh, good grounds for reducing the police budget because they are not needed to investigate so many homicides that are very expensive. They're not needed to respond to so many violent um, incidents. And of course, they don't largely respond to intimate partner sexual violence. So that's a different issue. Thank you. Councillor Menard. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Councillor Menard. Thank you very much, Chair, and yeah, good questions by uh, the, the Chair of uh, OPH. Um, and Mr. Waller, thanks for your presentation. I read your book, um, Ending Violent Crime. Um, thank you for all you've done there. A lot of those themes have been repeated by criminologists uh, for, for a long time now across uh, our country, but you've really synthesized it into what works, and you've looked at um, different examples in cities and experiments that have gone on that have proven uh, this over and over again. Um, I guess the simple question is, we've got a $13.53 million increase again, slated for the policing budget. Our police budget has, has tripled uh, in, in 20 years here. Um, and we're not seeing the positive results that you're talking about with the tripling of the police budget uh, in just 20 years. Uh, what uh, kind of results would we see if we get those street outreach workers, uh, in particular building trust, as you say, with, uh, with uh, young men and school programs aimed at uh, giving tools to students that, you know, can, can help um, uh, with their own uh, emotional well-being? Uh, what could we see through OPH uh, and street outreach workers, mental health workers, um, that would be different than what the police currently do 
with that increase in funding? What would be the difference? So my, my focus is on what reduces violent crime and not what reduces uh, mental illness. And the overlap between mental illness and violence is uh, not as big as people think. Um, so if we invest in those things that go after um, this relatively small group in the city who are primarily in, impacted by um, street violence, the people carrying guns, getting involved in street gangs and associates and so on. Um, we will see that go down relatively quickly. It will take a little bit of time to get trained and we have to stop uh, project funding. We have to have uh, sustained funding. And then over two or three years, we will see um, reductions like uh, 50%. And I, I, I really want to focus for a moment on that domestic violence thing. What governments are doing at the moment is saying, well, we don't have enough resources to build more housing for um, victims of domestic violence. And the first speaker today uh, said um, that the policing isn't the solution. Well, we can protect women, uh, particularly in the high risk years from um, sexual violence and we can tackle um, domestic violence. And we will see those changes, but it, it, you have to measure the changes differently for domestic violence. You have to do surveys either in universities or in schools or in the general public. And uh, it's really important to have measurement. What we measure, we treasure. And the police budget at the moment is confused with what actually uh, protects lives and protects women, because that isn't how it's measured. So we have to get the measures out there and we have to target them. And this is uh, how you will actually achieve the reductions and ultimately relieve a lot of pressure on the police budget. Very well said, thank you. Councilor Kavanaugh, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Waller, for your presentation and your information. Um, I'm a, the liaison on women and gender equity for, for council, and um, I can help but be interested in your approach on domestic violence. Um, one of the questions I have in terms of the example you gave of, of Glasgow is, is the governance. It seems like we have this issue of, of how the governance is that we have to treat the police board as um, separate because they're independent of us, um, yet we, we give them an increase, but um, we don't control their everything they do. In Glasgow, was was this done, this, this work? You said that the uh, chief detective initiated it. Was it done within the police's budget? Or how was it, how was it uh, governed? It was governed by, they set up what's called a violence reduction unit. Uh, which is exactly ar ar around governance. So um, I believe that uh, it was set up initially from the police budget. Um, I actually don't advocate it coming from the police budget, uh, but it then became uh, part of the whole of Scotland policy. The important thing is that there is a violence reduction unit. This particular one was headed by this charismatic police leader and by an, um, a public health epidemiologist. And what they did was, it, it, it's all governance. The word you've used is exactly right. Uh, and I, I think the, um, the Police Act now with this community safety stuff uh, is calling for this, but it, it's not as good as it could be. Ottawa could do better. So we need a high level unit uh, uh, that actually looks at where the crime problems are. Um, not just street violence, but also violence, intimate partner, sexual violence, gender-based violence, and comes up with a strategy as to how they're going to address it, sets uh, performance indicators. Uh, we've actually developed for UN Habitat performance indicators that you could be using in the city of Ottawa. Um, and you go from uh, from there. So this is not a, some loosey-goosey idea that we're just this is, this is measurable outcomes, stuff that you can really see as city councillors 
whether the money is being well spent and whether it is achieving those objectives. And if it isn't, you can ask for improvements or you can stop the, uh, the funding. This is the way that we have to reduce violence and reduce a lot of the problems that go on, go on around the way that we police uh, cities. And, um, and you just have to look south of the border to see the disasters of an all policing, all incarceration approach to uh, trying to stop violence. It doesn't work. Violence went up by 30 to 50% in US cities during COVID. No Canadian city saw anything like that because we have good social policies, but we can do a lot better than we're doing now. I appreciate that. At the moment, we have Crime Prevention Ottawa. You're probably familiar with our budgeting. Um, and it's a very, very small budget. Um, it, it's frankly kind of token, but um, is that the kind of place for it? I, I'm just, because I always thought that there should be a lot more there. Well, I'm not sure whether it's a lot more money for <clears throat> the governance group. The Violence Reduction Unit doesn't need to be big. You do need to staff it with people who know the evidence, who know how to manage. Um, but it, it, I think Crime Prevention Auto were that budget is being confused with a, a genuine violence prevention budget. Uh, you can't have a million dollars and call it a violence prevention budget. That's roughly what you would be spending on a violence reduction unit, which would be, I, I, I think, uh, most, a higher level of skill in terms of knowledge of what works and how to implement it than they currently have. But then you have to, uh, my budget with its six items uh, shows you the sorts of things. And we costed those using costs actually from the um, Washington State Public Policy Center, which advises the state of uh, Washington. We obviously adjusted to Canadian dollars, but uh, we, we have actually uh, costed it. I uh, would certainly want the city to recost my, my budget, but it gives you, I think, a general idea of what the city should be doing. Hey, I, I appreciate that. And of course, we need our partners uh, at other levels of government uh, to support us on this as well, since, uh, the, since that's the way our system works, uh, such the province I'm speaking of. Um, I really appreciate your information. I see my, my colleague, uh, who's the uh, chair of the police board, has her hand up, and I'm sure she's going to have some good questions as well. Thank Dr. you. Beans. Thank you, uh, Mayor Watson, and uh, good morning, uh, Professor Waller, and thank you for being here this morning, for joining this conversation and providing us with your wise counsel. Uh, I'm the chair of both Crime Prevention Ottawa and the Police Services Board, and I'm certainly well aware of the urgent need to reimagine policing under the umbrella of uh, community safety and well-being. I, I guess my question for you is how aware are you of the work that is being done in this city both um, to um, bring about a community safety and well-being plan and also the work that the city has now taken over um, to reimagine uh, responses to mental health calls in the community and um, have you been involved in that work and do you think uh, we're somehow falling short? So I'm very familiar with the uh, mental health well-being um, and I am generally aware of what uh, Crime Prevention Ottawa has been doing. Um, I only know what is public from the uh, Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan. Um, I, I am much more familiar with the Toronto um, Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan, which is impressive. And they have invited me to uh, comment on, uh, on that and comment particularly on the, uh, the violence prevention components of it, uh, both on street violence and domestic violence. I've not been invited by um, anybody from the city of Ottawa. I am in communication with Peter Slowly, uh, who I've known for some time, and I, I know generally his outlook. I'm actually quite a fan of, uh, of the opportunity that he gives us to actually do the things that will reduce violence in the city. I have a meeting set up with him or is being set up with him. Um, 
I, I was involved in the, the early creation of uh, Crime Prevention Ottawa, and I think the vision I gave you today is the same vision I had 20 years ago, or whatever it was, 15 years ago, with the difference that um, there's a lot more data, a lot more evidence available, a lot more realization of the importance of measurable outcomes. Um, I, I think the city needs to look seriously at setting up a um, the, the governance group that, that, for instance, the city of London has set up. Um, Glasgow is, is a good step, but we can do better than, than Glasgow. I, I think we may be able to learn from uh, places like Edmonton who are committed to a 50% reduction in violence by 2030. Um, I, 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 so I think there are some things I would like to see the city of Ottawa join that group so we learn from uh, other cities. Uh, I want just to caution about expectations from other levels of government. The city of Toronto, for instance, wants to fund part of it by getting money from uh, the province and the feds. Um, I, I, hopefully the province will come up with uh, money, but there are no signs that they're gonna do it yet. And the feds, the problem is that they are, uh, they fund projects, they go for five years and uh, once they've been shown to work, they uh, drop off. So um, there's maybe gonna be a federal election and maybe the Ontario mayors or the big city mayors can put uh, heavy pressure on the federal government. I, I think the, the it, I, I go to international meetings with the federal government and they say all the right things and then you can come back here and they're not spending where they should be. So I, I, I think the city of Ottawa could, with the, well, the mayor of Ottawa maybe, with the mayor of Toronto could be putting serious pressure on the feds to come up with serious money. Um, what they're doing on gun violence uh, will not have a significant impact on the sorts of gun violence we have in this city. So you need to do the stuff that tackles the demand for gun violence. And uh, the gun groups all agree with me um, that we need to tackle the risk factors. Um, this is not rocket science, but it is very different from the way that funding is done in silos. And we're not looking at evidence. We're not looking at international best practice. We look at the wrong best practice, um, mostly to say, well, well, we're better than the United States. Well, let's look at some folk who are in the same ballpark as us and let's look at um, outcomes. Uh, I'm a big fan of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. You can see that from my visual image. There's SDG 16. Um, I, I would like this city to be a leader in demonstrating that we can significantly reduce street and gender violence by 50%. In my slides, I talk about over a four year period, but hey, I would be happy if we did it by 2030, that's the SDG goal, but I would like us to start by targeting uh, over the next four years, and then we've got a little bit of leeway to um, improve what we're doing over time. Thank you, Professor Waller, and I, I share many of your goals. I, I too would like to see a reduction uh, in violent crime and a uh, change to much greater focus on community safety and well-being. Um, the city under uh, Tony DeMonte Emergency and Protective Services is leading the city's efforts around community safety and well-being. I think it's incumbent on us as council uh, to make sure that, that we, we get that effort right. I think it's, it, it deserves more prominence than perhaps it has today in the city of Ottawa. Um, I would be happy, Professor Waller, to put you in touch with uh, Anthony DeMonte um, to uh, have that discussion with him and perhaps the city manager if you'd be interested uh, so that we can talk about uh, uh, what we need to do to augment uh, our community safety and well-being plan. Again, thank you for being here this morning. Thank you, Dr. Waller. Next is Rachel Urban Shipley. Hi everyone, um, I don't have a costed budget, although I'm very impressed. Um, uh, I just wanted to, to speak today to say that um, 
Uh, I'm concerned about the length of time that's that seems likely to pass between the community speaking up to say that we need a reinvestment in services other than policing um, and a decrease in the police budget and it actually come to, coming to pass. Um, it, like the fact that it's set to be increased again really concerns me. Um, and last year when I wrote in uh, to uh, to suggest reallocating money, I was told uh, that it would take a year after de the decision was made to have money ready to reinvest in robust and long-term methods of community safety because of um, concerns about severance pay for uh, officers. And uh, so if, it, if it's already going to take a year after that point, and we're not making that decision this year, um, and that's being pushed into the future again. I'm, I'm concerned about this. I, I recognize that there are consultants uh, being engaged in order to attempt to uh, find good ways of, of um, reducing the budget. But I'm also, I, the goal that was stated in the CBC article I was able to read at least is not, it's not that um, substantial, like it reduce or freeze next year's budget. That's, that's, um, that's not a huge change. And I'm concerned that we're we're now looking at this sort of small change uh, that will lead to it looks like maybe reinvesting in other things in what three years after the community uh, spoke up about this. It's it's worrying to me that that we're looking at at such a big time lag. And I I know I, I know that it takes time, but but I'm I'm concerned that we're looking at it again. Um, and uh, um, just looking at my notes. Uh, I, I basically I would I would like to see a dramatic reduction in the police budget. I'm not sure that th this consulting contract is likely to get us there, um, and I'm also worried that if if a city when a, the city election looks like it will occur before any change would be made to reduce the police budget, and who knows what that would mean for this. Um, and all in all, like I'm I'm happy to pay property taxes via my rent. I'd be happy to pay more if it made people safer, but I'm really reluctant to see the police budget increase anymore. I'd love to see it reallocated to better things so that vulnerable Ottawans feel safer and they feel more included. Uh, I don't want to pay money to, more money to the people that vulnerable Ottawans are afraid of. Thanks very much. Great, thank you. Uh, our next uh, speaker is Salma Shahabi. Good morning, Mayor. Uh, good morning, uh, Council members. Um, I'm here today. I, I know you already heard it from a lot of other delegates about uh, uh, controlling or reducing the amount the city would be spending for the police services. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to one thing about that, which is the school boards. When they consulted with the students and the families, they came and unanimously uh, all four boards decided to cut that uh, support for having police in schools. And they were able to do it much quickly, much more quickly than we are doing as a city uh, considering this. I'm not saying don't fund the police. I'm just saying this increase is not in line with what the public has um, uh, talked about in the past year or so. And uh, you have the power to actually make this right. Um, so this is one of the items I wanted to talk about. The other one is um, yeah, I would like you to think of uh, increasing the budget. There is no um, item in the uh, directions to increase the budget for the housing branch. And in April, uh, the Community and Protective Services, they were sitting discussing increases to monthly allowances uh, to give to residents so they can better uh, accommodate the monthly increases and the monthly cost to rents. And uh, that was passed by this council, but there will be uh, up to $6 million that are federal and provincial allocations that we don't know if they're gonna be renewed under the Home for Good and Housing Allowances for Singles and Families. Uh, 4.58 million will be uh, due in March, 2022. Uh, another point two is by June 2022 and 1.18 is by October 2022. So if we don't have that uh, money allocated now from the budget, the city uh, housing services will be again scrambling to find that alternative source of funding to fund these uh, monthly allowances. And 
when we're talking about these monthly allowances, there's almost a thousand families at risk of, if we don't send that money to them uh, for their monthly uh, rents. So I'm asking you to have that ahead of time and I uh, believe uh, um, Mr. Luloff, uh, Ms. Diane Dean, uh, you've given directions to staff to not use the envelope six, which is capital repairs before coming back to council and reporting on what we need to do before we use that money for housing allowances. So I'm just asking here that we do this proactively, put that money, that almost $6 million that we might need uh, for housing subsidies right now in the budget. So we're not scrambling later on in the year wondering what to do with those households who are dependent on this. Um, and there is one more item that I would like to mention. Um, last year when we were doing the consultations with people, uh, one lady came and she wasn't, uh, she was concerned that there is no indigenous, um, there is no budget, uh, nothing in the budget that gives to the indigenous communities in Ottawa. They're, most of their f um, budget is from the federal government. And uh, I don't know how much you can actually give some of that, given that 30% of our homeless people are indigenous, there is, um, you know, a lot of, uh, need in the community that could be served by indigenous organizations and if we could actually allocate some of that budget to indigenous organizations to serve the indigenous people the indigenous way and that's all i have to say for you thank you for listening thank you very much uh, next is uh, emerson harkin hey good morning uh members of, of council first of all uh I want to thank everyone on the board here for their service to their uh, their communities. Uh, so at this point in the in the meeting, um, I'm sensing that there's a little bit of a, a theme uh, developing in uh, in the public delegations. Uh, and so before I even really say why I'm here, I mean you can probably all hazard a, a pretty good guess. Um, so really, just as a as kind of an ordinary member of the the public, I mean you know I'm a, a science grad student living in uh, in in Centertown. Uh, I just I want to implore everyone on the, the board here to listen to, uh, you know, to your constituents, to the, the subject matter uh, experts and community leaders uh, who I don't want to mischaracterize uh, anything that, that the other public delegates have, have said, but at least to, to my understanding, I mean, no one is really uh, clamoring for, you know, for another increase in the in the police budget. Uh, so I would really ask you to um, to think seriously about closing the door to uh, to another 3% increase in the, the police budget this year. Uh, thank you all for your time. Thank you very much. Um, next is Karen Freeman. Hi folks, I'm gonna keep this brief because I got my second dose yesterday and I'm feeling like trash, although very grateful. Um, yeah, I just, just a note to the delegation so far, um, like, thank you for speaking. It really energizes me, even though I might not be as animated as usual right now, um, to hear you speaking. And I think it's really important to use opportun any opportunity that we have to, to speak on things that we're passionate about, even if you don't, you know, you're not up to speed on the, the technical jargon or maybe some of the nuances involved with how council operates, I think. So thank you for sharing. Um, and thank you for having me here to speak. I am coming here as um, an individual concerned resident, although I do work for a social service agency in Ottawa for part of their youth program. Um, these are my own thoughts, but I'm using my experiences there to help inform my opinion, I guess. Um, yeah, I work. so I work with youth. Okay, sorry, rewind a little bit. I just wanna echo other folks, other delegations ask to be making a recommendation of a 0% increase. Um, in favor of hopefully the budget sort of shaping up to, to be actually funding the on the ground services that are really keeping our community safe. And um, I urge you that folks here on council and uh, in FedCo to maybe challenge yourself to be thinking about, okay, maybe we can't line by line be going through um, making changes to the police budget. But like, also I feel like it's part of your job to be taking the concerns of your constituents and like finding creative ways to advocate that on every level. So it's my invitation for that. But part of um, my job is to talk about, talk to youth about like what kind of communities that they want to see when they're older. Like what, what are some things you love about your community? What are some things that you would like to see improved? And I've done uh, workshops with like 
hundreds and hundreds of youth and never, ever, ever has anyone, anyone ever mentioned more police. Like no youth is not on their radar. It's not something they want to see in a community that they're proud of. But the strengths, the community strengths they do recognize are, are like social services and um, other places that provide, you know, sense of belonging and good food and help reduce food insecurity, like the actual social, tackling actual social determinants of health. Um, and I think that there's something really valuable to be, I guess, noticed there uh, the, as the young people, you know, the young citizens of Ottawa, like what do they want to see in their communities? And sometimes, you know, it takes a little bit of a humbling moment to just to, ref to reflect back on that and try to, I guess, advocate at any instance that we can. Um, okay, this is like fever brain now, but yeah, also the bus fare increase just really I'm having a really hard time making any sort of sense of that, you know, given the fact that there's an issue with low ridership, the solution really um, to increase fares uh, seems very uh, misled to me. But anyways, I would, I would encourage you all to sort of, um, one of my favorite nurture development theorists, his name is Cormac Russell. He, he always says like shifting the focus from what's wrong to what's strong. And the things that are strong in our community are, you know, the people and the, the organizations that like make us proud to be, you know, Ottawans and who are actually trailblazing despite people higher up saying like, oh, well, there's no other examples of this. So we're not going to do it. Like, let's be trailblazers. Let's take the amazing free labor of like Robin Brown and 613819 Black Hub and the Auto Coalition for People's Budget. Um, yeah, let's let's utilize our the strengths in our community and try to like work on a budget together that makes sense. And I think, um, yeah, I feel grateful for the opportunity to sort of say my piece at this point in time, even though maybe it's mm -hmm. like too early. Um, yeah, I, I just hope more delegations, uh, delegates feel encouraged to uh, vocalize, even if they're not necessarily, even if they're just rambling like me, that is all. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Hope you're feeling better. Um, okay, that's the end of our delegation. So uh, Councillor Hubley uh, has a referral motion uh, to the Councillor Cloutier motion. So Councillor Hubley, if you want to introduce your uh, referral motion. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Yes, the, um, in my view, the uh, cliche motion prejudges the outcome of the work of the Ottawa Police Services Board and therefore it should be considered later in the budget process. So uh, my motion says, be it resolved that the cliche motion regarding the OPS budget be deferred for council consideration during the 2022 draft budget review process after the Ottawa Police Services has tabled its budget and that the city treasurer be directed to include an update on this matter and potential funding available as part of the tabling of the 2022 draft budget with council on November 3rd, 2021. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. So now uh, questions and comments. Uh, floor is open. Councillor Menard, questions and comments. Thanks very much, uh, Mayor. I just wanted to, you know, reiterate um, the need to do something differently here in Ottawa around this priority. We've talked about it for for a while now, and of course, um, uh, last year had a had another increase to the police budget, while while other services um, uh, need to be funded. Um, and so, examples from across um, the country are are pouring in of changes to um, governance and models of safety that are, are being uh, unfurled and, and, and utilized. And so, you know, in Toronto, for example, um, they're ready to, to launch their, their non-police crisis response uh, pilot. And it's, it's a project that's gonna involve community-based nurses, uh, harm reduction workers, others trained in, in de-escalation the pilot is going to be launching in, in January uh, in Toronto's Northeast and Northwest areas. And those are underserved areas of the city. Um, the goal is to, to add more uh, of those units by mid 2022 and, and including a unit to service uh, indigenous populations in that city. Um, they've been talking about a, a mix of community nurses, harm reduction uh, workers, 
um, and then not accessible through, um, uh, you know, sort of traditional means. They, they could either call 911, so that's one, one means of it, or, or 211. It, it's a non-emergency line that connects callers with community services, and it would be um, totally separate from the Toronto Police Service. So it's not embedded in the, in the police service, which uh, again, best practices around the world show it shouldn't be embedded in police services. This should be outside of that. Uh, and um, that's, that's one of the models being set up right now. In, in Calgary, uh, there's been an allocation to invest in, in community services to enhance uh, crisis response. And uh, of course, there's been many other cities that have already uh, changed their budgets uh, to reallocate towards the types of things that we're, we're talking about today. So we, um, you know, we've got the examples out there to, to in order to do this. Um, I, I do think it makes sense to, to uh, obviously uh, see how the conversation goes at the OPS board. Uh, but I also think there's needs to be leadership where, where we're saying this is the time where we're going to be switching. There's enough evidence out there. There's enough community demand for it. Uh, that we say uh, we are going to be changing the, the budget in order to allocate towards elements that work and get better outcomes than what we're currently spending and also save money. Uh, so I, I would encourage that. Um, and I guess I, I also have questions around the other aspects of uh, the, um, the item, uh, not just on policing. Um, I can uh, ask those now if you'd like or wait till later. Uh, you, you still have time, so go ahead. Okay, I might I might as well go into it. Um, so the um, the budget uh, talks about uh, participatory budgeting, and so thank you for coming back for staff. That was an item that we had uh, voted on to for staff to look into that and motion that we had moved and was passed in December of 2019. And I appreciate the brief review of the existing examples of participatory budgeting. Um, but it's somewhat unclear as to, to what the implications were of that review and, and um, uh, some other questions that I have. So I had a motion that, that had called for a review of areas in the city budget where a participatory budgeting component may be desirable. Uh, but the report doesn't state some of those opportunities. It only goes back to uh, councillors line item budgets around the cash in lieu of parkland and our traffic calming budgets. Um, those existing options were already known and, and were highlighted uh, by the mayor um, when uh, you know, it was urged that council vote down the motion. So, but no other areas of the city budget were given consideration. And, and to me, I'm wondering about that interpretation uh, from city staff. So on that specifically, can, can staff pre please um, uh, respond to uh, that question? The motion did uh, ask for staff uh, for those specific areas and and I, I didn't see those come back so if staff can comment on that wendy well thank you councillor and thank you mr mayor um we did look at that uh councillor and i think you see in the report in terms of i'm going to say the benchmarking that we did not only in canada north america and basically across the world um participatory budgeting wasn't really seen as best practice. And when we applied the lens and took the feedback in terms of what we, other, we heard from all the other areas who were doing this, um, our view and what we had prepared in the report um, of which you spoke of is the two areas that seem to, I'm gonna say, best utilize participatory budgeting. And that's the two pieces where we spoke about the cash in lieu as well as the traffic calming. And they are two great examples where um, I'm gonna suggest that counselor can go out to the community to seek their feedback on, of which you have direct control over use of those funds. Yeah, and of course those were already known. And as I say, were already argued in, in to decline the motion previously. So um, that's not new information. Um, the motion was specific for staff to come back with line items within the budget and that wasn't done. Uh, the reason why we're trying to look at different models for our budgeting is that our budget directions and the draft budget seem to determine the final budget before a lot of that consultation take, takes place. We don't see major changes, if at all, in our budget after the draft comes out, despite a lot of community feedback. So um, how do we, with this directions report in front of us and the same old budget process that we have in front of us, get to the public consultation process that's going to shift or I guess respond to 
what public feedback is through counselor sessions and other areas to actually have those changes come forward in the final budget um, that's table. We're, we're not seeing that in our city. Uh, and so how does staff recommend if it's not through a participatory budgeting um, uh, method, what other methods could actually help to get feedback that is actually incorporated into the final budget? Thanks, Councillor, for that clarifying question. I think um, Councillor consultations can happen at any time. Uh, and I talked about that in the presentation this morning. You don't have to wait until either just prior to the budgets being tabled or during the budget um, process after it's tabled. They can happen now. And in fact, they can happen at any time during the year. So I would encourage if, if you wish to do that, um, to take that out and have those discussions and then bring that back to staff. Councillor Leeper. Yep. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so the, I, I know I do this every year, but I think it is worth uh, reiterating. I do have some questions with respect to the budget directions for uh, Mr. O'Connor. Um, the budget directions document seeks to get a uh, budget increase of, of no more than 3% overall uh, from, cities, um, uh, from city staff. Does that mean that council is uh, required to pass a 3% budget at the um, December 8th meeting? Uh, no, Mr. Mayor, as we've discussed in previous budget periods, this is a guideline that council sets. And at the end of the day, council is supreme with regards to such matters. So the, the budget directions document does not set out a, a cap to which council adheres. It merely uh, directs staff to come up with a target when it proposes a budget. Is that accurate yes, to say? It is, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And then at the council meeting is uh, on December 8th, is there anything preventing council from um, either adding to or subtracting from the budget that would result in a tax rate that is different than 3%? Um, at this point in time, Mr. Mayor, not to my knowledge, no. Okay, uh, so it is. Uh, I, I do think it's important for the residents of Ottawa to know that uh, the budget directions document is is not a cap. Um, I, I will be voting against it at council, I, I, as as I normally do. Um, but the uh, council still has flexibility to pass a budget that best reflects what the residents of Ottawa are seeking with respect to the uh, services that uh, that we provide to them. But uh, I do think it's important to uh, reiterate rate that we still have significant flexibility, even if the 3% direction is given to staff. Um, I do have one other question for Ms. Stevenson. Uh, with respect to the additional 2.5% increase in the transit fare, can I just ask, what is that in absolute dollars this year? Uh, it's just under $5 million. Council. $5 million? Perfect. Those are my questions. Thank you, Chair. Great, thank you very much, uh, Conseil Fleury. Yes, Mr. Mayor, uh, my questions are more Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Engagement and the, uh, the, the process that was laid out, but I will follow up on, on the last question that was posed. So, so Wendy, just so I'm clear, a 1% tax increase reflects what, uh, what financial value? Uh, Councillor, you said 1%, yeah, is that correct? Just so, yeah, just as a baseline, if, if we increase 1%, that means what uh, point, uh, it's a It's approximately $18 million. $18 million, okay. Yes. And then if, if there are changes to, say, deficits or surplus to the previous year, when will that be communicated uh, regarding the impacts of this uh, of, of this budget of these budget deliberations when we uh table the budget um we will have a forecast in there to year end and what you're also going to see coming up in september will be our q2 forecast so we'll have a report uh coming to finance and economic development committee on that as well as our year-end lookout okay Okay, and uh, just curious on process. So I, I heard you at the beginning, obviously we're still a pandemic, you're, so it's easier to do over Zoom and there's a, a lot of good reasons around that and, and engage Ottawa, but just re, re, regarding uh, broader engagement. So I usually have my local ward consultation and we happen to have 
uh, urban counselors consultation, those will, will be supported as well if, if they're online. Is that, is that uh, what I'm hearing? Uh, Absolutely, Councillor. Um, as right. you know, uh, staff from finance are happy to assist as we can, um, as as our partners in uh, public information as well. I, I appreciate the clarity. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you. Merci, uh, Conseiller. Uh, Conseiller Cloutier. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Cloutier, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. From you, uh, are these uh, questions on uh, deferral by uh, Councillor Hubley or my motion? Is it? Well, you can speak to anything. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. And, and questions um, as well. Thank you. Um, just to to my call. First of all, thank you to finance staff for their report. The upcoming budget process uh, is going to be difficult and to all the departments, the boards who will craft their budgets to give life to the strategic plans and the expectations of the residents of our of our city as we emerge from uh, from the pandemic. I appreciate your work uh, very much and um, and look forward to the, 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 the discussions we'll have this fall with respect to the budget on my motion and and uh, Councillor uh, Hubley. Um, I, I will just say the entire guidelines are, are today are referrals uh, in the budget process. It's the proposed 2022 budget directions, timelines, and consultation programs. Um, we, my motion does not give a budget direction. It gives guidelines that the board should go back and and um, and work on. My motion with respect to the uh, Auto Police Services Board acknowledges the motions from last November and does not presume the outcome. It, it is with regard, it was designed to ensure that we are prepared to address some of the areas of concern that we've heard from the public last fall, last November, again today, with respect to uh, police response and the city's uh, work with respect to, to mental health and, and well being. These concerns were, were stated by uh, OPS members themselves at board meetings. And uh, I, I believe Chief Slowly also referred to them themselves. Again, my motion, and I would appreciate support for my motion, makes zero assumptions about the process, does not presume an outcome. Um, the budget guidelines that we're dealing with today, which I'll support, were approved by council in 2018 and they're clear. That, that OPS is directed to prepare a budget with respect to uh, uh, the 3% increase. There are also motions that accompany it that talk about 0, 1.5 and 3%. And we'll see how all that plays out through the OPS board. Uh, should they ask for a 3% increase or less, then we continue with that discussion at, at boards, at committees and at council, and we'll see what they do uh, Police services uh, proposed to do with that 3% increase. I do not want to take away that responsibility from the police services board in any way, shape, or form. Again, if there is an amount of money, which we would consider anyway at, at budget, uh, we offer a little bit of guidance as to where it will go. And we've heard from our community on that. I, I would support reinvesting that in the services that have been called for and needed by our community with respect to um, critical mental health service, outreach services, Distress Center Ottawa, Unsafe at Home, Counseling Connect. We've all heard the calls from the public over the past year with respect to the appropriate response. And it is perhaps not always a police response. And that is what my motion um, tries to do. It does not insist on any specific organization. It only guides that the difference be provided to important community-based organizations. Um, other than that, Mr. Mayor, thank you for the time. I have no questions to staff, uh, but I would appreciate uh, FEDCO members' support for, for my motion. Thank you. Merci, Conseil. Does anyone else want to speak a first time before we go to Councillor Venard, Councillor Al Shantiri? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, let me begin by thanking our staff, especially the treasurer, for uh, for the, the guidance today. Uh, I just want to speak a little bit about the number, and we heard time and time again, you know, uh, you know, zero budget increase uh, or reduce the budget or other. I just want my colleague to understand 
whether you give zero budget to the police or you give them the three percent, any time their shortfall in the police budget, unfortunately, is landing on the city, and the city is still picking up the tab to pay for that shortfall. So it's okay to to sit here with our leadership and say, oh, let's do zero increase, and then they fall short and they bring us because they have to present a balanced budget every year, then the city on the hook to pay for. In 2017, WSIB increased operations uh, on injuries and, and other. So the, the service fell short $3.4 million. 2018, 6.2 million was deficit driven by WSIB background check revenue shortfall, which was adjusted subsequent to the budget over time due to staff in shortage because of the tornado response support. So uh, the list can go on, but I just want to take my, my colleague a little bit through the budget and where that budget is. And I want the leadership to tell me where do you want to cut this budget from? So the total budget is gross operation budget, 376.4 million, revenue 43.9, and net operating budget is 3. 332.5 million. We all know 82% of the police budget goes to salary and compensation. So it'll start with 307 million compensation breakdown, including the following. Salary, 234 million, which is you have no control over, it's been negotiated. Benefit, 50 more, 54 million. Also, you have no control because it is part of the collective agreement. Over time, it is 11 million, and we can predict what over. We can have a tornadoes, we can have floods, we can have pandemic. God knows where, what we can have. Other is eight million dollar to uh, WSIB retired benefit inside itself. Uh, 32 million material service and supply breakdown as fall. Well. The service 19 million training professional service maintenance, and we want that. We want to train our, our people to be professional, to be the address and mental health, and training in, in the use of force, and so on. That training is part of their job as they do every day. Material on supply 7 million, fuel, uniform, ammunition, training, etc. Surely to God, you don't want a police chase criminal on, on foot or on a bus. Fixed asset is 6 million computer, software, equipment, et cetera. So, and also there's 25 million in financial charge, including the former reserve fund pay contribution, 20 million capital funding, debit service and payment, 5 million, 21 million city uh, charge back in uh, broken down the fall. So the list goes on folks, but none of these items we have, you have control over. It is negotiated, it's a part of the part. So let's not sit here and pretend we, oh, we can just give them zero and then the police, because we heard from Mr. White earlier and the section four, we have to, as a city, provide proper policing and, and accurate policing to the, to the resident of the city of Ottawa. So therefore, the police will still operate day as usual. And if they fall short, it'll come back to the city. And as usual, the city will pick up the the tab and pay for that. So let's not kid ourselves. Police, yes, they, they need, uh, uh, you know, we can do better, we can do more training, we can, we can deal with some uh, issues we, like everybody else have in their workplace, but cutting their budget or defunding the police is not the answer. So I, I believe the motion being introduced by Councillor Herbie is a proper motion to defer this item. I'm looking for the leadership at the police board because this budget is obviously is, is up to the police board how they want to see the budget uh, increase or uh, flatten whatever they, they choose the term. But make no mistake, we need a leadership to tell us how they're going to achieve that amount they pick and don't come back to the city to bail them out. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Deans. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Mayor. Sure. I want to speak about two things. One, the police budget first, uh, and then the broader budget direction today. On the police budget, as I said earlier in the meeting, we are living in a time right now where policing is being reimagined within the broader context of community safety and well-being. 
there is a community expectation that policing needs to change and both the Ottawa Police Services Board and the Ottawa Police Service are committed to making changes. Um, I just want to remind Council that there is a lot of work being done. This is not a business as usual strategy. We have been listening and learning from the community and we are very aware of expectations on us. Um, part of the change includes finding ways to reduce the police services budget while continuing to provide effective policing in our community. The Police Services Board made a commitment in the fall of 2020 to make its best efforts to reduce or freeze the OPS budget at 2021 levels in 2022. The Board has been working hard to achieve this goal and I can say that we are committed to making our best effort to reduce the OPS budget ask this year. Our intention is not to default to a 3% increase in the police budget, but as Councillor El Shantiri quite correctly pointed out, this is a very challenging task. We have a subcommittee of the Finance and Audit Committee that is dedicated to this work, and they have been working with senior staff at the service to identify areas where the budget can be reduced. The board is also hiring a consultant to enhance its work around the budget. They will be providing analytical support to the board to identify opportunities for cost containment in the 2020 budget. Other work currently underway, such as the development of the mental health response strategy, also contributes to reducing the scope of police responsibilities. Engaging other community-based groups and institutional actors to play a larger role in the response will help to transition some responsibilities away from this service. As a member of council, my ward has had issues with violent crime and gun violence, and I recognize that there is a real need for policing in our community. But we need to strike a balance between finding savings to reduce the police budget while continuing to provide effective policing in the City of Ottawa. And that is what the Police Services Board is committed to doing, regardless of what the budget direction is. The direction is the direction, but the board is an independent board. We have made a commitment. We are working hard. We are striving to find savings where we can and to recognize what we're hearing from the broader community. Um, so that, that, that's my um, input into the police uh, board budget direction for this morning. On the broader budget direction, I think as we look to a post-pandemic future, we need to carefully consider where we as a council choose to allocate money in the budget. There are areas such as uh, youth services, housing and homelessness, poverty, community services um, that require more money more time, more attention from this council. And I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned from the pandemic and we should not in our budget context uh, lose sight of what we have learned through these challenging times that we have all gone through together. I, I don't wanna to be too blunt about this, but I think 3% across the board budget direction is too simplistic. I think it's a little bit lazy. I think what we need to do is perhaps strike a council working group to go through that budget and to look to areas in this city that require more funding and more of our attention and also to look for areas that we can find real savings. And I believe those are there to be had. And I think that work needs to be done by this council in the run up to the 2022 budget. I don't think every single service in the city requires the same amount of funding. And just as we're doing at police services, making our best efforts, and it's not easy, I'm not gonna say it's easy, but we are making our best efforts to reduce our budget ask. And I and do think across the board, uh, we should be looking at all of the uh, myriad of services that this city is providing to our citizens and look for savings so that we might free up funds for areas that clearly we learned through the pandemic require more of our attention. So that's my input into the broader budget direction and discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. 
Uh, anyone else on a first round? Oh, Councilor Menard, a second round. Thanks very much, uh, Chair. Um, you know, in terms of the question around, you know, which line items do you look at, and uh, how how can this how can this possibly be done? Well, we've heard from many delegations this morning, and the proof is there already in many other municipalities that civilian-led teams are much less expensive than a policing-focused team. This has been proven over and over again. And so when you're looking at the increase in uh, those in uniform, there's not just an increase in the number that come, you know, say 30 extra officers, it's the attrition and the, the rehiring of attrition that goes on as well. And what we are saying is there is a shift that needs to take place of that when that attrition occurs, not cutting anyone currently working there, but as they leave, shift that responsibility to civilian led teams that are much more able to tackle these issues with better outcomes and at lower cost. And I suppose I would go back to um, the question. Why is the question you're answering, uh, you're asking that? Why isn't it instead, how are you gonna address the current problems that we are seeing? Because there's problems that are occurring over and over again. We're seeing the disproportionate criminalization of Indigenous and Black folks in Ottawa. We're seeing criminalization of poverty and of drug use and of mental illness. And how, the question should be asked, how are you going to stem that? The question you should be asking is, how do we enhance the wraparound and connected services meant to intervene for, for people that are experiencing issues? The question should be, why have we seen a massive spending increase on policing in the last 20 years, a tripling of the budget? And how do we reallocate that to more effective means? And so I, I hope that we can come together in this place and make a modest reallocation. This budget, like other cities are doing around the world, recognizing the issues that are being experienced here and that are, that are better tackled, not by police, but by civilian led uh, teams. I have other questions around the budget. Um, we say in there, there is a there is a line that says the report states that experience has shown that providing direction that strives to achieve fiscal discipline of a predefined tax increase helps council mitigate tax increases to an acceptable level. And so I guess the question is to staff: How do staff define? Uh, fiscal discipline and what constitutes an acceptable level of taxation. Thanks, Councillor, for the question. And um, that direction provides a really good framework for us in terms of developing that budget. It's extremely important um, for us to have that because it means that we can put a budget in front of you uh, that is prudent. And so what we look at is what our pressures are, um, you know, what those inflationary increases are going to be, some of our cost of living increases. We gather that information um, and then build the budget based on that, looking for striking a balance between what is affordable um, and what is, is prudent for us to put forward. And that's where we come to the 3% that we have in front of you today. Okay, appreciate that. In, in terms of prudence, uh, the, there is a 2022 transit fare scheduled increase of 2.5% uh, being included in the budget. In terms of prudence, is it not unwise to raise transit fares when ridership is so low? So you'll see in um, not just the budget directions in front of you today, but also the transit affordability, affordability plan and the long range financial plan. We have built those modest increases into that in terms of overall transit affordability. So you're seeing the tax increase and then that modest increase in terms of fare to make transit affordable over the long term. Yes, but ridership was already declining um, and of course, the, the pandemic has meant it's plummeted. And so if we're not running it like a business, but rather a service, uh, should we not hold off on fare increases uh, to ensure that, again, the balance and prudence of the use of the service continues? Actually, right before the pandemic, um, transit ridership was up. 
uh, approximately 4%. So it was, it was on the rise, it was on an increase. And, you know, I, I think I said this during the beginning of my presentation, COVID hit. Um, you know, and it kind of, it knocked us on our feet in, in terms of so many different ways and trader, transit ridership has obviously, you know, declined as a result of that, but prior to, it was on the rise. Yes, the transit ridership had declined for about eight years straight and then rose for a few months uh, beforehand. Um, and I guess the question though is, given the decline since the pandemic, how is it prudent to raise fares again? when we're trying to get people back on the bus. As I stated, we've built that into our affordability plan. So we've got modest increases in terms of our taxation increase and our transit fare increase to keep transit affordable. Okay, there were another uh, number of health uh, related um, um, Ottawa Public Health um, services that had to uh, go unfunded or could not be um, produced and served uh, last year as a result of the pandemic. Um, and um, the, there is a big need there as well. Some of the um, social determinants of health, as we've talked about, these are the folks that do the preventative work. Um, so how can we justify, you know, a $13.5 million increase to the police on the municipal side of the allocation um, and only a $985,000 increase to public health, recognizing, of course, there are provincial um, uh, uh, injections, um, that is still a, a much larger difference uh, than, uh, than it should be given all we know that public health does. So I guess the question is how can we justify it after what we've seen in the last year and a half? I can certainly uh, start to answer that question. Um, and what we have to remember here is the council approved framework in terms of how we draft the budget and put the budget in front of you. And that framework um, includes a pro rata share for each of the services. So when we look at our citywide or public health um, transit, they get the pro rata share based on their percentage of the overall budget. And so that's why you're seeing the difference between the different areas. Uh, in terms of um, what happened last year, uh, I'm going to suggest to you that not only public health paused some of their services, um, but we certainly did on the city side as well, because, you know, everyone had to pivot, we had to respond uh, to the pandemic um, and respond, providing different services and using our people in different ways to be able to do that. Uh, public health has um, been very fortunate actually as has the city in terms of receiving all kinds of assistance um, from the province, either through the Safe Restart Agreement, um, the Social Services Relief Fund, or uh, from the Ministry of Health to be able to supplement some of those things. So um, they've continued, but they've, as I said, they've had to slightly pivot, right, in terms of you know what they're doing and what they're delivering. So we're actually responding to the pandemic and we can recover from that. Yeah, and I suppose hey, your time is up, Councillor. Uh, over to Councillor El Shantiri. Councillor El Shantiri. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and my question to uh, to Ms. Stephenson, as we heard today from the delegation, and and uh, some of us been involved quite a bit with the community safety plan and well-being, and I know they have not presented yet. Would be possible to be presented before the police board uh, do their budget so it could be some of that uh, recommendation in the community safety plan and well then been incorporated and 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 maybe can be some of the funding transfer from the police budget to to work together with the community safety plan because to my knowledge there's only two community safety plan right now been complete is Ottawa and Peer Region, and, and they're both actually excellent. Toronto has not represented theirs to the ministry yet. But is there's a possibility, because we know we have not received officially the community safety plan and well being yet, but is it possible? I'm not sure if it's you or Tony can answer this to bring it, you know, time and closer so we'll have an opportunity so the board, the police board can take a look at it. And then us as a community, we can take a look and see how can we make investment in a community safety plan and well-being. 
Uh, I can ask my colleague, uh, Mr. DeMonte, if he's uh, on the line um, to speak to that, Councillor. Tony, are you there? Or Steve Kalakis? There, yeah. yeah, I'm actively involved in the uh, Community Safety Wellbeing Plan. And um, we're bringing it back to answer the council's question. We're bringing it back uh, to CPS in October is the plan. We actually delayed it. Um, we were supposed to bring it back this summer, um, but um, we needed more time to finish off the uh, plan. Um, we're also looking at the, a lot of the conversation that's happened today is actually quite relevant to the plan because we are looking at a governance structure that deals with that. We're looking now at the whole mental health um, strategy as uh, for the motion the council deans moved. Um, I've been moving that forward um, with our partners. And in fact, we're meeting with the guiding council um, in a few days to talk about how we move forward in terms of governance for them. So to be, the, the report isn't finished. Um, certainly the chief has a, a copy of the report. Um, so he knows what's, what the recommendations are there. We've had, um, we have a draft and you know, I'd be happy to share what the priorities are uh, with the board uh, through the chief or directly to Councillor Dean. So I don't have a problem with that, but the product isn't finished. Uh, we still have pieces that we have to build on it, but the six priorities that have been created as a result of the public consultation um, are, um, are basically finished. It's just how do we implement um, those recommendations as per Dr. Uh, Waller was talking about. He raised some good points, which we are actually discussing, which he's not aware of. Hey, anything else, Councillor? No, I just, just wonder, Mr. Mayor, if we can time it so it, also the community safety uh, plan and well-being to be introduced on the police board at the same time. So let the police board, you know, take a look at what, what's been done and incorporate the two together because funding is going to be required for the community safety plan. I hope, I mean, right now, I know it's not complete yet, but I can't imagine be without the budget and I didn't see any, I'm not sure if I missed something, but is there's a funding aside for the community safety plan? Well, I, I think that this is just the budget direction and guidelines. We don't go into the details on what's in the budget. That's I, I agree, that. Mr. But Mayor, but I think they've heard you loud and clear. And uh, Mr. Kanalakis, if you can pass along those uh, concerns and the timing that Councillor Alshantiri has raised with Tony DeMonte, that'd be appreciated. Yeah, we will do with it, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Great, thank you. Yeah. Councillor Hubley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to clarify something that uh, Council Menard said. Uh, ridership on OC Transport was actually up every single month starting in December 2018, right through uh, till when COVID hit uh, last spring. The yearly increase for 2019 was, as the Treasurer said, it was 4%. But it was every month. It wasn't just a couple of months, uh, or uh, as he suggested, uh, we were trending well with the uh, thanks to the introduction of uh, LRT and other improvements to the system. We were starting to see a, a solid increase in, in uh, ridership that hopefully we will see again once uh, the pandemic is resolved. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good to have those facts. Thank you. Councillor Uloff. I'll just respond, Mayor. My name was mentioned. Sorry. I'll just respond. Uh, it, wasn't an, it wasn't an attack on you. No, I know. I'm not attacked at all. I'm just saying, I was just repeating what the treasurer had said. Uh, but yeah. Well, it, the it, treasurer it, corrected you. Yeah, well, eight, eight years prior to that, Mayor, you had a decline in ridership year after year. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Uloff has the floor. Thank you. Just to correct the Councillor fact. Councillor Uloff, go ahead. Thank you very much. I'll apologize to my uh, to my colleagues and the staff. I'm feeling quite under the weather. I had my second dose of the vaccine yesterday, and I feel you know like our uh, like one of our delegates today. So feeling a little bit rough. So my apologies. Um, uh, I, I just want to thank the treasurer and the city manager. I understand how difficult uh, this this process must be. Um, uh, you know, demand for city services is up uh, and we have, you know, people across the city who have been on uh, income replacement programs like CERB uh, and, uh, you know, people with stagnant uh, retirement income. And so asking people uh, to pay more year after year is always difficult. And I've received some feedback from my constituents uh, that that wouldn't like to see a 3% increase. But at the same time, 
Um, you know, we have uh, an infrastructure deficit of, of 10 years or did at the beginning of this council and have directed 1% on top of the regular 2% to maintain operations uh, toward that deficit. And I was wondering if at this point in time, uh, the city manager or transportation might be able to provide an update on how we're doing on that deficit. We have seen some uh, some improvements to infrastructure over the course of, uh, of the last three years. I've seen some in my ward as well. We have St. George being repaved this year, lots of pathways being redone or paved for the first time. Uh, lots of work obviously on the 174. Um, so I'm wondering if just might be able to understand how that 1% is making a difference uh, and how it will make a difference going forward. Uh, Mr. Mayor, um... We are council is scheduled to receive a because they've changed the uh, the process for our whole um, uh, comprehensive asset management um, assessment. So council will be receiving an update of that, but that'll be in the first quarter of almost likely of 2022. We're just working through that process now with infrastructure services. Um, but the one percent has made a difference, as our treasurer, current treasurer, and previous treasurer has said. Um, it has allowed us to uh, make significant gains in uh, many of our. Uh, asset classes and it has been a difference maker in terms of adding that one percent uh, since council has, has done that we still have a ways to go as you know we're not there yet there's still um, um, a, an assessment being done of all our asset classes and, and you'll get that report in 2022 with uh, some conclusions about that but but i can say with certainty that um, um, i'm certainly very pleased in terms of the ability we've had to um, to um, get at some assets which are in great need of, um, of repair and maintenance thank you i understand that you know from 2001 to 2018 we achieved you know upwards of 361 million dollars in efficiency savings and ended up you know through the process after amalgamation of eliminating 100 and uh, 1,658 FTEs. And in the last five years, we've saved 57.3 million. What ongoing work through this budget, um, through this, this budget period, is the city undergoing to reduce costs as much as possible to ensure uh, that, we, that we don't have to raise taxes beyond what was, what's been promised? Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and thank you for uh, council for raising those numbers because those seem to always be forgotten during budget time, we make an effort every year um, to um, uh, look at where savings can be found. Because I think what, what the public isn't aware of is that built into the um, creation of the budget is the natural pressures that are in any organization before we even start preparing the budget. And um, this year, we're dealing with probably double um, the amount of pressures that we normally de deal with because of COVID and the pressures we're seeing, uh, particularly in uh, social services and other areas in the city, like long-term care, where the, the hourly um, uh, care is increasing by the province. We're not sure if we're gonna get that money. Um, so we're starting, before we even get out of the gate, uh, we're starting at uh, you know 150 plus million dollars in pressures that the senior management team and our management have to find, um, allocate the risk in terms of where the priorities are for services and get us back to within a reasonable amount of, of spend. And I don't think, you know, to the question earlier by one of the councillors, I think it was Council Menard, in terms of, um, in terms of, you know, uh, justifying what three percent is. I mean, at eighteen percent, one hundred eighty million dollar budget pressure is a ten percent tax increase, and I don't think that's something that uh, any councillor here could support. But it, you know, that's certainly a, pers a personal choice in terms of what you want to support. But we, we start off with a great, and we're doing it right now, a great deal of work with our treasurer and our finance staff, um, bringing that, uh, those pressures back into some kind of a controllable fashion and looking at where we can find savings to ensure, like we do every year, that we bring uh, a budget that maintains the services the council expects in the set. Is that a $180 million budget pressure directly attributable to the current situation with, uh, with COVID-19 and the pandemic? Well, it's bigger than what it normally is. We usually are in the range of 80 to $100 million is what we start every year. And um, this year, it's, uh, it's bigger than that, obviously, because of um, other pressures that we're seeing. But, you know, it's our job to go through every one of them, every one of those pressures and look at, you know, how much risk are we going to take on it? Where's the opportunity to save it? How much, how many of them are just, you know, we're not going to accept as, as budget pressures. We're asking departments to find it. From within and that's where all the efficiencies and the work happens for people to get creative in terms of um, in terms of finding that money across the board. 
you know, it's been really heartening to see throughout this pandemic, the way that this bureaucracy has been able to shift to frontline services. You know, we've, we, we do obviously require quite a few staff and administration to ensure that we're able to run these services and programs. But every time that I visit City Hall to pick up mail or to look for something, I'm always finding, you know, parks and recreation staff that are used to running our facilities out there directing people, ensuring that people are getting their vaccines. To see that shift and that ability to go from, you know, normal times and administrative to, to frontline services uh, has, has been really heartening to see and to see the flexibility in the bureaucracy. I think that it's well led. Um, um, so, you know, I realize that our demand uh, for frontline services is up uh, and that we've been able to meet that demand uh, within uh, the amount of FTEs that the, current, that the city currently has. Uh, and, and that's been heartening to see. I appreciate uh, your answers to the questions. And if you wanna you know, make a, you know, a, a, an end comment there, Steve, please go ahead, thanks. Well, yeah, no, thank you for that. Cause we, we actually reallocated upwards of 500 employees to various cities from departments to other city services to deal with the surge that we were facing in terms of demand of services. And we hired over 3000 um, staff, casual staff for public health to assist them in the work, the great work they were doing. And so, and we did that over a couple months. So you're talking about an HR group or human resources group hiring over 3000 people in a couple months um, to be able to assist public health. And we're, you know, we're hoping to get the funding, of course, from the uh, province for that. We made our request and Councillor Eglai has been leading the charge on that. Um, and then when you look at all the other services that have had to go to, to assist our IT, things that you don't normally think of because they're, they're not in the public eye, but, but we had half of our IT department uh, supporting all the work at home, supporting public health, uh, setting up offices and all the people that have come in to do the contact tracing. So there's a, our, our fleet people set up stores for all our personal, uh, our personal protective equipment. We had, uh, had to move dozens of employees in there to deal with millions of dollars of inventory to deal with all the masks and everything our paramedics, firefighters, police and everyone else needed. So everyone everyone um stood up and was engaged in the effort yet still maintaining the core services that that we expect grass cutting snowplow all the rest of it so it was a remarkable effort and we're seeing some of the pressures carry into 2022 as wendy has uh, talked about in her report and our job is to manage that and to bring that, that back to an acceptable taxation level in our view but it's all ultimately to answer the questions that was asked before, ultimately it's council's decision in terms of what tax rate they're going to set when you get to council the budget deliberations. I know you don't require any further uh, encouragement, uh, but please continue these efforts uh, to reduce costs, uh, to find efficiencies. We want Ottawa to remain an affordable place to live and, you know, larger tax increases over time in perpetuity um, kind of go against that. So I appreciate the work that you're doing and the work that our treasurer is doing as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Leeper. Thank you, Mayor. I did have um, uh, one follow-up question. The pandemic, to Councillor Deans's point, has um, uh, demonstrated to us new ways of doing things, and and some of the uh, spending that we've been doing has been extraordinary connected to the pandemic but temporary and uh, i'm also uh, uh, watching the uh, the vaccination clinics moving through the uh, the the oh, number of staff who are involved in that yeah. sorry mayor watson your uh, your mic is oh. on um, some of the some of the extraordinary spending that we've had to do is uh, is temporary, but some of it I, I find is stuff that we should be bringing through into future years. And I, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds of it, but for example, the respite centers that we've opened and some of the services that we've been able to um, offer to vulnerable populations who are living on the streets. Um, does a 3% budget give us the wriggle room we need to continue some of those extraordinary spending measures that should continue moving forward? Um, you know, we're getting into some of the into some of the details of the budget, but it's a fair question. Um, some of the things that we did during the, um, the pandemic, like the respite centers, 
um, are things that we're looking at in terms of continuing um, for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, Donna Gray and her team are actually looking at that and have submitted, um, have submitted uh, their budget requests. Um, that would accommodate some of that, and you'll see that when it comes in the budget. So we're working within that 3% to be able to accommodate um, many things that we did during the pandemic that we think we need to continue doing as we transition out and on an ongoing basis. It's um, probably too deep into the weeds, but I, I assume that we have to find offsets for some of those measures that we've taken. Um, so I guess we will see what that comes out as uh, when we see a draft budget. Uh, Chair, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor McKinney. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to make a few comments about uh, the work that um, the community police officer in this area does, um, because somebody had mentioned that early on that you know we weren't here necessarily to um, make critical comment about you know individual uh, police officers and and the work that they're doing. So if you just indulge me for a second. It does come to a question, of course, but. Um, you know, last week, last week, um, I went out for a, a walk around, walk about in Chinatown uh, with uh, our community police officer. And, you know, we kind of walked with the community and looked at where we could make um, uh, improvements so that there is a, a better perception of, of safety. It was things like, you um, I'm gonna big shout out to to Bryden Denny's and the the road, you know, public works, but it was things like, you know, making sure that we have accelerated garbage pickup, making sure that the street is uh, looking good, economic development, working with the community to, you know, um, maybe do some murals, do painting up of the of the street, it, you know, um, it, making sure benches are where they they should be so that people can sit and people will gather and there there wasn't and while I appreciated uh, being there with the constable uh, not one of the outcomes really was for uh, additional police um, last weekend I wasn't in, in attendance because I'd had my dose and wasn't well but my staff was and there was a cleanup that was organized by the community police officer actually at Dundonald Park same thing they went in picked up talked to residents again none of the none of the outcomes that we needed um, required um, more policing in in the community so I, I just want to I just want to you know two reasons for saying that one is to say that we do have women and, and men who are you know doing their best but we're asking them to do a job that is is not suited to, to policing um, they could be doing other things, uh, but certainly in terms of community safety and what we need in our communities, uh, it really is, you know, things like outreach. We need to animate our parks. We need to find ways of bringing more programming into our parks. We need to make sure we have great uh, garbage pickup and recycling and, and, and all of the things that, you know, more splash pads, you know, in our park so that, so that more people come out and we don't push out the few people who go to these parks uh, for survival. When I go to a park, it's for convenience, it's for my enjoyment, but many people come into our park, especially in the downtown, is for survival. So, you know, today, as I'm listening to the, the, the budget direction, um, you know, I get an email, I, I asked staff if there was any way, we had a, an Indigenous uh, artist who used to uh, display his art for years on Elgin Street. Many of you probably saw him if you walk down Elgin Street near Scrims, Donnell Taylor, and he died recently. And the, in the community, there was an outpouring of grief in the community, and they want a mural. And, and so we worked, my office worked with the local Indigenous community and you know, an artist, and that would cost about $5,000. We got about $1,000 from local businesses. And I was looking for another four, and I was told today that there's actually no money in community funding, so, or in economic development. So I have no funding. I can't get that last $4,000 for a mural that would, again, make the street 
a more pleasant place to be, but it would also uh, communicate to the many people who are homeless and indigenous, and they are grossly overrepresented in our homeless community and our homeless population. The indigenous community is men and women. Um, it, and it would, it would signal to them that, you know, we see you and, and we care. So I guess my, my question is, you know, and, and, and I'll keep a high level. I know we're not in the, in the weeds today, but will $2.6 million, will it, will it give staff any space for responding to what we actually need in our communities to make the city a good place for everyone. And I, and I do mean everyone. I mean, people who are living in the Golden Triangle or you know, around parks, but also the people who need those parks, people who, who are out in places like Chinatown because okay. you know, we have a, a community health center there, uh, you know, providing some small little bits of funding for things like murals to be able to commemorate, uh, you know, an indigenous artist that we just lost. Well, 2.6% this time, because I, I, ha I haven't ever seen that it's, that it's provided us that flexibility in the past. So I just wonder if staff feel that, that it will um, for 2022. Uh, Mr. Mayor. I think one thing that uh, that we have to take into account is that the guideline is not applied equally um, to every department. I mean, when the senior leadership team starts looking at the input from councillors from the meetings with the mayor, my own discussions with councillors that I'm commencing here in another week or so and having individual meetings with councillors, um, when we look at it, we, we do adjust priorities within various budgets in the city departments, which obviously uh, Councillor McKenney knows full well because she was involved in the process for many years. Um, some departments get less while others get more depending on what the need is and what the priorities are that we that we understand. So social services in this case, which is a big pressure driver or will be a big pressure driver um, coming out of COVID heading into 2022, um, will most likely um, uh, be redirected more resources from the, from the available monies that we have to ensure that we can maintain uh, those key services while other departments might not get as much because um, they're just not, um, they don't have that kind of need uh, going into the year. So the allocation is, is adjusted based on what we believe the priorities are and the pressures are that we have. Okay, no, th thank I you. thank Sorry, you for counselor, that. And counselor, then, uh, I will Sorry, do you want to uh, go back on the list? To... Counselor? No, I'm just saying I'm going to look forward okay. to those. Councillor Cavanaugh, uh, please. Councillor Cavanaugh? I'm sorry, Thank your time you. was up, Councillor, by over a minute, and it's Councillor Kavanaugh's turn, in fairness. Councillor Kavanaugh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, when, I, when I look at the budget overall, um, one of my concerns is um, climate change. And um, we just met yesterday with the sponsorship group. Um, I appreciate being on it. I appreciate hearing our goals. The concern that I'm, I'm looking at is, is a transit fare increase. I, I wanna say that I, I, I congratulate uh, Mr. Manconi and his team for running uh, the full circuit of buses during the pandemic, despite the, the, the drop in, uh, in, in the number of riders, they kept it going. And those people are the ones that absolutely needed that service for sure. We're gonna be seeing a growth. It's gonna be a slow growth because we know that um, people are having a difficult time to be around others. It's gonna be very slow. Some people will never uh, have a bus pass again because they're gonna do something hybrid. There's all kinds of things that are going on, but we need to woo them. We need to woo them back. And I'm concerned about the, um, the fair increase that um, sending the wrong message that uh, we want more people to use transit because it'll be very tempting to get back in your car if you're just driving in for a couple of days a week or something like that. I just want to know how that has been taken into consideration. What's the question to? to well, um, it, it really, it really perhaps to the, those involved in the, the transit system who, who yeah, I think the treasurer this. The treasurer can answer that because she, she did answer it in terms of the long range financial plan that we had voted on. So Wendy, if you wanna repeat that answer, please. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, I had mentioned previously, Councillor, when we look at that long range out, so our long range financial plan for 10 years and then our transit affordability plan, which has that long term 30 year lookout, um, we've uh, basically included that incremental uh, transit fare increase, but also that increase in taxes as well to keep transit affordable. Um, so those are the pieces that you see in front of you in terms of the budget directions today. Well, I, I, I appreciate your interpretation of affordable, but I, I think that there'll be people that will find it not as affordable, especially since we've seen a lot of job loss, et cetera, and uh, people will just start to be coming back to transit. Um, how has climate change been uh, uh, incorporated into this budget? Actually, that's a great question. I want to say thank you very much for answering that um, because I was listening to the delegation um, from Angela this morning and um, I know she was referencing that we don't have a dedicated long range financial plan for climate change, but in fact, um, we are addressing and I'm going to say it's very incremental uh, the climate change actions and investments that we need to make through various long range financial plans in the city. So our, our tax um, long range financial plan, as well as our rate long range financial plan, you're seeing those elements flow into that. And then you're also seeing individualized pro um, projects come forward as well. And I think, you know, there's a really good example today in terms of the funding that we were able to secure through FCM with respect to um, the retrofits for homeowners. So those pieces are coming to you. Um, they don't come in, in one place, in one area, um, because of the nature of the work that's done and it affects the different budgets across the city. Um, but they'll, they'll pop up, as I said, in various different areas. Okay, thank you. I, I think I still remain concerned about um, how we're going to increase ridership with that increase. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Does anyone else wish to uh, speak? to the item. Okay, I'll offer a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you to our delegates. We had, uh, I think, uh, 16 or 17 delegates that um, were able to make it. I'd encourage those uh, delegates to engage in the budget process, including as most of them wanted to speak uh, on the police budget, to go to the police uh, committees and the board uh, for input when they table their budget. Uh, thanks to our staff for putting together a very solid document and a roadmap for us uh, as we head through this budget process. I think one of the things that um, sometimes we forget about is how devastating the pandemic has been on individuals and small businesses in our community. Literally, when you walk down any main street in the city, you will see hundreds of for sale, for lease, going out of business signs because of the pandemic. And that translates into literally tens of thousands of our fellow citizens, mostly the working poor at minimum wage jobs, who have lost their job as a result of COVID-19 and their small business shutting down. The big box stores, they've, been done, they've, they've done very well. The big grocery stores, the big uh, drugstore chains, it's those small mom and pop family run businesses. And so when I hear people talk of musing about let's raise taxes above 3%, um, I become very concerned that we are becoming disconnected with the residents that we purport to represent. These individuals have had a very difficult time. You probably all know individuals who have lost a job or lost several shifts or seen a, a small business in your ward that shut down that was doing very well up until the pandemic. And so to simply sit back and say, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not obliged to stick with the 3%. I'm going to go up to four or five, 6%. Uh, I don't think is the right thing to do or the right message to send to individuals who are struggling. And in many cases, those small businesses have put all of their resources, mortgaged their home a second time, and they're at risk of losing their home simply because they haven't been able to pay their property taxes for three years. So I would strongly encourage people to uh, look uh, very closely at ways that you want to spend dollars and new programs and ways that you want to uh, save money so that you can pay for increased programs. Because without doing, with doing one without the other, we just simply raise the tax rate well above the rate of inflation. And you know when, when the story came out and this report was released that indicated that 
uh, we were going to increase taxes as the, the commitment we made uh, three years ago at, to 3%. There were a lot of people upset with 3%. And yet I listened to some of my colleagues today and they seem to have no problem with raising it above and beyond 3%. People want free transit. They want free this, they want free that. Well, I'm sorry, but something has, someone has to pay for it. And uh, we have to be reasonable uh, in dealing with our constituents who have a long list of desires and wishes that they want to spend. But at the end of the day, we have to balance the books. We have to ensure the city remains affordable and that we have to make sure that the services we provide, uh, those taxpayers and citizens who receive them are getting good value for the money. So um, I'm very supportive of the staff recommendations. I also, uh, I think Councillor uh, Cloutier is very wise to bring forward his concern about where that extra money in the police budget is going to go. But I think until we find out where the police budget is going to land, it's premature for us to actually start second guessing the police board because I don't know where they're gonna land. Is it gonna be zero, 1.5, 3%? And if they accept less than 3%, because our motion says up to 3%, we're not forcing a 3% increase in the police board. If they decide they want to do less, uh, spend less, then we will then have to determine where that excess money goes because it comes back to the city uh, for our investment, whether that's uh, reducing taxes more or increasing funding for uh, mental health initiatives. All of those are quite uh, open for debate and discussion. But it really is, I think, premature for us to prejudge, and this is the discussion my office had with the chief, that he would prefer that their budget is tabled first uh, before we start directing uh, staff as to where to put the, the dollars. So uh, we have the referral motion by Councillor Hubley, uh, of the re referral motion of the Cloutier motion by Councillor Hubley. The motion carried. Yeah. Okay. Dissent. Dissent, Dissent Mr. Magon. Okay. The sent as well from Councillor Gower. And on the report uh, as amended. Aaron. Okay. Thank you all very much. Next, um, we have, after going through consent, uh, we have item three the independent reports on LRT stage two lessons learned and LRT uh, stage three procurement. Uh, I have some opening uh, comments and then we'll have a presentation by Will McDonald, our Chief Procurement Officer. So before we get to uh, staff's presentation, I'd like to offer a few words to put things in context. As an independent consulting firm, KPMG conducted this review at arm's length from city staff and the conclusion of the report builds on similar recommendations contained in the Auditor General's report on the stage two procurement. As a reminder, Along with the AG's report, this is now the second review to confirm that our staff acted with professionalism, integrity, and within their delegated authority to protect the city's interests throughout the procurement process from beginning to end. Ce rapport est le deuxième rapport qui confirme... This is the second report. This is the second report saying that our personnel act with integrity. Additionally, KPMG's review went to a step further and assess what is being done around the world. They came to the conclusion that the entire procurement process was in line with the industry best practices worldwide. They said that the whole process practices of the industry. Staff and legal team have been saying all along that the stage two procurement process and staff's actions were aligned in a way to ensure fairness and transparency and to protect the interests of the city and its taxpayers. The report also presents seven minor recommendations that KPMG has identified to strengthen future procurements. And I know that our staff have taken good note of these for stage three LRT. Among these, KPMG report sees an opportunity to fine tune city activities that supported the procurement process, such as enhanced selection and training for technical evaluation evaluators. And while KPMG's recommendations did not suggest changing the core procurement process, they do note that council as a whole requires better training on P3 procurements to help ensure that we have a more comprehensive understanding of the process and the rationale behind recommendations from staff and, and our own final decision. What this independent review did not recommend is more involvement of politicians throughout the process, and I agree. As our city manager has assured us many times before, the stage two procurement process was undertaken in an open and transparent manner with the best interests of taxpayers in mind, 
and was fully consistent with industry best practices, and this report confirms that once again. Finally, as elected officials, we may not like or agree with the framework we, we have to abide by sometimes, but the procurement process we established is there for a reason, to safeguard fairness and to get the best outcome for the city, our residents and taxpayers. I wanna take a moment once again to thank our city manager and his team, and I believe they're owed a credit for their consistent professionalism and integrity in shepherding a challenging file, the largest procurement in our city's history, which has stood up to two years of thorough external review and scrutiny. So Mr. McDonald, you have the floor. And if you'd introduce uh, friends from uh, KPMG, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and members of committee. I'll just wait for the presentation. Mayor and members of committee, the purpose of this report is to present the reports of the independent consultant engaged to undertake the LRT stage two lessons learned exercise and LRT stage three procurement options analysis and project governance best practice review. Next slide, please. For context, the 12 February 2020, the Conseil Municipal- On February 8th, 2020, Council unanimously approved a motion directing the engagement of an independent consultant to undertake a lessons learned exercise on stage two light rail transit project procurement process. City Council unanimously approved the motion directing the engagement of an independent consultant to undertake a lessons learned exercise on stage two light rail transit procurement. On April 8th, the City Council approved the scope of work for the independent consultant, and following a formal procurement process, Council approved the award of contract to KPMG on September 9th, 2020. Le 28 septembre 2020, conformant aux directives de Conseiller Fleury, According to Councillor Fleury's direction on September 28, 2020, staff sent a memo to Councillor advising them on how to engage with KPMG. Advising them of how to engage with KPMG to provide background and context from their perspective. Next slide, please. KPMG assumed two documents based on KPMG submitted two documents based on a statement of work approved by Council. Two documents based on the statement of work approved by Council. Document one assesses the recommendations of the Auditor General against leading practices within an industry, including from other jurisdictions. Document two presents recommended procurement options for LRT stage three and presents best practices for governance of large scale procurements. As an independent consultant, the, CAPE, the content of KPMG's reports were developed at arm's length from City of Ottawa stakeholders and have been provided in their entirety. Next slide, please. With regards to document one, the lessons learned report, KPMG's review included an assessment of the procurement documents, interviews with project stakeholders and industry peers, benchmarking against comparable projects and the leading practices outlined in Justice Bellamy and Associate Chief Justice Morocco's reports. As members are aware, the recommendations of Justice Bellamy have informed municipal procurement practices for the past 15 years. And these recommendations were reaffirmed by Associate Chief Justice Morocco in his November 2020 report of the Collingwood Judicial Inquiry. The report makes seven recommendations building on the recommendations of the Auditor General and aim to optimize the procurement process. The report finds that the stage two procurement process was, to the extent of their review, generally aligned with industry leading practices, and that the areas of improvement identified mostly aim at fine tuning the activities supporting the procurement rather than the procurement itself. Next slide, please. Document two recommends procurement options for stage three and presents best practices for governance of large scale procurements, including the interrelationship between technical experts legal and procurement teams, evaluation committees, executive decision makers, and elected officials. It provides a detailed assessment of the benefits and challenges of six procurement methodologies and recommends three for further consideration, early contractor involvement, design build, and design build finance. The report recommends governance rules for council, the executive steering committee, the project sponsor, project director, and project team. KPMG recommends a number of next steps be completed before a final model is selected, including a detailed quantitative analysis, risk assessments, and market sounding exercises. Next slide, please. The work was undertaken by KPMG infrastructure team. The work was undertaken by KPMG's infrastructure team. 
represented at Trinity today by Zina Bouvez. The team has extensive experience in P3 projects and large infrastructure projects across Canada and Ontario, including direct experience with the Edmonton Valley Line LRT Stage 1 project, the City of Calgary Green Line LRT, and the Via Rail Corridor Fleet Renewal Program and Maintenance Facilities procure, uh, Procurement. Next slide, please. The report includes three recommendations as follows. That the Finance and Economic Development Committee recommend that Council receive KPMG's submission of Document 1, LRT Stage 2 Procurement Lessons Learned, and Document 2, LRT Stage 3 Procurement Options Analysis and Project Governance Best Practices. That the Finance and Economic Development Committee recommend that Council approve the KPMG recommendations outlined in this report and identified in Document 1, LRT Stage 2 Procurement Lessons Learned. And that the Finance and Economic Development Committee recommend that Council direct staff to consider in the development of LRT Stage 3, the procurement methodologies and best practices for governance of large-scale procurements outlined in this report and described in Document 2, LRT Stage 3 Procurement Options Analysis and Project Governance Best Practices. Next slide, please. Subject to Committee and Council's approval of the recommendations in this report, and as directed by Motion 27-6, staff will update the public-private partnerships policy and related policies and procedures to ensure alignment with the recommendations identified by KPMG. Mr. Mayor, that concludes my presentation. Ms. Mubez and I would be pleased to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from Councillor Fleury. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Will, for the presentation. Uh, I do have a question. Like, I, When I go through the KPMG report on page 50, there's a segment specifically on delegation of authority. And, and when, I, when I read through that, I, I think from my perspective, we're missing one component, which is council says, go and do this. Here are the parameters by which you go and, and deliver, uh, you know, in this case, an infrastructure project and, pro and process and approvals. I guess what I'm missing as a member of council is reporting back on that. And I, I think that that's where maybe the, that report is, is not clear to me. It's, it's those recommendations four and five, and it's the reporting back, like almost like memos or IPDs back to council on those various gates, like approval gates that have gone, that have gone through. So, you know, we're, we're quite, um, we're quite in tune with the progress of construction because it's visible and, and individual counselors are implicated within their own wards on those impacts and communities are engaged that way. But as members of council, we're, we're, we're not necessarily in tune with, okay, yeah, we support the investment, but then we're not seeing reporting back of those, some of those uh, decisions uh, along the way. And, you know, I, I, I'm sort of left reading that report with, with, wanting a bit more on on clarity on reporting for uh through the through the release of delegation of authority i'd say uh, certainly mr mayor so the second report uh, from kpmg does address this and so i'll i'll ask miss uh, bubez to speak to this item yes and i mean um thank you for the question um the report the second report really is looking forward to stage three and proposing that some things be done so it's not really related to what was done in stage two. Um, and as you get into construction, then you know you can decide on how you want that reporting to be done. And you know it's both. There's the procurement portion, the pre-procurement portion, and then the construction portion. And so, um, Mr. Fleury, I'm not sure that I get the. Maybe you can re-clarify your question. Yeah, Mike. My, my, I'm not sure that. Uh, yeah, I, it, I'm not sure who's best to answer. I guess my thinking is when council provides delegation of authority, we can analyze the depth of that, right? How far we've gone. But ultimately, there are concerns relating to lack of reporting back on the use of that delegation or use of advancing of these processes back to council members. So in this case, it's LRT, it could, we could take any large project and consider the use, through the, the use of delegated authority, what is reported back into uh, council. And I guess that's where I, I rest, I, I, I remain unsure about um, clarity on, on when we can expect reporting back on those measures. Let me give you a clear example on phase one. So phase one, council gave a delegation of authority we had a contingency amount. It was around $200 million. 
I never saw a report back. I know it's fully used. I, you know, uh, the LRT team did inform me uh, of that, but I don't, we never got enough information of where that was spent. So yeah, I'm, I'm okay with us having that contingency, but I don't know why there's no reporting back of the, these measures, I guess is where I get, I get a little antsy about, about, uh, so maybe I can I can respond partially and then will I will ask you maybe to talk about what's happening right now in this city. Um, so I guess for for stage three, what we are proposing is that that be set in advance in the governance. I think right now there's not a lot of detail about the reporting itself, and this is what we are suggesting is to set that at the outset in the governance. Be clear what will be done. Make sure that council is aware of that and agrees on that in advance and then put it into um, action. And if I can build on that, Mr. Mayor, um, as identified in, in, in the two reports, there, there are really two, uh, two phases, or as, as identified by, by Ms. Bouvez, there's the procurement process and then the contract uh, administration process after the fact. And you use the example of contingency, which, which would speak to a post procurement phase, which is really out of scope for for the reports uh, that are before you today. However, with regards to the procurement process, there is a, a reporting uh, frequency that's recommended in, in the second report and that's spoke to in the first report around how to ensure the council has the information that they're looking for while maintaining the recommendations of Justice Bellamy and Justice Morocco relating to the role of council in procurement. And Mr. Mayor, I also just wanna point out because um, and, and for Council Furry's benefit that for the contingency, I realize you're just, you know, trying to use an example for illustrative purposes, but we did report back quarterly on the contingency um, to Council, um, so that Council was aware of where we were on the contingency, for example. But that doesn't take away from the point that was just made uh, by Ms. Bubez and uh, Mr. McDonald, which is that if you're setting it up in the future, we, we predefine what we report back and when um, and with obviously legal advice and procurement expert advice to make sure that we get it at the right level so that council is getting the information yet not encroaching into the procurement process as per the recommendations of the two commissions. Okay, yeah, I guess back to well, what's the reports in hand, I, I hadn't seen the specifics of uh, reporting back or they weren't clearly what I would call like gates of the use of delegation of authority and outcome of that that use uh, in in the reporting back and I guess uh, Zina you're giving us context re regarding phase three and, and maybe we can take it offline I mean ultimately I think this is a lar very large set of project a lot of public dollars but we can use this scope and apply it to other levels of program and, and procurement and, and reporting back uh, for, for, for members. So I hope that we stay pristine to the goals of this review, but I'll, I'll, whether we use the lessons learned across the organization. Agreed, I think it would apply to any, you know, mega project, large complex projects. Will, it, is, that, is that fair? Just uh, from a city point of view, you, you can use some of those reporting elements and, and de use of delegation of authority and reporting of that uh, into other uh, procurement processes and, and make sure they're implemented? Uh, yes. Okay. okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I appreciate the, the clarity. Great, thank you. Uh, Councillor Deans, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, let me just uh, start by saying, I do not feel I've had enough time with these documents. I mean, this is these procurements are huge, they're costly. And as members of council, I think at the end of the process, we have to have confidence in the process and be able to communicate that to the electors and the taxpayers in the city. And I didn't have confidence in this stage two procurement. Um, I still, don't. Um, I think that there are a lot of lessons that this council needs to learn from that. And I, 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 I've printed both of them. I have skimmed through them. I haven't had a chance to really digest them. So um, maybe some of what's contained in here that I have questions about, uh, it, I, I just haven't seen yet, and I will endeavor to read them before council, but I really would have appreciated more time uh, with these documents because we're all very busy right now with a lot of uh, complex files. Um, one of the issues that I had with stage two procurement was um, 
the decision that was made not to use Infrastructure Ontario. And I'm wondering if this review has talked about the role of Infrastructure Ontario and if we should revert back to that, um, to, to the use of IO. We used uh, Norton Rose Fulbright um, for stage to procurement, which in my estimation was a mistake, especially because of the appearance of a conflict of interest. And um, I, I don't know why, um, I don't think it's in the community interest to, to use a law firm when Infrastructure Ontario is available. So maybe someone could discuss with me um, Infrastructure Ontario's role and if they're, uh, if in stage three of procurement, we're thinking of going back to the I, use of IO. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, the, the scope of work for KPMG uh, was specifically to assess the recommendations of the Auditor General against leading practices in other jurisdictions. It didn't look at the city's decision to administer this procurement itself as opposed to using Infrastructure Ontario. And it doesn't presuppose uh, how stage three would be delivered. It's looking at uh, various procurement methodologies, and those methodologies could be used either by the city of Ottawa or another procuring entity if the decision is made in that, but it's not something that's covered uh, in these reports. Okay, thank you for that answer, Mr. McDonald. Um, maybe I'll just leave it there by, uh, for now and read these documents and ask my other questions at council because I know these are complex. Uh, one of the other things I, I'm concerned about is the role of council in all of this. When back in the, way back of the real first procurement that we did, which was the cancelled, the ill-fated Barhaven to Ottawa U project. Council was involved every step of the way. And I think there was a decision made that we had too much involvement, too much information. In my opinion, the pendulum swung too far in the other direction. So in stage two, we were asked to rubber stamp the biggest procurement in the city's history without any information, just blindly rubber stamp it. And to me, that swung too far. So does the, does KPMG talk about um, the information that council should receive in the oversight performance of their duties? Uh, Mr. Mayor, and I, and I will pass this to Ms. Bubez in just a moment, but the, the reports uh, really build on those recommendations of Justice Bellamy and Justice Morocco, and they speak to a very substantive role for council in the pre-procurement phase of the, of the project, but a limited role during the procurement. And these are elements that are expanded on in the report. And so I'll pass that to Ms. Bupez. Yes, um, so correct. Aligning with the inquiries, both of uh, Justice uh, Morocco and Bellamy, um, it is best practice not to have a council be hands-on during the procurement. Nevertheless, um, what we do recommend is to have um, active uh, engagement by council in the pre-procurement activities. So there is a limited amount of information that council should receive during the procurement just to keep the appearance of um, this being free of, um, you know, of interference. Um, and uh, with respect to the um, pre-procurement activities, though, we do expect council to give the direction. There are also suggestions of where council should be involved in terms of the reporting. So you should be informed, but not involved in day-to-day -day activities. So relative to stage two, they, one of the lessons learned is that there could have been more reporting. Nevertheless, um, the reporting that was done was appropriate with respect to the delegation that was in place. But staying you know, in line with leading practices in terms of council not being hands-on, not being involved in the procurement itself, there still could be um, additional uh, reporting that would be suggested and that would be recommended at different points in time. And the role of council should be clarified um, and there's also a recommendation to have um, some you know, training with respect to the procurement process, with respect to the different models, with respect to what to expect during procurement, just so that you know, the roles, the responsibility are all clarified and council knows that before the procurement is launched. Thank you. I think those are useful recommendations. I'll endeavor to read all of the reports before council may have more questions then. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Deans. Councillor Menard, please. Thank you very much, Chair. 
Uh, thank you for the report. Of course, this uh, this this came as a result of uh, the Watson Menard motion. Maybe we should have more of those, Mayor. Um, I'm glad to see the results, um, and I think there's some important lessons <laughs> important lessons that, that we see here. Um, I think you know when I remember the stage two vote, when I think back to it, I, I think about you know um, feeling really under pressure at that time. And we were still fairly new council, new council that had come in. We were still fairly new, but it felt like we had a lot of pressure to approve the report. And some had commented, you know, publicly um, that it felt like, you know, you had a gun to your head. That there, that how do we, you know, we don't, we don't, we feel we need more information here, but we feel really pressured to to do this because of bid validity period. Um, and so what, what lessons uh, have come out of that feeling from councillors? I know I talked to you, uh, um, you know, when, when you were doing this report about that feeling. Um, I'm just wondering what lessons were learned from that? Yes, the lesson learned is just what I was mentioning earlier. So it's really more continuous reporting, but that reporting being defined in advance prior to the procurement stage, really the governance, establishing that robust governance, whereby council is not involved in day-to-day, -day, is not more involved in those decisions, but gets continuous reporting so that you are aware and you have the information uh, that you need to feel comfortable with the process. And, and in terms of the bid validity period, which is what was used uh, to, to say that we needed to approve this now or, or else, because there was a bid validity period for one of the one of the two um, um, extensions. So, so um, would it not be more prudent to bring something forward uh, that had a bid validity period that would allow us to make a decision or, or ask for more information and come back and say, we're not comfortable and the bid validity period should be adhered to but we don't feel comfortable doing this. Uh, we need more information. Should that not have been part of um, the lessons learned? Um, I mean, the bid validity period is something that is typically defined during the procurement process. I cannot speak about that specifically, but in general, from, from my experience, you know, at different points in time in the market, there's an acceptance for a certain period, you know, either three months, six months, et cetera, and that changes with the market. So I think when you plan for the procurement and the timeline and the authorizations that you need to go through prior to the closing, you need to plan accordingly to have enough time to do everything that you need to do. So um, I think it's just the proper planning to have the authorizations and sufficient time in case if something is wrong, that you have you know, enough time to deal with issues that come up. But I'm, I'm not able to specifically speak about you know, what you had in stage two in that validity period. Yeah, that makes sense to me. We wanna make sure we've got enough time to, uh, to be able to come back if there is more information needed. And in this case, we didn't feel we had that. Um, I think it's important to, to note that obviously it was discovered after the fact um, that prior to the council vote on LRT stage two, um, uh, staff had informed the mayor um, that SNC Lavinla did not meet the technical score, um, but but councillors were told uh, that we couldn't have that information, um, nor not in public, uh, nor nor could we receive it in, in private in camera. Um, I'm just wondering, um, did you have a discussion about that in terms of the lessons learned and and and? how councillors could be better informed with that information in advance of votes uh, so that we're made aware, not after the fact? Yeah, I think, I mean, again, it's aligning with best practices if you set it up in a way of, you know, what are the information that you should be getting and, and where you should be notified of what. I think you need to follow that process. In the case of the stage two LRT, I think that's how it was built. And so the process was followed itself. Going forward, I think, as we mentioned in the recommendations, would be to get a more robust and specific governance in terms of exactly when um, the team would come back to council and exactly what information council will be provided with. Again, typically, the details of things will not be provided to council just in order to avoid appearance of interference or anything like that. But I think in general, I would say just a more robust and well-defined governance pre-procurement that everybody agrees upon and that clarifies the roles and responsibilities. Do you think councils should have known that SNC-Lavalin did not meet the, the technical score 
uh, prior to voting on um, the procurement? Um, based on the delegation of authority that you had, and I think on the legal opinions that you had, um, I can say that things were followed. The process was followed as it should be. Um, I think that's the limit to what I can say, not having audited the process. Okay, and, and, and there's a number of pieces within the report that I wanted to comment on. Um, page eight of the lessons learned document uh, reads that that uh, Transit Next or SNC Lavalin was, was allowed to continue in the pr procurement process, even though it was twice uh, deemed to fail to meet the technical threshold. And it says they were allowed to because um, uh, the proponent, they allow the proponent in question to continue in the completion since one, the scores were close to the threshold. Uh, two, the proponent was selected through a rigorous RFQ process. And three, the proposal was absent of any material deviation. So just to, to clarify on, on one of those points, the justification for this decision was in part that they had qualified under the RFQ and they hadn't changed their submissions substantially and that should be good enough even though they failed to meet the technical minimum. Is that, is that correct? Um, no, I don't think that that's exact. The, these are probably reasons that were provided as to why they were passed. My understanding, it's really, it's the clause that allowed the city to pass them, you know, regardless of the fact that through one of the evaluations, the technical evaluations, they did not get a scoring of 70. Yeah, because I guess in terms of the reasons given, what would be the purpose of having a separate RFQ and RFP process? No, I agree. I think these were reasons that were provided to us. But again, I agree. An RFQ is a completely separate process from an RFP. Okay. So really, it's the fact that you had that clause that the team had the ability, as per the process, as per the RFP document, um, to use that clause and that they actually used it. Okay, thank you for that. Um, section 4.6 of the Lesson Learned document recommends uh, through interviews with the different bid evaluation steering committee members, it became evident that the 70% uh, threshold used was based only on the Infrastructure Ontario template and not based on project-based decision, not based on a project-based decision. Um, that seems like a significant flaw in the stage two RFP was this situation identified at any point during the bid evaluation process? No, I, and I don't think it's something that would be defined during the evaluation itself. This is just from looking back, a comment that we had, because typically what we're saying, and it's part of the one of the recommendations that we have is that, um, you know, when you actually establish the procurement process and you decide on the weighting, whether it's financial, technical, what are your thresholds, you would look project per project, and define what should be the thresholds. And from the interviews, you know, we had learned that it was following really a template of Infrastructure Ontario. And what we were suggesting is that a thorough analysis needs to be done project per project. So for stage three, for example, to assess what is your technical threshold? Uh, how are you going to do the financial versus the technical weighting? Are you going to have a conformance like you had in stage two? Or should you just have a compliance and then have a a financial evaluation and a separate technical evaluations. So the, the, the comment really is to say, for each project, you should really do a thorough analysis to decide how your procurement uh, weighting and thresholds will be set up. But during Mr. evaluation, if it's a 70, it's a 70. That's not where this would be questioned. And, and Mr. Mayor, I think it's important to highlight that this is an, an area of an opportunity for improvement identified through lessons learned. 70% is, the, is the, the standard used by Infrastructure Ontario. It's also the standard used at the City of Ottawa for all of our procurements. And so having that threshold was very consistent with how we administer all of our procurement. But there's an opportunity to take a project-specific lens uh, to the development of all of the weightings and thresholds in the development of the next procurement. And my understanding is that's what's being recommended. Yeah, absolutely. And Will, Will is correct to say that 70% is actually quite common for technical. We see sometimes 60, sometimes 65, but really 70% is the most common a threshold used for technical. I guess the, the question is if it was if it was identified as an infrastructure Ontario template, uh, but not 
a project-based decision. How, and, and it wasn't identified during the bid evaluation process, how can it be used for justification for, for you know, pushing through the preferred lower bid? Well, I don't think the 70 threshold, I, the seventy percent threshold was already stated in your RFP, so it's a decision that was made, and I think that's what the team was considering during the process, right? And as you mentioned, one of the bidders not meeting it through the clause that you had in the RFP, they were pushed through. So I think all that met the process. The only point that we were making in in the in the report was that. Um, from our understanding, the 70% was there because it was typically done by Infrastructure Ontario. And all we are saying is next next projects, just look at this, look at the general weightings and everything, including technical, and ensure that they're aligned with the project objectives. It could lead still to a 70% threshold, or it could lead maybe to something else. So the comment was just to tailor everything really to your project. It's a general comment. Like, I don't think it's it's not related to the evaluation itself. Okay. Um, in the uh, options analysis document, um, you, you write that a, a, a DBF consortium uh, is financially motivated to under design. Um, so I'm just wondering in terms of... Can you refer me to the page. It's in the, it's in the uh, yeah, let me just check the page. It's in the options analysis uh, document. Uh, the, and the sentence is, um, a DBF consortium is financially motivated to under design and reduce construction costs. Um, I believe, let me just, I'll double check on the page for you. But um, uh, I, I guess the, the question is, um, the issue that that is identified there in terms of reducing design work and potential construction costs. It's not mentioned in the benefits and, and challenges uh, chart. Um, and, and it's not reflected in the MCA scoring that was done. And so I just wonder why that um, piece of information um, is not reflected in the scoring and, and uh, considering you know, the deficiencies we've seen with um, stage one um, you know, how, how do we consider uh, evaluating uh, a DBF along with the other, um, you know, top options? Uh, obviously, this scenario sounds eerily familiar for, for our city. So may, maybe just if I can put some context. So you're talking about different, right? We're looking at different models and giving the pros and the cons, right, of the different models. Perfect. So I, I think in, in the context of, a, of the wording of the of the design build, um, under designed in a way that, you know, a DBF does not consider a 20, 30 year right of operation. So obviously um, the bidders were really focused on meeting the, the technical specifications that the, the owner would have provided, but they're not going to think of, you know, what happens in, in 10 years and how do I put a bit more money at the upfront in order to have lower cost and maintaining. And this is typical of, of that model. I mean, that model has many other advantages relevant to other models, but I think here the statement was made in the pros and cons of each model. And that was one of the um, disadvantages of that model relative to a much longer term model. So, yeah. sorry, that being said, if you want to go back to a specific question in the, on that. Well, I, no, I appreciate that response. Um, I, I, it clarifies a bit for me um, how, you were, how you were thinking about it and, and, uh, and uh, in the report that that's, that's what's reflected in the report. Um, I, I guess the, con the concern is, you know, when you go with that model, there is a usually less well-designed system that focuses more on, on cost containment than on quality of design. And yeah. in the way we scored our LRT stage two procurement, uh, the cost, though there was a 500 weighting and a 500 weighting, there was more um, weight, I guess, assigned to the cost aspect than on the technical aspect. Uh, so it, it goes back and speaks to that, um, I guess, conundrum or, or, or trade-off um, and where we are today. And so I just, on that point, 
you know, for stage three, which we want stage three in Ottawa, uh, what, what are you recommending? Um, you know, what model would you say uh, the city should be looking at uh, for a stage three? So as part of our preliminary recommendations, right, we've analyzed different models, but at a high level on a qualitative basis. So just to, at the start, we are saying that you need to do before deciding on a model or even prioritizing, you know, two or three models, you would need to do a lot more um, analysis uh, with respect to quantitative analysis um, of, of value for money, uh, the business case, et cetera, the funding strategy. So all that would need to be done into that analysis. This was a very high level, right, review of various models and a preliminary analysis on a qualitative basis of the uh, preferred models based on the objectives uh, of the city. So in that case, the ones that were highly, most highly scored and therefore recommended um, to be analyzed more thoroughly were the early contractor um, involvement and then the design build or design build finance family. Uh, again, this is based on the fact that one of the project objectives was to use the current you know, maintain, maintainer uh, of the of the LRT and therefore we weren't looking at any long-term projects. So in a, in a design build, for example, I mean, you're not getting that, it's not a maintain, there's no, no, there's no M in that, in that acronym, there's, you're not having that 30 year deal where you're locked in at you know, four to $5 million payments a month type of thing. Um, but in cases of extensions and things like that, right? Like you look at it differently, a new project, a new greenfield project, you will have, you will look at that a lot when you have a, extensions. And if you already have a previous maintainer, right? You may have different considerations to be taken into account. And if you were to decide to do a design build, for example, or design build finance, um, and you worry about that long-term aspect, some of the things that you can do is be more prescriptive or you know, require um, requirements, technical requirements that are of higher quality that already are defined by the city because you know that the bidder is not necessarily motivated to think about this for 20 years down the road. So there are ways, right, to mitigate um, each model and it's part of, you know, many considerations. That's why a really deep assessment uh, needs to be done focused on stage three once you get to that stage. This is still very, very preliminary. But during the pre-procurement activities, you would, you would do a lot of these things to really try to assess the best models, taking into account all the project objectives and the city's objectives. That, that's councillor, councillor, we, we have uh, a number of speakers, most of them, I believe, are from your ward on the Lansdowne issue. So you're the only one that's speaking on this. No one else wants to speak. So uh, I'd encourage you to uh, try to wrap up so we can get to the next item where we have, I think, 15 delegations. Yeah, it's just one last uh, uh, remark here, and then I'll, uh, I'll uh, turn it over, Mayor. Um, I guess uh, the concern that uh, has been espoused at this time is that the value of risk and what we're seeing in our stage one, um, and potentially stage four, well, stage two, uh, is that the value of risk appears to be calculated somewhat arbitrarily when you look at a, a P3 model. Um, and, and in our case, no value was ascribed to well-known P3 risks such as costly legal battles. Uh, we find ourselves in legal battles now. Um, you know, a P3 partner default, there was concern about that at a time where we did not ascribe risks there. Um, change it, changes in the private sector interest rates and the financing portion of that. Um, obviously there's some, there's some discussion of that, but it, it's not fulsomely considered. And uh, of course, the big thing we're experiencing too is a lower quality material and, and product. Um, and that standard that needs to be met. And so th these are pieces that are, are of concern to the city of Ottawa, to our residents who rely on good quality public transit. And uh, in any future procurement, we need to make sure that we're not uh, trading off a quality product um, and funneling funds to a, a private sector partner um, where there's expensive legal costs and uh, other risks that, that aren't actually taken into consideration in, in uh, how to procure the product in the first place. So I appreciate your report. There's a lot in there to dig into. I'm sure there'll be more comments at council. I've enjoyed reading it and I appreciate your time when we, when we did uh, meet and have our discussion. 
Um, so thank you for, uh, for that. And I hope there are a lot of lessons learned going forward because uh, what we've seen so far is Ottawa's locked in for 30 year deals. And uh, we are really suffering at this time uh, based on uh, the deal that was signed in the first place um, on our stage one and now our stage two uh, legally and quality of product. So thanks very much. Okay, thank you. So uh, on the report, carried. 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 Okay. Um, I have um, a uh, meeting with a, a federal minister, so I'm going to ask the vice chair, Councillor Dudas, to take over uh, the uh, next two items. Me. Um, so, Councillor Dudas, you have a, a motion with respect to. Um, Putting this on the agenda, I believe. I give it to you here. Wonderful, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, where is the report titled "Landstone Park Partnership: Path to Sustainability and Next Steps" was not circulated with the agenda. Therefore, be resolved that pursuant to subsection eighty-nine-three of the procedure bylaw theme bylaw number 2021-24, the Finance and Economic Development Committee approved that the rules of procedure be suspended to allow for the consideration of this item. Motion, carried, carried. adopted. Carried. So uh, we have Mr. Mark Gowdy uh, is in attendance to answer any questions and obviously our staff uh, are here with, um, uh, from, uh, from Steve Kanalakis uh, and, and others. And as uh, I believe we're gonna go right to delegation. So we'll ask uh, uh, June Creelman for the first delegation, then I'll hand it over to uh, Vice Chair Dudas. Thank you. So I understand that June is not with us at the moment, but Catherine Callery from Auto Tourism is. Catherine? Carol, do we have Catherine? Sorry, everyone, we're just... Uh, Madam Vice Chair, it appears we may be having trouble promoting uh, the delegation. If uh, the delegation can hear us and has received a product uh, asking whether they would accept being promoted to panelists, uh, please accept it. And it seems that we have her now. Okay, Catherine, you're there? Yes, apologies for that, uh, for that delay. Wonderful. Okay, so Catherine, your time starts in. So uh, good afternoon, everyone, um, members of the committee, Councillor Dudas, um, city staff, public. My name is Catherine Callery. I'm the Vice President of Destination Development at Ottawa Tourism. Um, I'm pleased to share our support today for OSEG's request to continue with the report cited pro, uh, process and to do a deeper dive um, into the feasibility and cost implications of replacing the north side stands and the Civic Center uh, with something modernized for our community and to outline, uh, outline the framework and principles for developing a financial model as well as um, to further engage with the community on this matter. Um, in actual fact, the report, while concerning because of the clear description of a facility that's weakening Ottawa's competitive position vis-a-vis uh, -vis attracting sporting events and cultural events um, is also an exciting one because of the opportunity here. Uh, in particular, Ottawa Tourism sees an opportunity in the following phrase of the report, um, which is that the arena would be replaced with a 5,000 seat multi-purpose event center that is more appropriate for OHL sized game attendance and for mid-sized music and cultural events. This aligns well with our vision for Ottawa as a strong destination for mid-sized business events and for growing into an ever vibrant music city and for punching above its weight in terms of festivals and events in general um, in non-pandemic years for sure um, and continuing to attract a range of sporting and cultural events that validate our sense of community. 
We recognize the challenges that COVID has thrown at any business whose mandate it is to bring large groups of people together. Um, this last 15 months has been a challenge uh, to tourism like no other. So we support the desire of the city and of OSEC to grow attendance at Lansdowne um, once the pandemic is behind us, of course, and we're back to being a vibrant tourism destination to uh, 5 million people per year from what had been in the last normal year count of 4 million. We believe that OSEG is uniquely positioned to make improvements to the public realm and to animation in the area. In 2019, they introduced a new Christmas market at Aberdeen Square, which was a great success and attracted thousands of people um, and supported all kinds of Ottawa area vendors and makers. So think of the many Ottawa musicians and festival operators like city folk, um, artisans and creatives that have been impacted positively by showcasing their crafts and talents through OSEG run events. So it's not just sports and athletes um, who get lifted by OSEG. And uh, we see OSEG continuing in this vein at its earliest opportunity, and you can bet we'll be there as a partner in promotion of these events um, in our key markets. For our part at Ottawa Tourism, we've worked uh, with OSEG to promote events, uh, whether those uh, visitors come for, for the sports teams that OSEG owns and operates or take, um, take in special events and multi-day tournaments. Um, many of these have been strong visitor generating events, including the NHL 100 Classic, the Great Cup, um, Canadian Figure Skating Camp Championships. I've got a whole bunch more. I don't need to list them all. You know them all. Um, and now there's new soccer and rugby and basketball franchises in the mix too. And when the pandemic is in our rear view mirror, all of this activity gets to start up again, building the foundation of um, event, um, built on, on the foundation of event expertise that OSI brings and the relationships that they've built up. And uh, that allows our community to gain from the shared economic benefit um, to Lansdowne and the Glebe, but also to the rest of the city. So the ability for OSEC to continue to be competitive and to host these major events is hugely be beneficial to all of us um, and to the shared community asset that is tourism. Um, businesses in the Glebe um, see important spin-offs from, um, uh, from these major events and from the facility that attracts them. Um, and it's important for our post-pandemic recovery, not just for the Glebe, but for Greater Ottawa as well. Um, OSEG is a big part of the resilience of our community and once we get to the other side of this. For this reason, we're pleased to provide our endorsement of these strong community partners. They have the know-how to make this happen um, and they can engage with the city on the next steps uh, for the redevelopment proposal principles and framework. We're confident in OSEG's ability to provide value in terms of re-energizing re the public realm and the opportunities for public engagement and animation that form uh, part of this report, um, along with their vision uh, for the opportunity that our city, uh, for our city to invest in ourselves in, in infrastructure that will be competitive and winning for years to come, winning bids, events, and positive word of, word of mouth from both locals and visitors alike. And that is all that uh, I have for you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, I don't see any questions for you, but thank you very much for being here today. Uh, next up is Marv Monahan to speak about Blues Fest and Ottawa Festivals. Um, th thanks so much. Uh, for inviting me and uh, also uh, the chance to speak on, on, uh, on the topic today. I, I think um, similar to, to, to Catherine, um, you know, at Blues Fest, uh, for those of you who don't know, I, I'm, I'm a producer of Blues Fest and also City Folk. And we are also um, the local producer on the event coming to Aberdeen Pavilion called Beyond Van Gogh, which um, is uh, starting August 5th and running till I believe September 15th. So I, I want to talk just briefly about the facilities at Lansdowne. And this is really from an arts and cultural standpoint. Um, I, I don't have a lot to say about how it's put together with regards to financing and such, but really talk to you a bit about what it means to the local arts um, and festival scene. Uh, we've been producing City Folk at Lansdowne um, for, I believe, six years now. Um, and we've, we've been successful at Lansdowne, uh, mainly on the Great Lawn. Um, Aberdeen Pavilion has its own set of challenges, and, and these have been, I think, well documented over the years. Um, the, the main challenge with Aberdeen is it's a beautiful building 
but um, it has decayed over time. And I believe there is uh, now uh, finally arrangements to fix the roof that's in bad need of repair, which is going to be done after this Van Gogh exhibit. Um, but it really doesn't go to the lengths that are required in order to really use the facility to its full potential. Um, to give you an example with this Van Gogh exhibit, um, there's no air conditioning in the building. So we're actually installing air conditioning for seven weeks. Um, we're also blacking out all the windows on the building. Um, all of these at a huge expense. There, there's no air conditioning and no adequate heat in the building. So it's very difficult to have any extended run of something like we're talking without some major modifications. And uh, because of the length of the exhibit, we're able to afford to, to actually incur these sorts of costs. This is not something that realistically could be done by most groups within the community. So I would say that, you know, the roof may be fixed, but the roof being fixed is really just going to make sure that water's not dripping on the patrons who are enjoying the concert or the exhibit. I mean, if that's the baseline we're working from, it's not a very high bar. And there needs to be, we believe, um, more uh, infrastructure rejuvenation with Aberdeen um, in order to make it and, and show its full potential. The other comment I'd make is about the arena. And I know that the proposal um, is around replacing the north side stands in the arena. Again, this is a very dated facility. Um, in the concert business, um, if you look at the downtown core, there are really sort of three venues that are competing for concerts right now, traveling concerts in Ottawa. Uh, the Bronson Center, which has been uh, renovated in the last few years, which is actually quite a nice facility now and it's a capacity of about a thousand. Uh, there's the National Arts Centre and the biggest room there is 2000 and then you have TD Arena which is an aged facility and honestly it is by default getting some concerts right now but it is not a particularly good experience for the patrons who go to the concerts there or the people who work there including the artists and the musicians. Um, the dressing room situation, um, just that the whole facility is so dated, outdated that um, it is not attractive to put shows in there. Um, and I think that the idea of a new event center of that particular size around the 5,000 capacity is, is long overdue. And what we have at Lansdowne is an amazing um, site in terms of location but we have major problems with the facility. So um, we're here to endorse the proposal uh, that is being made here in the report from the city, uh, the city staff. I think it's long overdue. Our experience in working with OSEG and the partnership there has been uh, glowing in terms of their ability to facilitate events. Um, the aid they give our event in particular with regards to things like uh, sanitation, cleaning, um, event management, staff, personnel is all top notch. And in fact, um, makes doing events at Lansdowne much easier. But of course, in dealing with the facilities, there are many challenges. So um, I'm here to support the proposal. Um, I think it's long overdue. And if uh, this can be done, you know, in the next few years, it would certainly add a great deal to the potential at Lansdowne. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you very much, Mark. And you're right on the button too for time too. Um, I see you have a, a question from Council McKenney. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Chair, for uh, that. Uh, hi, Mark, it's nice to virtually see you. Um, I think around this time, you're in my neighborhood actually with a, a big event. Yes. And we're a little, little past that now, but uh, right. yes. Um, certainly miss it. Um, just on that, Mark, um, you know, when we look at um, the potential for large scale, whether it's sporting venues, uh, cultural events, concerts, um, how much should we really be considering 
uh, the role that mass transit plays in getting uh, people to those events? Um, uh, I mean, it's a good question, Catherine. I, I think I can talk from just our experience at, at City Folk. Um, the reality is that when we put on these events downtown, a lot of the people going are from um, the core, like the, a lot of people who attend the events. And I can tell you that at Lansdowne, um, most people are not traveling by car. Um, they are traveling either on transit or by other means. And, and many are, are honestly um, walking, biking. Um, you know, if you look at how people are now um, visiting these events, um, at Blues Fest, for instance, we park over a thousand bikes a night, you know, in our bike parking. So there's a real trend towards um, having these things accessible by obviously lands down by, by the canal or, or by um, areas that can, can come by other means. Mm -hmm. So mass transit is important, but it's not the only important point. No, and uh, absolutely. I think the, the bike parking um, that happens at, at Blues Fest, I think is, uh, is uh, such a success, like the, the fact that, you know, a thousand bikes, um, an evening park. But when we're, when we're talking about yeah, getting people. I don't know that. I don't know that I agree that most people come out to hockey games, CFL games, even concerts. All come from within the core. I think a lot do, but I think that they they are pulled from. I hope they're pulled from the entire city. Everybody should be enjoying, um, you know, the the cultural events and the sporting events that the city has to has to offer. So. Um, yeah, it's just something that, uh, you know, I, I am going to continue to raise with staff. I, I hear you. It's not the only consideration. Of course, we want people to be able to walk and cycle. Uh, but uh, I think when we're getting up to, you know, tens of thousands of people, um, I think that we have to just make sure that w w what we're investing our money in, uh, you know, we will get that return on not just investment, but attendance. And, you know, if, we, if what we're looking for is making this city a good, vibrant city, make sure that as many people can get there as, as possible. So, um, but yeah, I do, um, I do appreciate your, your comments about um, the, only, the space. Yeah, the only thing I'll mention, Catherine, is just when you look at, blue, at City Folk, for instance, which on most nights would have about 5,000 people, which is about the size of this event site, um, we work with OC Transpo and there is seldom a night we need to add buses to the facility. I guess that's my point. There is obviously use of transit, but if you're looking at smaller events, I'm not saying smaller events, but of that size, that really is the future of these event spaces. The, the, the notion of having 30,000 people, I mean, is not realistic. I don't believe for Lansdowne. It may be occasionally if there's a concert. But on a regular basis, the sweet spot really is that three to 5,000 capacity event. And I think that's what you really have to consider when you look at the need for, for mass transit or public transit. Okay, I, I appreciate that. Thanks, it's nice to see you. Great, nice to see you too. Great, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Fleury. Thank you, uh, I'm Deputy Mayor. I Good afternoon, Mark. Good to see you, and, and thanks for what you do in our city. It's always uh, it's always exciting. You're always pivoting and announcing new things, and we're uh, we're hopeful that we can get back to some normalcy and, and get back to some of the uh, the events you host. Um, I, I just want to clarify. Um, there's a lot in, in this report relating to the overall uh, park segment. There's the the city owned facilities, specifically horticulture in Aberdeen, and you spoke eloquently, I believe, to the importance of Aberdeen and the importance of, of a fulsome investment there to, to bring it to its potential. I, I, I heard you relating to uh, the limitations of the arena more specifically. And I guess I, I, I want to clarify in, in your, uh, from your perspective, which do you see those three in, in separate ways or because I, I sort of see them in, in different values, right? There's the public space park, which brings some attributes. There's that heritage protection and, and spaces within Aberdeen and horticulture. 
And then there's the, a, a new look, a, a demo basically uh, of the north side, uh, which we always knew Seth and, uh, and, and the arena. So I, I wanted to hear more specifically, do you see that as a package from an event hosting perspective or they have uh, individual attributes that you see uh, as you were describing? I think, you know, not to be over simplistic about it, but the Great Lawn really is an accessible space which can have a variety of uses. So obviously to do something like City Folk, but it could also be um, the, the, the walkathon, the dogathon, the uh, community event, which may be free or yoga in the park. It lends itself to that kind of use because it's not um, exorbitant or that expensive for a community group to operate there because there are not for profit rates. Once you get into a facility indoors, then you're talking about some real costs. And that's where the um, you know, planned concert events, uh, the hosting of out of town events, that's the place for that spot. Um, Aberdeen, I don't know if, if it ever will be a great concert venue because, because of the nature of the building, the, the ceiling height, um, it, it just doesn't sound very good. I mean, we have put in a black box in there for the festival, but again, you can't do that on a one-off concert. So if you're talking about consistently attracting events to the city, I think you need an event center and that 5,000 cap is a sweet spot. So I think these are all complementary. Um, Aberdeen, honestly, when we looked at the Van Gogh exhibit, the only other place really we could put it was the Shaw Center. And we couldn't book the Shaw Center for eight weeks. So it, again, it, there is a spot there and because of the ceiling height and the size, it was the obvious place to go. And it's in so centrally located. So I think it can all be complimentary if we're careful about how they're developed. No, and I, I appreciate what you're saying and, and the importance of the site as a whole and, and the various assets, how they can build on to one another. I think council will have some challenging conversations in the next few months relating to, okay, you have a demo of a north side in, a, in an arena. What's the financial models around that and who's responsible for that? So we have our, our work cut out for us, but uh, we, we understand the importance of the site. And, and uh, I think this report just does set out the, the broader context of, of what's needed here. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Councillor Fleury. Councillor Lieber. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Mark, good to see you. Uh, miss you and uh, looking forward to uh, some great events, hopefully soon. I am just interested, the Civic Centre as a music venue uh, doesn't seem to be all that well used. What sort of, uh, what sort of acts would we not be seeing if we didn't have that arena venue? What, what acts would we be seeing or not be seeing? Would we not be seeing? So if, if, if it weren't for the Civic Center, I'm just wondering what is the, uh, you know, what is the caliber of act that probably would be skipping Ottawa if it weren't for the arena? Um, you know what? I, I can tell you that, you know, planned events upcoming in that facility include, I would say, you know, the, one of the, the sweet spots is sort of the Canadian rock acts, okay, that aren't going to fit at the National Arts Centre and be too big to play the Bronson Centre. So a band like the Arkells, um, the Glorious Sons, Nathaniel Rateliff, um, all of these acts that can sell a few thousand tickets, that's where they go. And, and, I, and I think if I look at what's happening in the next six to eight months, there's probably going to be four to six concerts a month there because there's nowhere else for these folks to go if they're going to stop in Ottawa. That's uh, that's actually really helpful to try to understand, you know, what size that venue actually is because obviously there's uh, a limited number of people who are going to be able to go to the CTC and, and be, you know, at all viable in that venue. Yeah, and I would, I would also say that those concerts were really not happening 10 years ago in the arena. I think they have started happening because of the management of the facility who have been uh, much more conducive. It's a tricky game to play and these deals are not easy to do with Live Nation and other promoters. 
and really the expertise that they've developed there with the personnel and consistency, which is the key, has helped now make that uh, you know more of a viable venue, but it's still not good. Coming down, to, and I assume that the promoters take a look at the quality of the facility when they determine whether or not they're going to be coming in. Absolutely, and I'll tell you that Ottawa is you know far down the list when when they can do an extra show in Toronto or Montreal, um, they're just driving by. Wonderful. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Lieber. And thank you very much, Mark. I don't see any other questions for you. Appreciate thank you. Um, Michelle Tremblay, Invest Ottawa, you're up next. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I appreciate the, the time today. Uh, thank you, Council, for your time and uh, colleagues um, that, that have already commented. I'll try to make my comments incremental. And I'll center them, of course, around the specialty work that we do at Invest Ottawa and Baby Arts. Uh, so obviously, as an economic development agency, we deal with companies pretty much every day uh, in terms of understanding what resonates with them when they're trying to determine uh, where to set up camp uh, or um, when they're trying to defend the mandates that they already have in region or when they're trying to build the business from scratch as domestic entrepreneurs. So we have a we have a pretty good handle on the sorts of things that they look for. We also are gaining a lot more understanding and knowledge from the work that we've been doing these last three years in terms of international talent attraction, in terms of what job seekers are looking. And these, are, these tend to be um, uh, millennial age. Uh, these tend to be uh, next generation, uh, next gen tech skills as well. Uh, that we are looking to attract. Uh, we, we attract roughly 10 different specific skills for our region as part of that work. So we've got a pretty good handle on what they're looking for. Um, and as we look to rebound and recover the whole economy, we, we do have the, the, uh, the blessing that comes with having almost a third of our economy uh, that are in public sector roles or in tech roles already. So we're, we're blessed with that, but we have to think of the broader context of the economy of the city of Ottawa. Um, we have, uh, uh, in addition, we've got the uh, incredible talent production that we have with post-secondaries, but, uh, but uh, our companies are looking for tenured talent as well. So we have to keep our eye on both of those things. So as uh, Canada's fourth uh, most populous uh, region and capital city, uh, we do have uh, amenities in, in our city that truly do punch above the weight of a city of our size. So we actually do have a good running start in that. But I, I really want to make the case today uh, in, in that we, we really do support um, the, the work that uh, staff has brought forward, um, that we cannot um, take our foot off the gas in terms of continuing the expansion and growth of uh, those features in the city that are attractive to some of the key markets that we have. Markets form around the markets I've talked about, and so it makes it extra important. Uh, and I would go further to say that this becomes even more critical when you think about the evolving hybrid work uh, format that we're seeing evolve. So having key roles uh, being very comfortable and satisfied with the cities that they're in matters. It matters in terms of where companies are going to establish uh, their, uh, their uh, foundational um, uh, you know, uh, capability. It matters now more than ever. Uh, so to achieve the full potential as a market economy, it does require the development, grooming, and expansion. Having winning CFL and OHL teams and uh, a capacity uh, for festivals uh, and uh, cultural events really does have an important role uh, in uh, our journey for growth and prosperity for citizens of all walks of life. Everyone benefits from these sorts of long range investments. And so with that, uh, and I, I wanted to keep my comments relatively brief today, we really do support uh, the continued evaluation of what is necessary to make the Lansdowne uh, Park partnership uh, successful. This obviously requires a business case that holds, that requires the, uh, the outreach that we need to do with uh, communities as well as the financial case, and I'm sure the political aspects that go with this. Uh, and so from an Invest Ottawa perspective, the work that we do in looking long range for the um, wealth and prosperity of our city, we certainly do endorse uh, continuing the work uh, in looking at what it's gonna take uh, to make this a, a vibrant part of the city uh, continually. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Mike. I, I don't see any questions for you, but thank you for bringing that perspective. Thank you. Next is uh, Su Ling Ching, representing the Ottawa Board of Trade. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm with the Ottawa Board of Trade. We are the voice of business in Ottawa, and our mission is to create community prosperity through advocacy, collaboration, and economic development. To that end, we support the recommendations regarding sustainability and next steps to, uh, for the Lansdowne Park partnership as presented by our experienced and dedicated city staff. The City of Ottawa and Ottawa Tourism have led an extensive place branding exercise over the last few years that will allow our entire community to contribute to the promotion and growth of Ottawa more fully by building on our strengths and the unique value proposition, the brand Canada in One City. Our opportunity is to deliver on that brand promise by creating best in class amenities and high level programming that invite the world to Ottawa and make it a place of pride for all Canadians as the nation's capital. An updated Lansdowne Park plan is an example of meaningful city building, bringing together sustainability, diversity and economic development. We know that creating a great place to live translates into creating a great place to visit. We need to give community members exciting and evolving reasons to invite and leverage their international networks to come to Ottawa. Tourism is the front door to every other form of economic development. The recovery of this sector, both from a marketing and development perspective post pandemic is a critical component to our rebound strategy. We have a passionate Ottawa-based Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture at the ready to support us. Investing in infrastructure that supports programming people and contemporary spaces will result in achieving our collective eco economic goals and social stability. Investing now will provide a return for the future, both in terms of an economic impact and making Ottawa attractive for new residents, employees, students, investors and visitors. The time to act is now. Thank you for this opportunity to share the position of the Ottawa Board of Trade. Thank you very much, Su Ling. I don't see any questions for you. Thank you for, for being here. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Frank Johnson, president of Ottawa Instrumentation Limited. Dr. Johnson, are you um, on mute? We're having a hard time hearing you, sir. We're still having some difficulty. Why don't, um, Mr. Johnson, if you're able to just hold on, maybe we'll go to the next delegation and I'll have uh, staff here try to, to help you out, okay? Okay, so we'll now go on to uh, Robert Brocklebank. Test one, two. I have my microphone back. Okay, so we'll just, just hold on, sir. I'll just see if Mr. Brocklebank, because I called him up. And then if uh, we have a delay there, we'll go, we'll go back to you. But you're next in line. Don't worry about it. Okay. Staff, do we have uh, Mr. Brocklebank? Okay, great. I see him there. Okay. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Um, before commenting specifically on the motion, I acknowledge that we share objectives that is animating the site and making Lansdowne welcoming to residents and visitors. Years ago, Lansdowne was indeed an asphalt and concrete campus in disrepair. It was a monument to neglect. That history of neglect colors what I read about improvements to the urban park in the documentation before you. 
The priority improvements would be to repair the Aberdeen Pavilion, st its structural elements, roof and shell, plus the addition of air conditioning to the horticulture building. Clearly, these are the responsibility of the city. But the staff report links those improvements to a future proposal on demolition and rebuilding the arena and north side stands. There is talk of potential for synergies and cost savings. It is proposed that staff work in lockstep with study on the partnership areas of the site. There, in my view, there's no justification for linking these two ideas. Demolition of the Civic Center will not facilitate re-roofing the Aberdeen Pavilion. Improvements in the urban park should not be held hostage to dreams for the arena and stadium. This opens the door to delay and is exactly the sort of neglect for which Lansdowne was formerly a prime example. Also of great concern is the language in subsections A and B of clause 2 of the motion before you. Staff are directed to work with OSEG to bring forward detailed plans. And the general manager of PIE, uh, PEED, is to negotiate with OSEG on a proposal. You may wish to call this a partnership, but fundamentally, it is a landlord tenant relationship, a lease. If OSEG is dissatisfied with the existing arrangement, they are at perfect liberty to propose amendments opening the entire relationship to revision. This would allow the city to reject such a proposal, make counter-proposals, accept the proposals, whatever. Delegating the general manager to engage in negotiations with OSEG at this moment is m premature. The city lacks a defined basis from which to negotiate. Is the city content with the deal struck a decade ago? Do you receive adequate rent for the facilities? Should you expect more rent if further improvements are made? The arena roof still leaks, even though the city faithfully paid in response to a fixed price offer which promised to rectify such defects. What does that imply? Football has returned to Ottawa, but does it attract people to Lansdowne on the 355 days of the year when there is no football? Has the city formed a view on the relative importance of the stadium versus the arena? Is the old Civic Center too big, as consultants suggest? If it's too big, how is it also overcrowded? How will the continual shortening of functional life of sports and entertainment facilities noted in the Rossetti report, be taken into account. If renegotiation of the partnership is contemplated, how will the opaque nature of financial matters be addressed? You are not ready to launch negotiations. Your partner or tenant, OSEG, needs to articulate its desires. The city needs to elaborate its position prior to any negotiation. Now here I wish to apologize for my use of the four-letter word, rent. The word has been avoided in all previous polite Lansdowne discussion, please forgive me. In short, proceed with the needed improvements in the urban park. Prepare for eventual discussion with OSEG and take full advantage of their apparent willingness to rethink the arrangements struck nine years ago. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brocklebank. I see we have um, some councillors on board for you. Councillor Menard. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, thanks for being here, Mr. Brocklebank. Um, I just wanted to comment on your, the first portion of uh, your delegation today, which was around separating uh, the uh, public realm improvements uh, with the, the stadium discussion. And uh, I did follow up with staff on that. And I understand that that, that is the intent. Uh, and so I'll, I'll get clarification on that during our, our open session, uh, but certainly I, I know staff um, generally agree with, with that direction. So very much appreciate uh, your, your commentary um, around uh, that aspect. Uh, thank you uh, for being here.
Wonderful. Thank you, Councillor Menard, for that. Was any response needed or you're, that's good for you? You're good? I don't, I don't think so. Nope, I, I figured, I just wanted to double check. I, I always like to hear from, from Bob though. So Bob, if, if you wanna say more on that piece, lovely to hear from you. Uh, my, my only comment was I, I really would uh, ask that you do look at the Rossetti report. There is a paragraph in the Rossetti report which talks about how the demands for sports and entertainment facilities keep changing. And they keep talking in terms of a period of 10 to 12 years of cycles in which changes take place. So don't underestimate the difficulty of the task that you're considering. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Brockling. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Fleury. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor. Uh, I, I just want to build on to uh, my colleague's comments, uh, Mr. Brockelman, and question to you. I, I too view the, the site very different and there's very different approaches to each segment. As the association taking, taking a, a consideration or position relating to future um, ownership of Northside or the arena, as the model of financing or ownership or development rights over the north side been discussed uh, in the community, not for the overall uh, Bre uh, Lansdowne component, but specifically for uh, for the mass events and, and pro sports component? Um, the one comment that I have heard is that there is some concern about the idea of uh, building residential buildings as a means of financing this. Not that people don't want more people living in the community, but rather that um, once you start selling air rights, then you have an obligation to keep the building there in perpetuity. Um, and, and, and since we didn't see examples, um, uh, the, you know, that, uh, document number two, the Libe Engineering Company report supposedly had two uh, examples of how how the redevelopment could take place, and that was not included in the package that was released to the public. So we have no idea what is really proposed. But the idea that the city is somehow, by selling air rights, binding itself in perpetuity to maintain a particular apartment building. Um, is a topic of concern. I, I, I hear you relating to uh, residential um, air rights. I, I, I guess I will rephrase my question a little more specifically. Does the association have a position regarding ownership of the North Side Stand and the arena? I, I, I don't want to formalize my position, but I, I do you know, want to understand does that location, does the north side and the arena need to be owned by the city or could that land and uh, its use be, uh, be be part of an agreement with OSEG or a land transfer of some sort? Like, is there a particular position that the community has in, in relation to the sports, um, sports seating or sports facilities? Uh, first, I, I'm not authorized to speak on behalf of anyone other than me. Okay. Um, I, I've tried to give you some idea of, of things I've heard in the community. I am not aware of any mass movement to sell off the property, although it is something that people might want to consider at some point. Um, um, I, I, I have heard that people do wonder uh, whether the leasing arrangement in which I understand it would cost me more to rent a little room in the community center than it costs uh, for one hour than it costs OSAG to have the whole facility for the whole year in terms of payment to the city. Mm -hmm. I have heard that discussion, but I haven't heard anything about the idea of selling off the property. That is something that was discussed in 2010 and 2012. And uh, I know that uh, some of the councillors who were around at that time probably have rather firm views on that topic. Okay. No, I appreciate you clarifying and I, I'll be looking for to support my colleague and, and understand if the associations do have a, a position on, on this, this sports facility element. Thank you, uh, 
I can chair. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Councillor, and thank you, uh, Robert. I, I thought uh, just being that it had been brought up and knowing that I have to leave shortly, I'm going to uh, bring forward a direction that I'm putting on the table uh, on behalf of Councillor Menard. Um, I also understand that uh, staff have supported and worked very um, integrally on this. So I'm going to read this out just to make sure that councillors have this. And then once again, we can bring this up at the end of the conversation. So that as the business plan and physical plans for the site are developed and brought forward for recommendation, staff will ensure through physical design and or legal agreements that the configuration of any air rights deal will not adversely affect the flexibility of the city to do future modifications to the sporting facilities that may be required over time. And two, that given the issue of increasing public transit to Lansdowne was raised in both councillor sponsors groups and at the sounding board, staff will review all options to improve public transit to the site on major event days and non-event days, in addition to looking at other improvements to active transportation, include that consideration in the report to committee and council. So I just wanted to uh, introduce that, and then we can we can come back to that. Once again, it is a direction, but it, it's pertinent to the, the timing of the, the comments that were just made. So I'm going to uh, continue on with the delegations, and thank you, Councillor Menard, for putting that together and working with staff on that. Uh, I will now be asking Andrew Peck, who is the executive director of the Glebe BIA. You're, uh, you're up, Andrew. It is but me next. Uh, Madam Chair, I think you forget. My question. apologies, Dr. Johnson, you're so patient. Andrew, I'll put you on hold there for a minute. Dr. Johnson, you're up next. I know you have some slides and your uh, sound is working, couple. so. Oh, good, thank you. Thank uh, you for your patience. Even after a year, Zoom is a, a great mystery for most of us. Um, <laughs> uh, and even as a professional engineer, it's still a mystery to me. Uh, one of the things that I do do, however, is run small businesses in the Glebe, in the hospitality sector. And I'm very interested in the, uh, the spin-off from Lansdowne, the influence of the events there um, on the surrounding area. We, we have direct observation of what goes on. Um, so I would like to just provide in the next slide, and I'll quickly expand on them, uh, eight points as you direct the staff to bring forward detailed plans. Um, some of these points I think have been touched on before. The first one is that the, the balance of the use of the stadium versus the civic centre or the arena, um, the stadium, as Robert pointed out, is only used for about 10 or so major events, maybe 20 major events, whereas the arena um, does considerably more than that. I think it's probably nearer to 80 or, or more. Um, so the second point is that one of the big events and the big regular events in the arena is the October 67s. And they have a growing fan base. They're extremely popular. They revitalize or vitalize the whole area when they turn out. Typical turnout, I am told, is between five and 9,000 fans. Uh, so that has to be remembered. Um, and if they're not going to be accommodated in the rethink of Lansdowne Park, then you need to think about an alternative venue for them um, because and this is my third point, trying to fit that kind of growth into a footprint of the existing North Downs is going to demonstrate a bit of, uh, well, the requirement for foresight. And if you don't fit it, it's going to be lack of foresight. And as Robert says, uh, sporting events change uh, enormously in the space of a few years. So you have to be able to be flexible in whatever you do. Um, so my third point is to add that uh, requirement for accommodation um, for the additional fans and for changes in use. Number four is that we have a rather curious agreement to cancel any uh, commercial events in Lansdowne Park, uh, which has been imposed so that the Schenkman Centre out near the airport is used for those. There were a lot of commercial events which brought in uh, a considerable amount of interest and, and uh, put Ottawa on the map. The airport is not a convenient location anymore. Um, I doubt in the number of people here on this uh, conference that uh, there's more than a handful who have actually been to the airport for the last year. Um, so number five uh, is that you ought to consider 
using the Civic Centre and the other business, uh, other buildings as a venue for commercial exhibits. Um, and that will benefit all of Lansdowne Park and will benefit all of the area. There was one curious reference which I found in the report, just to prove as I read down to page 75. And if you look at bullet three, um, it promises porous access to the canal. And I'd love to know from the staff just what that is. And I'd love to hear from the Rideau uh, Canal uh, managers what they think of offering porous access to the canal from Lansdowne Park. But we digress. Let's move on to number six. Um, the potential revenues from that kind of activity, the commercial activities in the park, are probably of the order of two to five million if you account for all the secondary retail revenues. Um, and I think that's important to bear in note and important to uh, try and estimate more accurately because I think number seven, the point should be that the staff should be directed to provide the estimated revenues from adding accommodation to the reconstruction should that proceed. Um, my estimates are looking at uh, the, the actual revenue that the city might get from condominiums or whatever they are put on top of that. Um, it's a fraction, it's probably about a tenth or 0.4 million uh, per year. Um, and there's very little spin-off in terms of retail values from the accommodation. Um, there seems to be a monoculture around the city of condominiums being the answer to everything. And I think that needs to stop and staff should consider alternatives because within a few yards of where I'm sitting right now, uh, we've got evidence of terrible damage to community amenities because of that kind of thinking. It, it makes short term commercial sense to the people that have managed to uh, gain ownership of the uh, properties, but nothing else. And finally, um, there's a growing movement in within architecture not to demolish and reconstruct, but to consider the idea of refurbishing an existing structure. Um, and there's a number of benefits from that, which I think the staff- Dr. Johnson, just, you know, you're, you're, if you could just summarize really quickly because you're, you're out of time, but if I you finished. just want to quickly summarize yeah. it. I, I, yeah, thank you. That was it. There are a number of benefits and I think they should be considered. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much. You, you definitely bring up some good points and maybe some of my colleagues will bring them up to, to um, city staff when it's question period. So Thanks. I see no questions for you. We will move on to Andrew Peck. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. Uh, so first, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, my name is Andrew Peck. I'm the Executive Director of the Glee BIA, and I'm here today to express support for the report, Lansdowne Park Partnership, Path to Sustainability and Next Steps. As we all know, Lansdowne is steeped in a rich history as a valuable asset that's been cherished by citizens of Ottawa for more than a century. It's great lawn, businesses, Aberdeen Pavilion, horticulture building, plaza, TD Place. Lansdowne is a place made for people and community. When combined with the whole of the Glee, a traditional main street, and the beauty and the green space that characterizes the broader neighborhood, our area provides a quintessential national capital experience in the heart of the city, one as unique as the Rideau Canal that surrounds it. Lansdowne Straw also provides tremendous economic benefit to hundreds of local businesses, employers that depend on customers from outside the immediate trade area to survive. In fact, only a few short years after the site reopened, a citywide survey conducted by Enveronics concluded that the Glebe is, quote, the top of mind destination for shopping, dining, and entertainment in Ottawa, on par with downtown, and well ahead of the ne next most commonly mentioned neighborhoods, end quote. And this isn't surprising given that in the seven years since Lansdowne reopened its, in its current form, there have been over a thousand events, big and small, with the site serving more than 20 million visitors of all ages from near and far who have come to have fun, and connect with the community and support or enjoy our businesses and experience a great neighborhood city. For this reason, Lansdowne has been a success for our area. And it's also home to more than 50 businesses and created over 4,000 jobs. Unfortunately, this momentum came to a crashing halt with COVID-19, which resulted in the closure of much of Lansdowne normal operations. We therefore appreciate City Council's approval of the amendments to the partnership agreements to help address COVID-related disruptions. In fact, I'd be remiss if I didn't take a moment to acknowledge just how much we appreciate the commitment and the resilience that everyone has demonstrated since the start of this pandemic. We thank Council and City staff across the board for their service. Our area is extremely fortunate to have a dedicated and loyal customer base. 
And we also have incredibly engaged membership who's worked tirelessly to find new paths forward in an effort to see things through. There are ongoing financial contributions through the BIA, which are reinvested back into the community for things such as programming, promoting the area and enhancing the on street experience for the benefit of everyone cannot be overstated and all contribute to the well being of the local economy. OSEG, in addition to being a valuable partner, is also a committed member, and we thank them for their ongoing support and leadership. Moving forward, the report before us considers options to enhance the sustainability and long term financial viability of Lansdowne's operations. The GLEE BIA was pleased to be a member of the Stakeholder Sounding Board that provided feedback to inform the report, a process that we found objective and constructive, one that focused on further contributing to our quality of life and to establish a sustainable future for the site. Enhancements to make Lansdowne more appealing, marketable, and evolve it as a treasure destination, especially at a time when we're considering every option on our road to recovery. Given the significant economic contribution that Lansdowne makes to the GLEE, the city, and our region, we fully support the analysis and the next steps as outlined in the report. To fully realize the potential of Lansdowne, we appreciate that the site needs to attract at least 5 million visitors per year. In 2019, it attracted 4 million. And to do so, the report rightly focuses on an assessment of aging and critical infrastructure to increase foot traffic. In simple terms, we need to do the things that we need to do to attract people, while at the same time, ensure that we have the capacity to accommodate and support them, to provide something for everyone. Significantly, the Civic Center and the North Side Stands built in 1967 are approaching functional obsolescence, which would make it very difficult to retain and attract guests and events to TD Place over time. In our view, a status quo do nothing approach should be ruled out. We agree with city staff and their recommendation to explore an option that would involve demolishing the existing arena in the North Side Stands and replacing that part of the complex with a more versatile 5,000 seat multi-purpose event center that is more appropriate for games and mid-sized music and cultural events. According to the report, this could also include much needed new housing units, which would create additional foot traffic to support local retailers and economically benefit Lansdowne and the Gleaves as a whole. We also agree with other site improvements discussed in the report. Aberdeen Pavilion, a national historic site, requires repair and maintenance, including a new roof, other site improvements for park spaces, the Great Lawn, the plaza, as well as new activities and features would be most welcome, while at the same time protecting precious green space. In fact, we noted in the report uh, that it identified a need for more social infrastructure for the public spaces and we've been working um, with key partners to help advance this priority including a recent grant application to the federal canada healthy community initiative we support the approval of the framework for improving lansdowne and to make the lansdowne partnership sustainable over the term of the agreements this will enable city staff and key partners to continue with the options analysis process develop a financial model and further engage the community on this matter we believe the principles underpinning this process including cost effectiveness transparency and sustainability Will be integral to this work and we also support the public engagement strategy lansdowne is a city asset we all want to see it reach its full potential and must have a citywide conversation to encourage voices opinions and perspectives after all lansdowne has been a cherished people place that has been an essential part of the quality of life and the economic well-being of the glee one of our country's great neighborhoods and the city of ottawa a world-class capital to conclude given its economic cultural and social importance we support the recommendations of the report which simply commits city staff and key partners to explore options that will ensure the sustainability of Lansdowne well into the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Councillor Harder has a question for you. Hi, Andrew. Thanks for Hi. coming out today. Thanks. Um, and thanks for um, all the work you're doing in um, joining in with many people to uh, to work on this uh, incredibly important um, project in the city of Ottawa. I just was wondering with your uh, board, the GLEAP BIA, have you um, and, and I can see why maybe you don't, you, you know, you wouldn't need to, but just on your own, um, are you, have you done any work yourself, uh, yourselves to identify what this is actually going to mean to the GLEE BIA? Or are you just understanding that it will? I mean, do you have any specifics? Have you done any kind of uh, investigation at all at this point? Or is that something you might look at, you know, to help you with marketing, et cetera, in the future? Well, I mean, I think we've done quite a bit of research to understand the impacts that Lansdowne has had on our area over the years, for sure. Um, you know, obviously, Lansdowne is playground. It promotes social cohesion. It brings us together. It, it, it you know generates footfall. Um, so, in terms of its you know impact on our local economy, um, that's something that we're focused on. Um, I think the report did a really good job of laying out the rationale. Um, at this stage, we're looking at, you know, yes, we agree that new infrastructure needs to be considered and explored. Um, we're looking at the fact that um, we think that the framework needs to be adopted. And we also think that a public engagement exercise um, is going to be helpful. But I, I, I think this is about continuing the conversation. 
and I think mm -hmm. that a lot of the other details need to be worked out. And you're right, there needs to be a larger, and that's part of the larger conversation, part of the public engagement piece for sure. But this is to me about, you know, you know, moving to the next step. With, co with confidence, I sense in your voice. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming out today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Harder. Thank you very much, Andrew, for being here. Uh, next up is Sheila Vasselnack. Do we have Sheila? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Sheila. You have five minutes. Okay. Thank you. I'm speaking from someone who lives in the Glebe. And thank you for extending the uh, invitation to speak. I'd like to start by reading the opening from Chapter 8 of Jane Jacobs' book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, The Need for Mixed Primary Uses. I've chosen this quote as although Jane wrote this book in 1961, her observations on development in cities is still relevant today. The districts, and indeed as many of its internal parts as possible, must serve more than one primary function, preferably more than two. These must ensure the presence of people who go outdoors on different schedules and are on the place for different purposes, but who are able to use many facilities in common. What Jane states is at the very crux of why Lansdowne is floundering. Although consultations occurred, overarchingly the vision was planned for how the planners wanted Lansdowne to be used, rather than how it is used. This is an important point. Without truly engaging and listening to the community and neighborhood and those who reside outside of it, we have what we have now. During the day, it is a ghost town. During the night, it is party central. Coffee shops open and close. People do not have a purpose. There is a lack of outdoor seating and trees. If a coffee shop survives, people will purchase the coffee and leave because aside from sitting in the shop, what is there to do? What is there to see? Lansdowne is mostly comprised of 26 businesses, including restaurants, hair salons, a couple of corporate businesses, two schools, two banks, a gym, LCBO, movie theater, high-end supermarket, high-end sporting store, and a high-end car dealership. Most of these amenities are geared toward those attending games, concert festivals, and tourist attractions. There are other uses, such as 613 Flea and the farmer's market, but the primary use is stated above. Important to note, the uses of the events occur primarily in the evening. This takes me back to my opening quote. If Lansdowne does not engage multiple users of the same entities at multiple times, it will continue to lose money. The design itself does not engage lingering or enjoyment. The storefronts are not engaging on a cookie cutter, making it discern, difficult to discern one from the other. The buildings are tall and bland and lack character. Lansdowne reads like an outlet mall and is a land desert. Lansdowne has been built for cars, not people, has been made shiny for the tourists, and although located in the Glebe does not engage the community. The unwanted side effect of the cars is the onslaught, onslaught of high-end cars cruising the strip, aka Bank Street. Bank Street is always busy, even at 2 a.m. Cars should not drive into and through Lansdowne. It should be enter, park, walk. Bike parking, approximately 115 spots. This does not include bike parking in the areas next to the horticultural buildings, splash pads, basketball courts, and non-amenity area. Numerous bike parking spots are located right next to patio tables at restaurants, thus rendering them unusable. Car parking, plenty, in front of restaurants and the garage. Bike paths, none. Car paths, well-defined. Mobility infrastructure, limited. In keeping with the premises of the Glebe, where small businesses reign, small businesses are not the focus at Lansdowne, rather big box stores and restaurants. This engages tourists and patrons, but does not engage the community. Suggestions, because this ties into the overarching port, we seem to be just thinking about the games and concerts. Games and concerts, stop using Bank Street as a throwaway. There must be a push for shuttle buses. When purchasing a ticket, there's two options. A, shuttle bus. B, parking tickets must be purchased at the same time as the game concert ticket, and a premium is charged for this benefit. Influx of cars for non-games and events really have people bike, walk, shuttle buses. We could build affordable housing in the unused space. We're talking about condos. Let's put in affordable housing. Questions. Have metrics been taken to track the true usage of Lansdowne at different times of the day? Community, Ottawa residents, tourists, average age, preference of style of shops, etc. What could be changed, added, tweaked? 
metrics to track the impact of Lansdowne, the true impact of Lansdowne on the Glebe small businesses. Is the goal to make Lansdowne successful? The Glebe community and the small businesses must be engaged. As it stands now, Lansdowne resides in the Glebe and for the most part is thought of as a separate entity. And I have to add, listening to this conversation today, um, it really brings home this last point. It really just seems like Lansdowne is thought of this entity, but it is in a neighborhood. And I will say, as someone who resides in the neighborhood, I feel disengaged. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Sheila. I see we have a question from uh, Councillor El Shantiri. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Sheila, for your presentation. But Sheila, some of the, the remark you made was already been practiced in the past. When we have a major event, you know, parking was offered in many different locations and ticket was issued for free shuttle to, to the site. You recall that, I'm sure, when we had the Super Bowl or other large event. Is that correct? Um, Councillor, yes, I do. I do. Um... I do recall this, but as someone who lives in the community, I see what happens. And overwhelmingly, the side streets are jam packed. I live down at Third and Bronson. I have also lived at Woodlawn, which is really close to the um, to the Lansdowne Park. Um, I have friends that live on Patterson. The whole entire Glebe is affected. Like, I I, I just am not understanding. Shuttle buses would just be welcome, more of them. And, and really have an open conversation about how this is beneficial, make it really user-friendly for people coming in. It just, I think the more you engage people and sort of excite them about it, the first time it's not gonna be fun. It's gonna be unknown. They're not gonna know what to do. It's gonna be you know a little bit of trial and error, but the more they use it and see the benefit and also you get out of there faster too, because you know you all get on a bus and then you leave. I agree with you for someone who attend those large events on site, I agree with you, it's easy to leave by shuttle bus or walk in out of the neighborhood than any other. But I, I'm just wondering though, Sheila, you keep making reference, uh, this facility is in the Glee, but really is not just for the Glee. It is a city-wide facility. It's no different than the Canadian Fire Center where I reside. And, and I can tell you, it's not just for the resident of Carp or Stitzville mm -hmm. or Canada. It's, it's a city-wide. We get 26, 27,000 people attending those events. And surely to God, it's, it's not just uh, for the local neighborhood. But uh, I'm glad you, you know you bring some of those uh, points. But I just want you to know they were done before, obviously prior to COVID-19, and they were very well, especially the shuttle bus from City Hall or Carlton University or other area. And I hope we continue working together to make improvements to that side. But thank you for your uh, for your insight. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Alshantiri. And I see Councillor Menard has a question as well. Go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, and thanks for being here, Sheila. I think uh, a number of the points uh, you're making, staff are also understanding around the smaller retail need there. And I, I know uh, OSEG starting to look at the smaller retail uh, opportunities uh, instead of just the larger uh, big box stores. Um, and I guess a couple other points around transit, sorry. <laughs> I think, uh, Chair, maybe I'll wait. I'll just go off mute here. Oh. It's, it's actually not that bad, Councillor Menard. It's faint in the background, whatever it is. <laughs> and I'll keep going. Um, so uh, just in terms of tra transit and options there, I, there was a direction that was given uh, prior to uh, Councillor Dudas leaving that we had uh, worked with staff around uh, transit that we need to look at other op opportunities here to increase uh, modal share. That includes uh, the canal and uh, boating access and, and walking and biking. I think cars through the site, you're absolutely right. Uh, I, I received a message from Councillor uh, Suds' staff today around some of the, the, the uh, very loud uh, cars going through in the evening uh, that, that really there, there is no need for. There, there are parking garages on either side. And um, we should be allowing for more of a winter concept there within the site. There's not many surface parking spots. They're mostly underground. 
And so I think staff are also going to be looking into that with an active transportation strategy. So a number of the points you're raising here, uh, absolutely uh, understandable. And uh, and I think they're, the reason this one of the reports coming forward now is to, to seek that type of improvement, uh, particularly on the public realm. So just great delegation. I appreciate your, uh, your comments. Thank you very much, Councillor Menard, and not seeing any other questions. So thank you very much, Sheila, for joining us. Yeah. And I believe we have one last delegation, and that's Michael Wilson. If we can uh, get Michael set up. Terrific. Oh, can you hear me okay? We can. You have five minutes, Michael. Thanks. And I have a flaky internet, so I have my cell phone as, as backup. Uh, I don't want to rain on the parade, but I have a, rather a bit more grumpy comments focusing on the uh, uh, arena and uh, north side stands. A decade ago, when the Lansdowne Park redevelopment began, residents and taxpayers were reassured that all the due diligence had been done and it would be a fair deal for all. The city's auditor presented his reassuring review of the financials, including that all the relevant contingencies had been carefully assessed. As a PhD economist and a longtime policy analyst, uh, his presentation was seriously underwhelming. It was easy for me to show at the time to city council that an important range of contingencies had been overlooked. Uh, in my mind, the largest issues raised in today's report concern the proposed demolition and reconstruction of the um, uh, north side stands and the arena. Back and uh, a decade ago, a complex financing scheme was established at the outset for the redevelopment called the Waterfall. And working out, out this complex scheme with city staff, OSEG had presumably undertaken its own due diligence. One of the early stages of the Waterfall was an annual provision for OSEG for repairs and maintenance, which today's report states are still projected to be sufficient under option one, which is to retain the status quo. The later stage of this waterfall provides an 8% return on OSEG's investment. There were also some complex tax avoidance provisions for other investors via limited partnerships. Of course, the impacts of the pandemic could not have been anticipated, and this is best treated as separate. But overall, it's questionable whether the city and Ottawa taxpayers will ever receive any return on the several hundred million dollars we have invested. Still, the report recommends an option where some unknown amount, likely in the multi tens of millions of dollars, be invested because the North Side stands and arena. It's not that they don't work, but they are, quote, functionally obsolete. Why didn't the original plan a decade ago clearly state that the North Side stands and arena would need to be completely torn down and replaced within a decade? That was a 30 or 40 year agreement. It is often argued that one of the advantages of private sector development is that they do a better job of managing risk and they face the very tough reality of market discipline. When they make mistakes, they either go bankrupt or have to undergo major reorganization. But to the extent this is true, it's only in a pure market situation. For Lansdowne and OSIG, it looks very much like the private sector here is trying to shift risks and remediation of revenue shortfalls it did not anticipate to the city and uh, us, we taxpayers. What, if any, are the real financial penalties OSIG and its investors are facing and have faced as a result of any revenue shortfalls um, from those projected when the Lansdowne development was started a decade ago? If the recommended redevelopment were to go ahead, how much would the increased financial burdens be on the city and its taxpayers? These are not rhetorical questions. When can the city present transparent data on these topics, which are not covered in the document, the report that we have today? Indeed, is the implicit vision for Lansdowne in need of a more basic uh, rethink? Uh, I would submit that it is. Uh, let me note just one other issue, which others have already spoken to, and I was really glad to hear, which is why link the proposed uh, demolition and reconstruction with renewal of the Aberdeen Pavilion and horticultural building. Glad to hear that these are no longer linked, and it would seem to me, among other things, from the point of view of procurement, by separating these projects, it becomes easier for smaller contractors to be successful bidders on the work and shouldn't the city be trying to structure its work in ways that give smaller businesses a better chance. So finally, in conclusion, let me urge council before making any commitments to the abolition and rebuilding of the north side stands and arena to provide a transparent full description of the financial history of the past decade of Lansdowne 
free development. I think it's George Santayana who's uh, ascribed the adage, um, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Uh, those are remarks and thank you very much for the opportunity to provide them to you and members of council. Terrific, thank you very much, Michael. I'm not seeing any questions, so thank you for joining us today. And I believe that is all of our delegations. Uh, so we'll now move to any questions of staff uh, on the reports. And I see Councillor Deans, if you'd like to go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And yeah, I do have some questions. I, I wanted to start by thanking the members of the public who came out and spoke today. I think they raised an awful lot of good points. And Lansdowne Park is a very complex place with a complex history. Um, and I think as we move forward, we have to um, be really certain about the decisions we make. And I find the report in front of us today uh, not fulsome enough to give me confidence on the recommendations. In fact, really it boils down to three um, options, the status quo, refurbishing or rebuilding the Civic Center on the North Side Stands as in those areas. And, and I agree, the, the issues around horticulture and Aberdeen are separate and um, should be kept separate from, from this portion. I mean, my problem is there's, there's too much missing information, in my opinion, in this document. First off, there's very little discussion about the future of the CFL. And to me, we don't need north side stands if we don't have the CFL. So um, before we decide to embark on building a new 30,000 plus facility, what is the, pro one, there, I, we only have a few years left to run on the agreement that was made with OSEG when OSEG said they would guarantee for what was originally eight years that they would maintain a CFL football team. Well, that's coming to an end. And after the pandemic, I think the whole future of CFL football is probably in question. So uh, I would maybe like to hear from staff on what level of knowledge do we have about the future of CFL in the city of Ottawa? So Madam, so Madam Chair, I, first of all, the CFL has announced plans to resume play this season. Those are public plans and they will be modified with respect to the pandemic and the CFL is making active plans to resume to normal operations as soon as practical in every province, uh, which all have different uh, sets of rules. Uh, secondly, the CFL is not the only professional sports franchise that uses a stadium. We have soccer for, that has been uh, in Ottawa, and we're also looking at rugby, and OSEG has been doing a lot of work to bring additional teams to Ottawa, and we're bringing additional teams. We're bringing women's professional sports that we've not had before and other sorts of facilities, so we should not view this solely with the lens of the CFL. Uh, it is it, This site has been Ottawa's fairground for almost 175 years and it is a logical place to continue to invest in large uh, events for the city and um, again the CFL is only one aspect of it. So Mr. Willis in your opinion if the CFL uh, is not successful going forward in the in the future years if it folds um, the there is still a need in our city for a large sports venue like uh, the, the north side stands. First of all, if I can add to my prior comment, uh, in the recent extension of the, of the agreement with OSEG, they also extended their commitment on the Ottawa 67s and the CFL franchise in the site. They, they did that extension as well. Um, in for, how, professional, how for, go ahead. for how long, Mr. Rose? I will check that and get back to you. I just, uh, just understand it's been extended. Uh, the the other part on professional sports is we we have we have an arena in the west end of the city for NHL hockey. We have a baseball stadium for AAA baseball in the city. But this type of facility, which is actually one of the more multi-purpose professional sports facilities, will allow us to hold major events. We had an outdoor NHL classic on site. We've also, as I said, had rugby, soccer, and other sports, not to mention the fact that the field space has been used for cultural facilities as well. So this is actually the most multi-purpose space we have in the city. 
And that's the value it plays in the broader economic development, cultural uh, landscape of the city. And it's very consistent with our sports strategy for the city to continue to invest in this space. Okay, th thank you for that. I guess my other question is if the, for the future of the city of Ottawa, we need this size of space for um, events and sporting events primarily, um, does it make sense that it be at Lansdowne Park? I mean, I really think we have to, as a council, wrestle with this question because we do not have good mass transit to this site. And I remember many, many, many years ago when we were first looking at uh, Lansdowne Park, my um, seatmate at council was Councillor Michelle Belmar. And he uh, argued at the time that uh, we should be looking at Le Breton Flats for the future of this kind of stadium because it was going to be on mass transit. And at the time I sort of couldn't even imagine, um, you know, moving it. But now that we see the LRT line there and we see the crowding at that site, I wonder if council shouldn't take a step back and consider what that site logically should accommodate. And maybe it is the the um, arena or the 5,000 square foot venue. And we heard from Mark Monaghan and others that that venue at Lansdowne Park makes a lot of sense. And maybe public transit can accommodate um, that kind of a venue. But if we're going to have taxpayers investing in a huge 30,000 capacity site for future um, sporting events, isn't this the opportunity or the time to consider if Lansdowne is still the right place for that size of an event space? So Madam Chair, I mean, we have to look at the history and legacy of Lansdowne, and how much history this truly has. 175 years as a central amenity for the entire city of Ottawa and the legacy of professional sports. We won Stanley Cups on that site. Uh, we actually won Stanley Cups in Ottawa, and it happened on that site. We've won Grey Cups very recently on that site. We have new sports on this site that have not been in Ottawa before. We have women's sports, professional sports we've never had before. The site is well situated to work with the major universities and the community groups. So I think we have to look at the deep history of the site. And, and I think Councillor Menard's direction is to, that uh, was moved by the Deputy Mayor uh, Dudas is asking us to look at enhancing public transit to the site to, to address this issue that comes up frequently about accessibility. But uh, council has decided on numerous occasions that this is a multi-use site. It's sports culture, uh, it's how people lives on, live on the site now. That is what council has made a decision repeatedly on. And we're acting under the direction from council in December to look at this continued sustainability of the site. Yeah, and I understand the nostalgia of Lansdowne and I understand the importance of the history of that site. I'm just trying to think forward, not backward, about what the next 50 years is going to look like. And if we're going to invest large amounts of tax dollars, is it everything still appropriate on that site? And I, I'm not saying nothing, like maybe the 5,000 square foot venue goes there, but does the larger venue go there? And isn't this the time to think about the future and it, what makes sense on the site before we give that kind of direction. That, that, that's all I'm saying. I guess the other question that, I, that comes to mind is, is it really the taxpayers that should be paying for a large um, uh, sporting facility? I, I, I know when we talk about uh, reciting the, um, uh, the Sens Arena, we, we never give much thought to the taxpayers paying for a new arena. That would be Mr. Melnick and his organization that would have to, to fund that. And I, I wonder if the same principle shouldn't hold true for other sporting, um, uh, large scale sporting venues in the city of Ottawa and what the rationale is for um, the taxpayers uh, to be making large contracts contributions to constructions of new large-scale sporting facilities. 
So Madam Chair, first of all, to answer a question I couldn't answer five minutes ago, which is the extension to the sports commitment on the site is 10 years. That has been extended with the, the re recent agreement change. Uh, in terms of the, there's a big difference between the, the Senator's facility and this, in that this facility is a city asset. We own it. It's our facility. Notwithstanding the fact that we've leased it out to OSAG to, and, and that lease has allowed the city to defray considerable operating costs every single year. And Ms. Jasmine can assist me on giving those numbers if you wish. Um, at the end of the day, it's a city asset. And, and do you, you know, do we want to reinvest in this in order to have this mix of cultural and sporting uses on the site or, or not? Council has directed us in December to continue to focus on making this site sustainable. Council has not given us a direction to re-examine its role. Uh, we, we do, uh, we are acting, uh, as I said, under the instructions to ensure we try to bring it sustainable. We need to get it from 4 million to 5 million on the site in order for that to happen. Okay, and my final question is, I know we have a very complex relationship with OSEG and uh, uh, that has not really gone terribly well from a taxpayer perspective in terms of return on investment for the $212 million that we've invested. But I, I'm wondering if necessarily um, we need to continue to sole source with OSEG any redevelopment of this site? Why couldn't we go to a larger scale procurement and see what other uh, potential there is in an open market? So let's just try to, excuse me, Madam Chair. This isn't a procurement because of the, the air rights would be a real estate transaction. So it's not a procurement as it relates to a construction project. And we have said in the report that the construction of the new event center and the uh, stadium component would be done through the city's, consistent with the city's procurement process and an open tender. The issue as it comes to, if we, if council accepts this report and says use air rights to defer the cost, so to avoid a cost to the taxpayer, the problem is, is that OSA currently holds the rights to that space with the lease we already have. So we have a partner with, with existing rights on the use of the space and very analogous to, uh, you know, if we tried to bring in a third party, they would have to deal with the city and OSEG and the, and the complex three-dimensional relationships of an air rights arrangement. We might not find that there's any other bidders. So one of the things that we have, we are continuing to seek legal advice and we have, and that's part of this proposal is for us to get funds to for legal support as to how to manage to ensure that we're getting value for the taxpayers for the air rights transaction. And in a good analogy is when we had did the, uh, uh, arrangement to sell the the what's our current main library site to the building owner who had rights in a part of the facility there was no one else to sell to because of the configuration of that facility we did have a rigorous process to ensure we got value for the taxpayers and that's the precedent we will use and again part of the financing we've asked for is to get the legal support to and the real estate transaction uh, advice to ensure we're getting fair value for the taxpayer Thank you. Those are all my questions. Chair, Thank I also you. wanted to, I just wanted to get one point in because I I just can't leave it unaddressed, the notion that the city taxpayers haven't got any return for, for the investment. I do want to remind council, and we discussed this at length, that the report that we brought uh, last November, that OSEG has basically covered the total cost of any losses for the last 10 years not at the lands down site. And they put over $137 million more than they were required to put into that site. We were losing money every year, if you remember, before it was redeveloped. So from the perspective of a taxpayer, we've insulated ourselves from any losses or any other investments that have to be made into that site. It was all covered by the private sector. Thank you very much. And thank you, Councillor Deans, for those questions. And I'll go to Councillor Elshantiri next. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Mr. Willis and team for your uh, for the work you have done on this one. Obviously, we heard from uh, many presenters today and it seems the, uh, uh, the goal is somewhat positive. Uh, Steve, we, we heard time and time again about uh, obviously uh, transit or uh, transportation to the site. And I, I was, I've been around for quite some time when we have one of the largest events in the city 
and we were in and out within 10, 15 minutes from that side because it was very well organized. Is, is there a, and I know with COVID things has changed now and, and everything's gonna take some time to come back to it. The, the future plan and when it comes to transit and transportation, and can, can you just tell us a little bit more because you heard the, one of the presenters talk about this. So we've had extensive discussions uh, with some of the local stakeholders in the sounding board. Uh, board councilor and I have had further conversations about what some of the people in the community are saying. And there are two transportation issues on the site. One is the issue about major events coming in and out and how that works and how we can enhance that. And the other is the day-to-day -day operations of the site and how they can be safer for the for people coming in different transportation modes. So what we are proposing as part of the next phase is working with OSEG to bring in a leading expert on act active transportation to look at that issue and how the site can be fine-tuned and we could reduce some of the conflicts that, that do exist in the way the site was originally designed. We still have to address businesses that need deliveries, but there's certainly some improvements and it could be about where by, uh, cycling is encouraged to go and signed to go, where trucks are, are signed to go, when they come onto the site, re relocating, one of the previous presenters talked about relocating where the bike parking is. There are lots of things we can do to improve it and we're convinced. We also are looking at how transit uh, can support different sizes of events, because right now we focus on the very large events, but we don't have a strategy for middle-sized events. And some of the events that uh, Mark Monahan talked about, we don't have the same level of support. So one of the things we're gonna look at in the next phase is what could be done on the middle size events as well. So all of these different transportation issues are things we can work on and we can and uh, try to bring council some recommendations at the next report. Do, do you agree with the comments about Ottawa is losing business to uh, for those mid-size, like 5,000 or so people event to other close by municipality? Do, do, do you see that happening? Like, because we're far enough almost from Toronto or Montreal. Or, are we, is there a potential to lose some of that business? Well, I, you know, Mark is one of the leading experts in the city, and I would never challenge his experience with this, but I think Councillor Lieber speaking next, he worked on the music strategy, and in the music strategy, we saw Ottawa was missing a lot of mid-sized events. I mean, some events were going to Kingston and not coming to Ottawa, and a lot of it has to do with the, the comfort to go into the facilities we have, and, and, and certainly when we've talked to OSEG, we know that we're they've been chasing certain uh, cultural f uh, events that have just bypassed Ottawa. So I think, I think the evidence is there, it's happening. And if we had a better facility, uh, we would be more likely to attract more people, more days of the year. Okay, well, I just wanna say job well done, you and your staff and keeping us posted, especially from a sponsor, uh, the group, uh, we enjoy working with you folks and uh, thank you for keeping us up to date. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Elshantiri. And next is Councillor Lieber. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so I just wanna make sure I understand the, the process moving forward from here uh, and where council is going to uh, be able to give approval or not to what staff are negotiating. I see a lot of discussion of delegation of authority to negotiate agreements, negotiate an MOU. Um, at what point, does this come back to council for its uh, final approval or does it? So Madam Chair, the council gets two ch more chances and ultimately the, the arrangement is approved by council. The delegation of authority to staff is to go and find a business plan that works and bring it back to council for approval. Staff do not have the authority to sign an agreement. We have to come back to council for that. So in the next, uh, the, when the business plan comes back to you in next year, uh, council will have the chance to say yes or no at that stage. And if council says yes, then the formal legal agreements are all drawn up and then those are also ratified by council as well. Perfect, that's what I need to know. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you very much, Councillor Leeper. And I believe Councillor Menard had his hand up. Go ahead. Thanks very much, uh, Chair. And thank you for the report and to the delegation that, um, that spoke today. Um, the, the first thing I just wanted to raise, it's just a very it's kind of small process item, but, but an important one. And, and it's, it's um, as uh, the local counselor, normally reports will get, will get circulated in advance to the local counselor. 
and there's able to be comments inserted. And in this case, a lot of the comments would have been positive with a couple of questions. But uh, you know, just like Councillor Deruz had a, 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 a an item uh, that he was able to comment on that is a, a citywide facility in the, in the south end. This is yes, a citywide facility and, and a local facility. But I just uh, I just would would urge um, staff, and if I can hear from staff, I had I'd urged this a couple of years ago when I first started as a councillor, is make sure that you send the report to the local councillor as well, so they can get comments in, in in advance. Now I was part of these working groups, so it really didn't need to be done too much on this one. But in future ones, I just like to get a, a guarantee that the local councillor will be circulated on it to to provide comments on 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 this in advance. So, Chair, uh, certainly we made every effort to work with the councillor um, to gather information, uh, made ourselves available to brief and, and provide information throughout this process. The clerk's office sets the uh, standards for what happens with reports of a citywide manner and we'll follow the procedures that are done. But I can assure the councillor, you know, everything we have done in this last round to stay very closely in communications, we would continue to do. And uh, certainly we, we've made a lot of effort in this last round and would continue that in the future. I, I very much appreciate that. And, and I just would reiterate that I don't, I'm not aware of any other facility where it works like this. So, you know, let's, let's have consistency on, on that piece. And I appreciate uh, uh, Mr. Willis, you and I have worked really appreciate all your efforts in that regard. So thank you for that. Uh, it's more of a general comment, I think, to the clerk. In terms of actual uh, questions, sorry if my connection's unstable here. Um, uh, I, did, I want to confirm what we heard from some delegations that we we're able to separate the, the public realm discussion from the arena and the stadium. And I, I note in the report, there is uh, an item that um, somewhat combines them. So I just hear from staff how, how we can do that and to make sure that is going to happen in terms of that process. So Chair, first of all, when we go back to the December 2020 direction from Council, staff were directed to look at the long-term sustainability of the site with two lenses. One is the OSEG partnership and also the second one was the broader public realm components of the site that are not run by OSEG. And, in, and council set two different council sponsor groups. And this is the first time I've ever worked on a project with two separate council sponsors groups at the same time to look at the issues independently of one another. And in the report, yes, we talked to both because we're bringing them back together for a strategic direction from council. But at the next time we report, we can report on them uh, two sections of one report, a part A, part B. They could be two, two separate reports that come to the same committee, but they are two separate discussions, but highly interrelated. Because really, council's direction was make the site sustainable, and making the site sustainable is get get the number of visitors to site up from four to five million a year, and that actually involves both. Um, you know, the work that Mr. Chenier's group does on the on the city-owned uh, facilities is part of that equation, and the OSEG is part of it. But they are distinct. I mean, I, I think some of the concerns were, would we not be investing in our own facilities? And that's absolutely not correct. Uh, staff have plans for the restoration of the roof on the Aberdeen Pavilion. It'll be in the budget proposals for 2022 for the design phase. And if council agrees, it would the, the actual construction will be further on. They are separate from one another and would continue. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, that, that is appreciated. Um, it, with regard to uh, uh, a few other pieces that were mentioned, um, I'm wondering if, um, because we, we would potentially replace uh, an entire stadium, life cycle repairs would be would be less. And uh, traditionally, that is uh, through the partnership put into the as the first uh, level of the waterfall. Uh, and so I just wonder what would that look like in the future with a new building with less required for life cycle repairs? How could that be contributed to the potential? Um, uh, costs that we're that we're uh, incurring on uh, on a rebuild of a north side stance. So right now, Chair, there there is a, you know when you're talking about a 50 year plus old building, the life cycle repair costs that we need to put in the life cycle fund it grows every year that the building ages. So that that number will end up growing, and that'll end. And right now, OSEG recoups that investment as part of the, what they charge on the ticket pricing and and for events. Um, if it was a brand new facility, the life cycle costs would be lower being a younger building. And again, it would build up slowly over time as that building got older, there would be an opportunity for that cost to be lowered. And, and frankly, as part of the business plan, we're looking at how 
uh, that component can assist in the financial mechanisms to ensure that there's no that this is an affordable uh, to the taxpayers project when we come back to uh, council with the business plan. So uh, there is there's a potential that that might be a, a way of, of solving some of the gap in where we're at right now. Okay, great. I have so much uh, going on around me. These I'm to be outside, and anyway, I got my son home. And so if you hear noise, that's what's going on. Um, I, I guess um, the new retail that we're talking about bringing in the the J block is proposed to be potentially demolished along with the, the arena, um, but but new retail could come in as well. And I'm just wondering, you know, we, we currently rent retail for for a dollar a year uh, on the site. I, I understand that may, may be different with new retail that's brought in and, and staying in the waterfall. If you can just clarify that for us. So Chair, I'm, you know, again, we have to work on a business plan. We have to bring council a complete picture and the role that retail plays in supporting the waterfall and uh, in achieving the financial outcomes that we need out of that project. Uh, you know, we've certainly talked to OSEG about the possibility of a new updated retail strategy and looking at where smaller, finer green uh, retail uses could play a role because that's something that uh, people had, have raised continually in the sounding board. Uh, we'll come back with a discussion of that in the, in the next report. But it's certainly uh, it's it, that that retail is a big part of what helps the financial sustainability of the project. Okay, thank you for that. And, and would it would a competitive tendering um, include the new housing potential above the civic center? Uh, so so you know would all parties be invited to bid on that um, uh, in in the future if that were the case where we where we had. So Chair, I, I, I tried to answer that question when Councillor Deans asked a similar question, which is it's very, very difficult to bring in a third party to uh, attach a potential another party for a redevelopment project on top of one that already has rights. We are still working through this from a legal perspective. And if uh, if there is not an opportunity for another party to, to, to play a role, we will still have a mechanism to ensure that we are getting fair market value for what we would get. Uh, through an outside due diligence process. Okay, um, thank you. I think it's important that we, we do this competitively wherever possible. Um, in terms of the stakeholder sounding board, that's been very helpful. Uh, thank you to everyone who's participated in that and to, to staff for organizing it. Uh, I just wanna confirm that, that that would continue into any next phase that we would see uh, in this regard. Uh, yes, Chair, it would. Okay. okay, great. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I may get on the list after Councillor Luloff, but I, those are my preliminary questions. Thanks, Chair. Terrific. Thank you very much, Councillor Menard. Next up is Councillor Luloff. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, and thanks, uh, Mr. Willis. I, I'm, uh, I care quite deeply about this um, as, as somebody who used to help Joe Pavia book uh, the local bands uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the X. Uh, down at Lansdowne Park. Um, I, I understand that we're in, in desperate need of, of mid-size uh, venues to attract talent from outside Ottawa, but also to support our burgeoning local scene. You know, other than places like uh, like like the Rainbow and, and Overflow, there aren't a whole lot of mid-size venues left, especially with Babylon closing and the ongoing issues going on at Barrymore's. Um, so really do appreciate this discussion. You know, from a planning and economic development perspective, what is the role of projects like Lansdowne in reversing the decline of historical cores in cities throughout Canada and North America? And given the fact that we don't know how many people will physically return to work in the federal public service, creating an additional challenge for our downtown core uh, post pandemic. So Chair, I mean, if you look at our American counterparts who took their sporting venues out of their city, center of their cities and put it in the suburbs, and you can see examples of that all across North America, they're all regretting they did that. And a lot of them are looking at ways to bring them back into the core because again, if it was a standalone sporting facility, that's one thing, but we're talking about a multi-purpose facility that's both sports and cultural and linking them in with all the community uses and the like. And you know we don't want to be hollowing out the core of the city from from jobs. And and Mr. Peck talked about the spillover effect on on Bank Street and the other businesses as well. So we, you know, you know, you you put a sporting event in the middle of nowhere with no other businesses around, and that's unfortunately what Le Breton would be if we went there today. 
um, it would not have a spillover effect. It would be self-contained. Whereas the, what Lansdowne has actually been more successful than most is it actually has generated businesses. So if you, you see it as you go to sporting event, people are going to restaurants and shops on the streets around it. So, you know, from an economic development perspective, we want these types of vibrant opportunities right in the middle of the city. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. You know, I really like going to see City Folk and then heading up to Irene's afterwards, you know, for uh, for, for the satellite shows that happen afterwards. It's always kind of nice. Um, okay, I really, uh, really appreciate uh, your answer. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you very much, Councillor Luloff. And so oh, I do see Councillor Deans has her hand up. Go ahead. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Just uh, one further question. One of the things that has bothered me about um, the current agreement that we have uh, with OSEG is that even though the taxpayers invested a lot of money in that stadium, the city didn't have a single use of it. And I'm just wondering if this motion is to pass and we start considering the future of Lansdowne where the taxpayers are asked to make yet another significant investment, would be, we be looking for a different scenario or a different kind of agreement where there would be a certain amount of time over a period of any given year that the city would have access to um, the, those facilities and use of those facilities? Chair, I mean, I. I would defer to Mr. Chenier on what our needs actually are because we are looking at the city's recreational needs in a, right now in the middle of a comprehensive recreation master plan for the entire city. And I think in discussions I've had with Mr. Chenier and his staff, um, the needs that we have for municipal type uses don't tend to gravitate towards Lansdowne the way they would to something like Brewer and some of the other facilities that are in, in, the, in the immediate area. And they are the very, very distinct type uses. But that doesn't mean if there is a city type use, we couldn't have some discussion with OSEG as part of the next business planning process. But I just want to clarify that, that that our experience so far, Mr. Shenye, I see, is on the line, and he can maybe I should turn to him because he is the specialist in this area. Thanks, Steve. Um, yes, Chair, it, it, exactly that. That um, to date, um, we have had. Um, you know, pretty good cooperation from OSEG when we have needed facilities, when groups have come to the city to host an event uh, at Lansdowne to be able to share facilities. And certainly the talk about a smaller venue um, that, that's proposed uh, makes it a little bit more interesting from a community use because right now the Civic Centre is not an easy facility for minor hockey or even for men's leagues to, to, to that, that traditionally have booked there to use. Um, but a, uh, certainly something in the area of 5,000 of a smaller venue with modern change rooms and um, ancillary space uh, is of great interest and may in fact figure in the city's future look at, at uh, downtown arenas. So th 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 there are opportunities there for us to explore uh, as part of negotiations. And Chair, if I may just may if I just may conclude that the existing agreement already does have a clause in it uh, for city and community use, and we'll we'll look at that and see whether or not that needs to be updated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Deans, Councillor Flurry. Thank you, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry, I'm trying to see you on the screen here, um, Mr. Willis. Uh, thank you for uh, your. Uh, your work on this and, and bringing forward it. We've heard from a, a number of members and I guess as a member of council, I, I want us to continue to see a successful lens down. I think all of us are engaged in that. Um, but, but there are elements that have come to be uh, relating to life cycle. Like I came about very late when I was elected, a lot of the decisions have sort of been made and um, can you remind us what is the amount of, of uh, loan that we have left to pay on the south side building, which is amazing. It's an amazing facility. It's well used, but what amount did we end up having to pay for the south side and, and what's the loan left for that? Ms. Jasmine's on the line. I'll ask her to respond, please. Yeah, so the, the total loan was $135.8 million. And uh, the debt servicing on that is uh, 6.9 million. 
and that's being covered from the property tax uplift and um, also the savings and uh, the cost savings. I don't have the net outstanding amount. Uh, the loan uh, was issued in 2014. So we've got about six years of uh, payments right now. Uh, paying, uh, um, we, we put it to, uh, sorry, the um, sinking fund to cover the cost of the loan. And what, what would happen at the end of that period? So south side and you know it's in very good shape right now but there is a period of time where, where it could fall into similar life cycle concerns we would under the agreement we would be liable for the south side elements so under the existing agreement chair the uh the life cycle assets the asset management plans are updated on a very routine basis and we reset the amount contributed to the asset to the asset restoration fund and that is based on the age of the facilities for the entire complex so as that south side gets older there will be more contributed towards its uh, renovation restoration over time so that's part of the existing i just want to clarify i think we have a, an important duty in terms of the the, the field and in terms of the, the both the horticulture and the Aberdeen Pavilion and, and their historic nature and future uses. I, I'm left to want to debate the public, public um, investment or need or consideration for public investment on the sport facility because there's so many models out there uh, and I'm curious to see. So can you reassure me that you know, today it's about the three options. I think you're not hearing about the demo because everyone realizes the life cycle situation we're under for both the arena and, and, and the north side. But are, are you open and looking at financial models, ownership, and so on of the sport facility uh, in, in future reports and, and analysis? So, Chair, Council had previously given direction on that the, that the facilities are publicly owned, like the, the sports facilities. That's Council's previous decision. Without a, a, without a change in direction from Council, we will continue to operate under that uh, assumption going into the next forward. But we will be in the business planning phase, working with OSEG to determine a, a way of making the project affordable and not a burden on, on annual tax dollars. So that is our, that's our mission to get forward. We'll have to bring that business plan back to you uh, as council for approval uh, in next year uh, when we have that put together. But right now we're, we're looking for creative solutions. Yeah, I, I hear you regarding uh, council giving direction on the overall scale of the project and retaining ownership. No question there and we shouldn't open that debate. But specifically for the mass sport, pro sport component, um, you, you, our interest is making sure it continues uh, as a venue and, and accessible for, for event hosting and sports hosting. I'm more on the finance, financing of this and, and maybe the ownership or the access elements are, are, are levers. So is everything on the table rela relating to the, the models of financing for uh, the north side in the arena? Chair, sure, we're certainly looking at different financing options for the, for the new capital works that will remain publicly owned because right now the fact that they're publicly owned is not up for debate. Council has been clear on that. And unless council gives different direction, which is not the mandate we were given in December, uh, we, would, we will continue on the assumption that the city will continue to own those facilities as we do today. Okay. Can, can, can that be shared with me, Steve, the, uh, the decision of council that I think the decision of council relates to the overall Lansdowne Park. I don't think it's specific to the sports facility unless I'm wrong. So Chair, I'll work with uh, the city manager's office and we'll get the history, the legislative history on that for you. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Perfect. Thank you, Councillor Fleury. And I see Councillor Menard. Thanks very much, Chair. I'm just on my last round here. Um, the, one of the overarching uh, priorities or concerns, I guess, is around where development could occur on, on this site in the future if this is approved. And I just want to, for the public's sake and everyone else, to make sure um, that it's noted that the protection of the city-owned lands uh, and portions of the park, obviously the park is city-owned, but the city-operated portions of the land, um, uh, there would not be you know, housing development on the Great Lawn uh, on Aberdeen uh, Square uh, or on the edges, the only place that housing is being considered is uh, above the current Civic Center. 
Chair, the Councillor is correct. The report states that we are only looking at the footprint of the existing Civic Centre for any housing development. And um, in terms of uh, the operations of the site, uh, the way it is currently operated, um, with the number of acres operated by OSAG and the number of acres operated by the City for City Programming, there's no intent to change that either. Chair, that's not an item for, for consideration right now. That's not part of what the council mandate was, is to re-examine that at, at this time. Thank you for that, uh, Mr. Willis. And then my final question around this is um, around affordable housing. And it was mentioned uh, affordable housing could be part of the mix above the Civic Center. I don't know if you have more details that you could provide uh, at this time or if that's for a future discussion, uh, but obviously that is very important to, to my community in particular. So Chair of Council in its December 2020 uh, motion did direct us to, to that affordable housing was a component and that's actually built into the principles we talked about in the report and the negotiating uh, elements that it, that is an objective we will bring back. Uh, we, we also propose in the report that we do some consultation with uh, OCHC and another affordable housing providers like CADCO in the next round to talk about the most effective way to deliver it on the site in partnership with uh, the, the development for, of any residential component. Okay, thanks very much, Mr. Willis. I appreciate uh, your outreach during this time and the work of yourself and, and uh, Mr. Chenier in engaging uh, certainly my local communities. Um, it has been uh, appreciated, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Menard. And I'm not seeing any other hands uh, for questions to staff. Uh, so we do have uh, the direction to staff, which uh, Vice Chair Dudas uh, did table earlier on behalf of Councillor Menard. Uh, Councillor Menard, is there any, did you need to speak to that or can we just move ahead? Say thank you for, for it. Active transportation and, and transit, uh, obviously going to be part of the, this plan moving forward. And then um, the separation of that uh, air rights versus what is the publicly owned sector section of uh, the stadium. Very important to separate those. So appreciate staff's uh, help on drafting those. Terrific. Excellent. So thank you. And uh, we'll ensure that uh, staff receive a, a copy of that direction, although I'm sure they probably already have it. Um, so with that, uh, on the report, is the report carried? Carried. 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 Fantastic. Uh, so I believe now we will move uh, to item six, uh, which I believe it was Councillor Leeper who had a question on the CIP. Yeah, this, I hadn't anticipated that today was going to be quite this long, but I, I am interested <laughs> before we pass the Orleans SIP program to hear from uh, particularly Mr. Willis, do we, do we need it? Um, I, I don't know what the anticipated revenue loss will be in terms of tax revenues. Uh, presumably, if it works as well as one hopes, uh, it would be millions of dollars. Is development not going to start bubbling away really well in Orleans as a result of LRT particularly? I'm, I'm having difficulties imagining we need incentive to develop Orleans, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. So Chair, traditionally we've been getting good uh, response on residential development in Orleans, but as the board councillors would attest from their on the ground experience, the statistics clearly show that Orleans is as great a community as it is, and I wanna say that, uh, it has not attracted employment uses the way other portions of the city have. As a matter of fact, in terms of the sort of the census tracts, it's among the three lowest uh, areas in the city in terms of attracting employment. So the employment to residential ratio is very, very skewed in that area. And we need to do a lot of heavy lifting in order to get more employment uses in that area. So we can create true 15 minute neighborhoods and getting people to uh, meet the official plan objectives we have for the area. Uh, we also uh, in, built into the program are using the program to encourage a better built form in terms of a street relationship. So you go from the the 1960s, 70s versions of streets with, you know, plazas set back with parking up front. And the plan also allows us to get, you know, encourage us to, to get a better urban form along corridors like San Josef as it, as it redevelops over time. Uh, so, I, you know, if for some reason things just completely take off, and suddenly we're getting an a enormous amount of development that we are not seeing now, and we're not getting pre-consultations uh, anywhere the way we're getting on the west side of the LRT. 
in, in, in the counselor's ward and Councillor Kavanaugh's ward, for example, we would uh, we could always revisit, uh, you know, a sunsetting approach council could give us direction in the future. But right now, it uh, we are really lagging in that area in terms of employment. What kind of wriggle room is there to hive residential off from commercial? The, uh, right now, the, the focus is, is very much on mixed use because of the nature of where it actually applies to. So um, I can ask Mr. Herwire or Mr. Cope or Mr. Vandeland, I think are on the line, can give more detail on that. Um, we certainly can take council's direction, but I mean, really right now, we need to, to get the activity going on the east side the way we've seen the west side go. I don't know if Mr. Cope can add to that or Mr. Vandeland. Mr. Herwire is on the line. It just has to come off mute. Yeah, no, I was just going to say before I turn it over to Chris, there is a, uh, an incentive for affordable housing. So we wouldn't want to lose track of that as well. In residential. But I'll ask uh, Chris to add to that. Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chair. The, the focus of the program um, focuses on really three areas to replicate what went on on the existing St. Joseph Boulevard CIP, which had the, um, not first sorry, the affordable housing uh, component, as well as trying to stimulate the street to growth and building to happen in accordance with a, a typical main street as opposed to what it is now. Um, the new element of it deals with what we call pedestrian friendly streets, which would be any high rise that is permitted to be built, whether it be mixed use or residential, but to encourage these new redevelopments, because again, the nature of a CIP, it must be redeveloped, not greenfields, but to encourage them to build interesting ground floors and to focus the ground floors on active uses. Um, and we think that's going to actually help with those routes, particularly the ones to and from the LRT. So it's not as much about attracting a development that's going to happen, I think, in those spots, but to help us have that development occur in ways that are, are conducive to our development plans for the neighborhoods. I think, uh, I think Matt really wants to jump in on this one, so I'll, uh, uh, I'll, I'll turn the floor over to uh, back to you, Chair, for uh, further comments from, uh, from others. Terrific. Thank you, Councillor Leeper. And uh, Councillor Lula, floor is yours. Thank you. There are so many pre-existing issues uh, that we need to solve here in Orleans. Uh, you know, when it comes uh, to St. Joseph Boulevard in, in, in particular, uh, certainly requires a revamp. You know, we've for nearly 20 years had streetscape plans coming out of our heart of Orleans BIA that have never been able to be realized. And now we know with the Orleans Economic Corridor Study um, that we commissioned at the beginning of this council, uh, which was an expansion of the Plaster Orleans um, secondary plan. Uh, along with this second layer uh, of the CIP, uh, we can finally see you know, the, the light at the end of the tunnel uh, when it comes to economic prosperity in the East End. We did receive one piece of correspondence on this um, from Dan Stankovic, who has a, uh, an economics uh, blog. Uh, I do really appreciate his insights. It's always important that we challenge uh, our own assumptions on these programs. So I wanted to give staff an opportunity uh, to, uh, to, to respond to some of the assertions that were made in this correspondence. Uh, particularly, uh, the CIP is detached from issues and opportunities when it comes to future economic growth. Um, that uh, it won't do much uh, to uh, effectively address the longstanding jobs and, and population imbalance uh, from east and west, uh, that the pedestrian friendly streets program is not well aligned with the draft new official plan when it's uh, related to transit oriented development in 15 minute neighborhoods, proposed mixed use along uh, many of the designated pedestrian friendly streets is not permitted under the current bylaw. So he's, sa he's stating that through the economic corridor study plan, we may need to see some 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 proactive rezoning um, and that in general uh, the integrated CIP fails to take account of changing market dynamics brought on by the new LRT and the fact that people may not be uh, returning uh, to work and he asserts that the plan as it exists now will not deliver the type of redevelopment projects with the maximum benefits on economic revitalization and that it lacks uh, a thought out accountability framework for evaluating applications. So, I, you know, I'm, I, I wanna see these 
uh, these plans come to fruition. I think that, uh, you know, uh, that Orleans and the East End has waited for a very long time for these kind of economic development opportunities. Uh, you know, we want to make our, 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 we want to revitalize our main street and make sure that our neighborhood is a, is a place to, to, to live, work and play. So I wanted to provide staff an opportunity to, to address uh, some of the comments uh, by a gentleman who may have been a delegation today, but decided to submit in writing. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you for the uh, opportunity to comment, Councillor. So I, I think it's important to remember that, uh, you know, the CIP is not working in isolation here. We are also working on a corridor secondary plan uh, that's part of the new official plan that will be coming forward uh, in the next six months or so. And those are really intended to work uh, hand in glove together. So, you know, uh, Chris and the economic development team have worked very closely with policy team, um, and there will be changes through that uh, secondary plan process and zoning that will address some of the concerns that uh, Mr. Stank raised. Um, and, and again, that goes to the, uh, you know, the pedestrian friendly uh, street program. Um, certainly there, there will be zoning changes that uh, will assist uh, with that type of uh, uh, goal and, and beyond uh, the secondary plan, there will be further changes coming out of the, uh, the TMP in terms of the active transportation components um, that will flow from that. So in terms of the, uh, you know, the pandemic uh, questions in terms of uh, return to work, I think, I think it's, uh, as, as we've heard in previous meetings, it's, it's really premature to be making, you know, uh, conclusions or definitive statements on that. We are seeing elsewhere that, uh, you know, there is a, a, a fairly large significant return to work um, underway, places like New Zealand, and we're starting to see that in Ottawa as well. So that's something we're gonna continue to monitor. Um, I'll ask Chris if there's anything else he wants to weigh in on in terms of the economic development aspect. Yeah, I, I think one uh, critical piece I think is that the CIP itself does absolutely nothing to change um, land use. There's no change in the zoning as a result of that. Um, how it's designed is to try and follow any changes that may come, but even in, in on sites that are currently would allow the kinds of things with an active ground floor use and not high rise above it, and there certainly are some sites, we want to uh, try and provide some incentives to help those sites get built in a way that's in conformity with the 15 minute neighborhood. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, this is this is a very important project, and I, and I do believe that we require both sticks and carrots uh, at our disposal when we're when we're talking about uh, you know opportunities for economic development and uh, you know working with our uh, the landowners and with the businesses here in the East End to achieve what we're looking to achieve here. So I really appreciate staff's work on this. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you very much, Councillor Lulov. Councillor Hubley. Thank you. Uh, I just have a, a quick question on this, uh, uh, Madam Chair. The, um, I, I, first off, I, I feel for my colleagues uh, in the East End that uh, uh, we need to do these programs to try to uh, get jobs into the uh, East End for them. Uh, you know, we're, we're making the major LRT investment uh, to the East End. We have the CIP program. We have other enticements. My concern with each one of these CIPs, because we, we got burned on the first one, is there a clause in here to make sure that it's not used to move jobs within the city, that it's used to entice new jobs or new development? Who would like to take that? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll ask uh, Mr. Cope to respond to that, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, there is a very specific clause in the uh, in the document two section, which will become the bylaw, that uh, speaks to that issue directly. And uh, the, the phrase "net new jobs" is in there, meaning net new jobs to Ottawa, either through an expansion of existing business or relocation from a business outside of Ottawa into Ottawa, but not across Ottawa from one ward to another. Okay, very good. That's uh, what I wanted to hear, Madam Chair. So thank you. 
Terrific. Thank you very much, Councillor Hubley. And I believe uh, Councillor Vice Chair Dudas has her hand up. Thank you very much. My apologies for not having my my uh, video on. I'm, you can now call me Two Dose Dudas. So I've been vaccinated. I'm good to go. But I, I just wanted to chime in because I, I really do empathize with my colleagues. And once again, we want equity and fairness across the city when it comes to incentivizing uh, jobs and, and economic development. I do want to just note, though, that in terms of the East End in particular, you know, I pulled up some stats and, you know, our housing, our jobs to household ratio in the East End is 0.5. We're lagging well behind the official plan target of 1.3. And that's been in the last two decades. We've been losing many of our jobs, RCMP, BND, the other ends of the city. And once again, I completely empathize. We're not, uh, this is not the objective is to take jobs from one end or the other, but it's really to make the spend even more attractive. And to Councillor Leaper's point, you know, LRT will stimulate development, but we're not Westboro and we're not in close proximity to downtown. So we need to make sure that we're not just having development that is residential, which we have seen historically. We want to stem the tide of that residential growth that we're having. It's welcome, but once again, we need to see more of the jobs you, in the community so that we can is make that sure that we're stopping building a community that is, sorry, can you, can you guys hear me? Yes, yeah. Okay, good. I want to make sure that our residents don't always have to hop in a car to get downtown jobs. We have to have 80% of the residents that live in Orleans commute out of Orleans every single day, of course, not during the pandemic, to get to work either downtown or at Portage, cross over the border. So if we can start seeing those trends towards having jobs, 15 minute communities, as Mr. Willis pointed out, that's the route we want to go to. And we want to see that code go through across the city. So this is a really good uh, tool in the toolbox, as we've seen that's been effective in other areas of our city, those corners. And actually, this is just a revamp of the, the two existing CIPs that were successful in the East End in the past. It just makes it uh, more fully integrated and more respectful of the East End as a whole in terms of the geography. So thank you very much. And I hope that everyone can support the CIP. Terrific. Thank you very much, Councillor Dudas. I'm not seeing any other hands raised. Uh, so with that, uh, on the report, uh, Integrated Orleans Community Improvement Plan, is that carried? Carried. Carried. Wonderful. Excellent. So I believe we've gone through all of the reports and we are at, uh, there's no in-camera items. Sorry, I've just lost my paper here. Bear with me one second. There was no notices of motion to my knowledge. So I believe all we have left then is adjournment. Carried. <laughs> Carried. <laughs> and next meeting I believe is scheduled for August 3rd Maybe currently. So but thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate thank all you. your time today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.